Hey, what's going on YouTube? Today in this video, we are going to develop a complete Angular real world project application from scratch. This is going to be a long video, so go ahead and grab a snack or a coffee, get comfortable, and let's get started. Actually, guys, this will be the part two of my full Angular course. So if any of you guys are new to Angular, I strongly recommend you guys to watch this Angular full course and come back to this video. I leave the link in the description. All right. So in this full course, we will be developing a complete real world blog application with a backend CMS. Our goal is to create a professional, fully functional blog that can be used in production. To start, we will design the front end of our blog using the bootstrap. So any of you guys want to know about UI design. So we designed this web application UI with Figma. I already released a course for this. You can find the link in the description. So once again, at the first, we will design the blog using the bootstrap. This will involve creating the layout and structure as well as styling and branding the site to make it look visually appealing. Next, we will focus on implementing the logic and CRUD operations for our blog. This will involve setting up the backend CMS and integrating it with the front end. So we will develop our own backend content management system or the CMS from scratch. After that, we will integrate it with the front end. We will be also be using Firestore as our database and Firebase hosting to host our site. Both of these services are free to use. By the end of this course, you will have a fully functional professional blog that you can use to share your thoughts, ideas and contents with the world. All right, first let's see what we're gonna develop by end of this course. This application is mainly in two parts. One is the blog's front end view and the second one is the blog's back end dashboard. Right. So first, let's see the front end blog view. So this is the home page of our blog site. In here top, we have the site logo and down here we have the category navbar. So inside this, we got these few categories all loaded from the Firestore database. Down here, we have these featured post section. These also loaded and filtered from Firestore database. So down here we have the latest post area, in here we will load all the latest post from Firestore. Again down here we got this subscription card, I'll come back to this in a minute. Um, let's move on to the next page. If you click one of these categories from the category navbar, this will navigate to the single category post page. In here we load the posts that are relevant to that clicked category. So I clicked on this Firebase category. So this loaded all the posts that listed under this Firebase category. If I navigate to another category, look at this. This changed the post. So with this page, a user can filter the post by categories. So we will learn how to do this filtering using the Firebase where code is. And also for this filtering, we use the category ID. So we learn how to pass the ID from one component to another component via binding to the router. So next if I click on this, one of these postcards, this will open the single post view and all the post contents loaded here that are relevant to that post. We load the relevant post that match with this loaded post category. And also we have these post view count. When a user visits to a blog post to view the contents, we we'll count that view and show that inside this label. For this, we'll use the Firestore increment method. So we'll learn all about this in detail. Down here, we can see this post comment section. Using this, a user can add a comment to this post. Apart from these, we got a few other pages like About Us and Terms and Conditions page. So next we have this subscription card with this a user can subscribe by providing their email address. So here we added validations to the inputs. A user cannot submit empty data as well as we check the provided email already subscribed or not. 
If a user tries to subscribe again using the same email address, this will show this error. So we'll learn how to do this from scratch, right? So that's it for the front end view. Next, let's see a demo of our backend dashboard. So this is our backend dashboard. For this, we added authentications using Firebase authentication system. So in order to access this backend dashboard, the user must log into this using the correct email and password. Without logging into this, a user cannot navigate around this backend dashboard. If a user tries to access this manually by adding the router, this will show us this access denied toast message. We will learn how to do this by using Angular Router Guard and also we'll learn how to show this toaster message as well. If I log into this, this is the dashboard view of our backend. In here we got four sections, categories, post, subscribers and comments. This will update regularly and I will add more features to this dashboard with future updates. So with this we can manage blog post categories. So if I click this, this load this category view. Here we can see this form. Using this we can add new categories. If I create a new category, this will save inside the Firestore database and load that inside this table. In any case, if you want to edit, you can edit this using this button. If I click this edit button, this will load this selected category name inside this same form. And as you can see here, this time this form transferred to this editing process. So from here, we can edit this category and update to the Firestore. Once it's done, this will load that update category inside the table and also we'll get this success toaster message. So we can delete a category using this delete button. For this also, we'll get this success toaster message and also we added form validations to prevent invalid data save. So we will learn all these operations, features and logics one by one in detail. Perfect. Next we got this post. From here, like the categories, we can manage the details of the post. We can add new post using this. For this, we can use a separate component. So this will load that new post component inside the browser. Here we will learn a few different things. When I type the title, this will automatically generate this permalink by replacing spaces with dashes. And here, we'll learn how to load saved all categories inside of a drop down select tag. So down here, we will learn another feature of Firebase which is Firebase storage. So in order to save the post image, we will use this Firebase storage feature. So we'll learn how to upload and retrieve this post image from Firebase storage. And also down here for this content, we used a VCVIC editor. So here we can add anything that we want like images, videos, formatted text and so on. We will learn how to add this as well. So from this table, we can see all the posts stored inside the Firestore. And also like the categories, we can manage the post from here. We can edit the post by clicking this button. This will open the same add new post component from weave and load the editing post details inside these inputs. For this we'll use the query parameter method. Don't worry, we'll learn all about this in detail, right? So next we can delete a post from the database using this delete button. If you noticed here, we have another two buttons, mark featured and remove featured. If you can remember, we have this featured post section inside our front-end view. So here we loaded the posts that are marked as featured. Here as you can see, some of the post has this remove featured button and the rest of the post has this mark featured post button. So here we loaded these buttons conditionally. If a post is marked as featured, this will show this remove featured button. And if the post is not marked as featured, then this mark featured button will appear here. If I mark this post as featured, as you can see, this removed this mark featured button and showed this remove featured button. So if I remove this as featured, this now show this mark featured button. 
So guys, don't get confused. We will learn this as well. So next we got the subscribers menu card. In here we can find all the subscribers. So if a user subscribe to our blog using uh, the subscribe card inside the front end view, it will appear inside this subscribers table. In any case, if you want to remove this, we can do that by using this delete button. Awesome, right? So next we got this comment section. In here we can approve a comment using this button. User comments will appear inside the front-end view if only the site admin approved the comment. Otherwise, it will not appear inside the view. So with this, we can prevent spam comments, right? So we we'll learn how to do this logic as well. All right, from this section, we are getting into the real business. Let's start to build our Angular apps front-end using the Bootstrap. So in this section, we will cover how to create a new Angular app, how to connect the Bootstrap CSS framework to our Angular app, how to create components for each layout area, and we will design a fully customizable entire Angular block apps front-end design using the Angular, Bootstrap, and with some custom CSS. Let's get started. If you can remember, we designed our Angular blog app using a design tool called Figma. Because of this, now we have a clear picture of our blog app's design. So in this section, let's plan our Angular blog components using this design prototype. The components are the main building block of an Angular app. Without Angular components, we cannot actually develop a proper Angular application. So that's why before everything, we have to plan the component structure. So let's do that. First thing first, we need a main root component. For this, we're gonna use the default Angular app component. Next in our blog, we have six pages. Home, single category, single post, terms and condition, about us, and the contact us page. So we need a separate components for each of this page. Next, if we look at these all pages, we can commonly identify three things, which are the header area, category navbar, and this footer area. So these areas are located inside the all pages. So if we create components for each of these areas, we can easily import them on these all pages. We don't need to code these areas in all these pages by duplicating the codes again and again you got the idea right so for these areas we have to create three more components the header component the category number component and the footer component all right next we have the subscription form for that also we need a separate component at last inside the single post page we have this comment area for this also i want to create two separate components one for the comment form the second one is for this comment preview area that's it all right now let's look at the components list we have six pages each page we create separate components so home single category single post terms and condition about and contact us component all together six components next we're gonna create separate components for these common areas header category number and the footer components all three components for common areas at last we need a separate components for the subscription form and for this comment section so subscription form component comment form component and the comment list component so these are the all components that we needed for our angular blog if you need anything more components we will do that by that time so for now, we got altogether 12 components. Alright, so in this video, let's create a new Angular app for our blog using the Angular CLI. First thing first, we need a project folder. As usual, I'm gonna use this Udemy Angular course folder as my project folder. So open the command prompt to the terminal and navigate to the project folder. You can create your own project folder anywhere as you wish but I recommend you to follow all the steps as mine 
in order to reduce bugs and errors. In case if anything goes wrong, we can fix it faster if you follow all the steps as mine. Got it? Alright, let's navigate to the project folder. Inside the terminal or the command prompt, type this first command cd desktop because my project folder is inside the desktop. Next again cd project folder. Name is Udemy Angular course. Hit enter. Perfect. Now we are inside the uh, project folder. Now let's create our new Angular app inside this project folder using the Angular CLI. If you can remember, we learned about Angular CLI in the Angular CLI section. If you cannot remember, please go back and revise this section and come back. Alright, we can access the Angular CLI command using the ng command. So, ng space. Now we are creating a new Angular app. So, new. After this, give a project name. We are creating a new app for our Angular blog. So I'm giving this project name as ng blog app. This name can be any name as you wish. No need to exactly follow as mine. So this is the angular CLI command for creating a new angular app. So now hit enter to execute this command. Yes, we are using the angular router so give yes to this hit enter now select the preferred styling method we're going to use the default css method so select the css and hit enter now this will create a new angular app and install all the required files using the node package manager this may take several seconds to several minutes depending on your pc and internet speed so be patient Alright, our Angular app is ready. Let's open this app inside the VS Code. Navigate inside to the app folder. The folder name is this ng blog app. Now hit enter. Now run this command to open this inside the VS Code. Code space and dot. Now hit enter. So this opened our newly created Angular app inside the VS Code. To open this inside the VS Code, I use the command prompt method. You can use any of the other methods if this is not work for you. We learned about this in the environment setup section. Alright, let's run this app. Open the integrated terminal. Uh, we can open the integrated terminal by dragging the VS Code windows bottom area or go to the view and select the terminal. Or we can use the keyboard shortcut, the control key with the backtick symbol. Alright. Let's run this app using the angular command inside the integrated terminal ng serve and hit enter. This will make a development environment for this angular app and run this inside the browser. Once this is completed, go to this URL localhost colon 4200. So this is what the default angular boilerplate will look like. I don't need this. So back in the VS code. Go to the src folder, then app folder, inside this open this app component html file. So this is the main root component of this angular app. Inside this html file, we can find all the boilerplate markup which responsible for this default angular landing page. So remove this all and add a simple h1 tag, angular blog app. Save this and back to the browser. Perfect, we got this h1 with this text angular blog app. Alright, we have successfully created the new angular app. In the next lecture, let's generate the components using the angular CLI. Alright, let's generate the components. In the previous lecture, we planned our components. So according to that plan, we have to create 12 components. So let's start with the common components, header, footer and category navbar component. So inside the integrated terminal, let's generate the first angular component using the angular CLI. In the angular component section, we learned how to create these components manually from scratch. But from now on, we will use the angular CLI to generate components which will fast and this will save lots of time. Alright, let's do this. Inside the VS Code terminal. Now currently in this terminal we are running the app. 
So create a new terminal. We can create a new terminal using this plus icon. Click on this. Now we got this new integrated terminal window. We can switch between terminals using this drop down. Alright now inside the terminal window type this command ng this is for as you know to access the angular cli we use this ng command generate we are going to generate a component so after this component now we have to give the component name and the component path if you are creating this inside the app root folder we don't have to pass any path just type the component name in our case I'm planning to put these components inside of another folder in order to organize our app's component. As you know, now we are generating the header footer and the category number. So with this component, we are creating the layout of our blog, right? So I'm planning to put this inside of another folder called layouts. So for this, first we have to pass the folder name layouts slash now pass the component name header. Once again, if we want this inside of the app folder, we don't need this path, just only the component name. Hope you guys got the idea. Alright, before running this code, I want to tell you something. I added this layouts folder name here. But if you notice, there is no folder named layouts inside our blog app. But when we generating this component, Angular CLI will generate automatically this folder for us. We don't have to create this manually. So let's run this command, hit enter, this may take few seconds. As you can see here, we have successfully generated our first component. Now look at the file tree. Inside the app folder, we got this layout folder. Inside that, we got this header folder. Inside that, as you can see here, we got these header component files, HTML, CSS and the header component TS file. So now look at the terminal, we got these logs. So when we're creating a component using Angular CLI, this will create all the related files for that component and also this will register this component inside the app module file. We learned about this earlier. When creating a component, we have to register that component inside the Angular modules. Otherwise, Angular doesn't recognize this as a component. So if we are creating this component manually, we have to do this register app module manually but when we generating a component using the angular cli this will automatically register this component inside the angular modules this is the beauty of this angular cli or right, like this let's create the category number component and the footer component so ng g we can use the short form g for generate after this c this stands for component after this component path and the component name so this also layout component so layouts slash now the component name is category dash navbar when naming a component as a good practice follow this method if the component name is two word name something like this separate the name with the dash sign we cannot name a component with spaces so keep this in your mind to execute this command hit enter after this completed, we can find the category navbar folder inside this layouts folder. Inside that we can find all the components related files. If you look at the app modules this file, we can find the category navbar component registered here. Next let's generate the footer component inside the terminal. Again ng, g, c, this also a layout component. So the folder name is the layouts slash component name is footer hit enter perfect so now let's move on to the next component list which is these pages components home single category single post terms and condition about page and the contact us page all six components Let's generate them as usual inside the terminal ng g c this time we're creating components for pages so folder name is pages slash and the component name is home this is for home page component so now hit enter perfect home page component is ready inside the app folder now we can 
see this new folder pages inside that we can find this home component folder inside that we can find these home component files like this let's generate all other five page components the second one is for single category page so the command is ng g c pages slash component name is single dash category as i mentioned earlier we cannot use spaces for component name so instead of space we can use dash symbol hit enter single category successfully generated third one is for the single post inside the terminal ng g c pages slash single dash post hit enter next terms and condition page so ng g c pages slash terms dash and dash conditions and hit enter so i'm going a little fast because we learned already about this right all right the last page component is for the contact us page so ng g c pages slash contact dash us hit enter perfect we have successfully created components for all these six pages all right next move on to the next component list uh, for this we have three remaining components let's create them inside the terminal ng g c this time i'm going to generate the subscription form inside the app folder so no need to pass any folder name just the component name subscription dash form and hit enter perfect Inside the folder, we can find this subscription form folder and inside that we can find subscription form component files. Next component for the comment form. So inside the terminal ng g c, this time put this comment component inside the comments folder. So comments slash component name is comment dash form and hit enter. Next our blog apps final component which is this comment list component so let's generate that inside the interior terminal ng g c comments dash list and hit enter so inside the file tree we can find this comments folder inside the app folder if you look inside the comments folder we can find these two folders one is for the comment form component and the other one is for the comments list component so this is it we have successfully completed this lecture by generating all the components let's meet you in the next lecture all right so in this video let's do the basic routings so open the router module file we will create our routes inside this file we learned about this routing and navigation in detail in the previous section if any of you cannot remember i recommend you guys to go back and learn the angular router and navigation section again all right let's get busy with angular routing so in inside this app routing modules file let's define some routes in this section we will add some basic routes to design our app but in a future section these routes can be changed okay first let's set the component for the initial path so inside this array pass the routes object first key value pair is path and the value is an empty path after this component so we'll load the home component for this home component select this auto complete this will import the home component to this router module the next router is for this single category so the path will be category and the component is single category next for the post the path is post and component is single post component next router for these three pages about us the route is about 
the component is about us component next the terms and condition set the path to terms dash conditions and the component will be the terms dash and dash condition all right next last component route the path is contact and the component is contact component that's it right so once again guys these routers are just for the design in the future we will make these routers more dynamic and meaningful all right now save this and back to the browser wait before going to the browser we have another work to do what's that can you guys remember in order to work these routers we must add a router outlet to the root view otherwise these routers won't work so inside the component html file add the router outlet that's it save this all and back to the browser so this is the root path inside this we got this home components works we set it this root path to the home component so that's why we are getting this home works so now navigate to the category path add slash category after this server url hit enter perfect we got the single category works next the post change the url and hit enter we got this post works next navigate to the about router perfect we got this message next the terms and condition change the url perfect we got this message at last we got the contact perfect we got this contact working so everything seems to be working fine as we expected to design this angular blog we are going to use the bootstrap framework if you can remember we learned about this bootstrap framework in detail in the bootstrap fundamental section so using the bootstrap css framework we can design our app fast and more robust as we learned in the bootstrap section we have few method to install bootstrap on our project from those methods i am going to use the npm method to install bootstrap on our angular project that is the easiest way to install bootstrap on the angular app so inside the terminal we cannot run a new command on this ng serve terminal so create a new terminal using this plus icon now inside this new terminal run this command to install bootstrap npm this is for the node package manager i this i stands for install after this package name is bootstrap that's it now hit the enter to execute this command this started installing bootstrap this may take several seconds to minutes depending on your internet speed all right bootstrap installed successfully when we install bootstrap using the npm this will install the bootstrap inside this node modules folder as you guys know already inside the node modules we can find this bootstrap folder which means we have successfully installed the bootstrap on our angular project in order to use the bootstrap styles we have to import the downloaded bootstrap css styles to our angular blog for this we have three methods let's see this action one by one the first method is adding bootstrap to the angular app using the angular json file so open the angular json file all we have to do is just pass the bootstrap css files path inside this style array after this comma inside codes pass the bootstrap style path the bootstrap folder is inside the node modules folder so node dash modules slash bootstrap slash dist slash css slash bootstrap dot min dot css i added the minified version of the bootstrap for better speed so this is the path for the bootstrap css file inside node modules folder we can find this bootstrap folder inside that we can find this dist folder inside that we can find this css folder and inside that we can find this bootstrap css file so now save this file so the bootstrap import is done but in order to apply the bootstrap styles we have to reboot the app so stop the app control c and again run the ng serve To check these bootstrap styles are working or not add this simple bootstrap utility class to this h1 tag class text dash danger 
So this will turn this text to red color. So save this and go to the browser. As you can see here, this H1 text is in red color, which means bootstrap styles are working. All right, let's move on to the second method. Adding bootstrap to the indexed HTML file using the link tag. Before doing this second method, remove this first import from the angular JSON file. Save this and restart the app. Now let's import the bootstrap using the traditional way like simple website style importing. Open the index.html file. As you know, this is the main entry file of this angular file. So inside this index.html files head tags, just simply import the bootstrap CSS file. Link, hit enter. Add the path like previous node modules, bootstrap, dist, CSS, and bootstrap.min.css. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. This h1 tag is still in red, which means bootstrap import is working perfectly. So let's move on to the final method. We can import the bootstrap styles to our app using the CSS import method. So I'm going to remove the previous link from the index.html file. Now open the styles.css file. So this will be the global main CSS file. So inside this, let's add a CSS import statement for the bootstrap CSS file. At import, inside codes, add the tilde symbol, which is located before the number one key on the keyboard. So I have to press this key with the shift key. So after this bootstrap slash dist slash css slash bootstrap dot min dot css. That's it. If you may wonder this time we didn't add the node models folder to this path, but we added this tilde symbol. What's going on here? So with this tilde symbol, we are telling this to check the node modules folder. This is like a short code for the node modules folder path. So in here we use the tilde symbol instead of node modules path. All right. Now save this and back to the browser. We got this red color H1 tag. So let's change this danger to primary. Save this and back to the browser again. We got this blue color H1 text, which means this import is working perfectly. Beautiful. So we successfully installed and linked Bootstrap in our Angular app. I'm gonna keep this last CSS import method. You guys can use any method that you want to use. No problem. All right, so now let's define our main colors using the CSS variables. So some of you may wonder what is this CSS variables? Nothing fancy, just this also same like other programming stacks variables. We declared the variable once and we used that variable multiple times in the codes. For example, we have the title variable inside the TypeScript component and we use that variable inside the view several times to show the title of something. Now this title is title1. In any case, if you want to change this title1 to something else, we can simply change this variable value to something else. And this will change all the title of this page. Very simple, right? So this is the same thing applies for CSS variables as well. We mostly create CSS variables to define common values like colors, fonts, font sizes, so on. So let me show you a quick example. Add the header component inside the app component, then only this will visible inside the browser. So open the style.css file. In an Angular app, this will be the main root CSS file. So we define all the global styles inside this. If we add the CSS inside this, this will apply that style to the whole app. In every component, we got this separate component style files. So this component CSS will only apply to the relevant component V. For example, add a style to a P tag, the selector is P and the CSS scope inside this set the color to red. Save this, add a P tag inside the app component. We already have a P tag inside the header component. Save this all and back to the browser. As you can see here, this CSS applied 
to this both app and header component that's why these text are in red color so again back to the vs code cut this style from here and paste it inside the app component css file save this and back to the browser this time as you can see here we got only this app component p tag in red color so why is that if we add any style inside the component CSS file, that style will only apply to the relevant components view. If I remove this app component CSS and add this inside the header component, what will happen? Yes, you are correct. This style will only apply to this header component p tag. Hope you guys got the idea. Alright, back to the CSS variables. So these variables will going to use several times in the entire Angular app. So create these CSS variables inside the global CSS file, which is this styles.css. So we declare CSS variable something like this, colon, root, and the scope. For CSS variables, we use this root CSS selector. Now inside this, we can create CSS variables. In TypeScript, we use the let or const keyword to define a new variable like this in css we use the double hyphen so after this without space variable name primary after this colon and the css value red that's it very simple right now we can use this primary css variable inside our angular app so let's take the same example as previous set the p text color to red so after this p and the css scope inside this color so this time we're going to use this variable to access this css variable we have a special syntax var and parentheses inside this brackets pass the css variable name double hyphen primary always don't forget to add this double hyphen beginning of this css variable now remove the style inside the header component css file Save this all and back to the browser. Look at this. The style is applied to this two p tags. If I change this primary variable value to green, save this and back to the browser. Perfect, right? This green color applied to these p tags. Awesome. All right, now let's declare some CSS variable for our app. When we designed the app, mainly we used three colors, this primary, secondary, and this body text color. For now, let's create a variable for these three colors. So inside this remove this all, we'll start it from the beginning. Inside the styles.css file, first create the CSS variable scope, colon, root. This is the CSS selector for CSS variables and the scope. Inside this now we can declare CSS variables. The first variable is for primary color. So double iPhone and the variable name is primary dash color. And set the color to this primary colors hex code which is this 026467. Next we have the secondary color double iPhone and the variable name is secondary dash color and the value is this copy it from the figma and paste it here ash e5 f5 e a next get this body text color leave these contextual colors for now i will come back this in a minute so create the body text variable double dash iphone and the variable name body dash text dash color now copy this color code from Figma and paste it here. Ash 596392. Wait, I almost forgot we need this footer and navbar color as well. So create a variable for this double hyphen and the variable name is navbar dash footer dash color. So copy this color from the Figma and paste it here. Ash F9 F9 F9. Alright, let's look at these contextual colors. For these colors, I am not going to declare any CSS variables. 
because I used the same bootstrap contextual colors, danger, success, info and warning for this. So we don't need to declare those colors again. So we can use them directly using the bootstrap framework. So we have created some default colors. Now let's begin the design. Before everything, let's define some global styles for the body tag. So inside the styles.css file, as you know, this styles.css file is the main global CSS file. So inside this, after these CSS variables, add these styles inside the body CSS selector. First thing first, let's define the font family. For this in our design, we used the Roboto font. So let's get that from the Google fonts. So go to the fonts.google.com and find the Roboto font. In any case, if you couldn't find the font from this list, you can search the font, type the font name inside the search box, Roboto. Alright, now select the font. From here, select the regular font style. This will give us the font import links. From this, select the CSS import method and copy this import. Go to the styles.css file and paste it after this bootstrap import. Next, we have to specify the CSS rules for this font. So again, back in the browser, down here we can find the CSS style for the font family. So copy it and paste it inside the body tag. Alright, we have successfully added the font family. Next, let's set the default font size. Set this to around 12 pixels. And at last, let's define our blog's default font color. Since the selector is color, colon. Now set the color to this body text color CSS variable. Alright, for now, these are the global style that we need to start. In the later sections, while we designing, we will add more global styles according to our blog's style requirements. Alright, this is the end of this initial setup for the design section. In this section, we created a new Angular app and we installed and imported the Bootstrap CSS framework to this newly created new Angular project. After that, we planned and generated the main initial components that required for the blog design. After that, we set up the CSS variables and defined some main global styles. So, in the next section, we will start to design the layouts component. As usual, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. So, this is it. Let's continue with the next section. Alright, in this section, we're going to be designing some common main components using the bootstrap and with some little bit of custom CSS. So in this section, we're going to be design the header or the navbar component, category navbar component, footer component. So after this layer components and designs, we will design the postcard component and the subscription area card component. So okay guys, let's begin. Alright, let's start the design from the header component. So in our design, inside the header area, we got only this header website logo. So let's design that. Before everything, in order to show this inside the browser, we have to add the component selector inside our root component, which is this app component. Header component selector is this app dash header. Add this inside the app component HTML file. App dash header. We will add the component selector name as a custom HTML element or in other words, we use the component selector as an HTML tag. Save this and back to the browser. As you can see here, we can see this header component works, which is inside the header component HTML file. Alright, let's begin. Now open the header.component HTML file. Inside this, add these HTML markups for heading. First, remove this p tag. We don't need this. To allocate the header area, let's use the header tags. So, header and hit enter. Inside this header tags, we only got this site logo. 
So let's create the markups for this site logo. Create a div. Inside this div, add an anchor tag. For now, point the href2 hash symbol. The text will be the site name ang-blog, all capital letters. Save this and go to the browser. This will be looks like this without any stylings. So let's make this looks better by bootstrapping this and by adding some custom stylings. First, let's add some bootstrap classes to this header tags. Class equal sign and quotes. Inside this, add these bootstrap classes. Navbar, navbar dash expand dash lg fixed dash top bg dash white with this navbar class we will get some padding and margin this navbar dash expand dash lg will give us the full width navbar on larger screen this fixed top class will be fixed the navbar's position always to the top of the page at last with this bg white you already knew this will apply the white color as the background for this header area. Save this and back to the browser. Actually, we cannot see a big difference here. Um, let's set a height for this header. Inside the header component CSS file, we'll add the styles. So, CSS selector is header because we're gonna add the style to this header area. So, selector is the header. This is an HTML element, so no need to add the dot symbol, just type header. Inside this, set the height to around 100 pixels. Now save this and back to the browser. Now if you look at this carefully, the site logo is located vertically middle of this header area. So this is what does this navbar bootstrap class. This will give us nice padding inside this header area. Alright, now let's make this site logo the center of the header area. For that, back to the VS Code. Add this bootstrap class to this div. Class equal sign inside quotes. First, add the container class. After this, add this justify dash content dash center. So now save this and back to the browser as you can see here now this site logo is located middle of the header this is what this justify content center bootstrap class does and also in order to use this justify bootstrap class we have to use the container bootstrap class as well otherwise this won't apply as you can see here so set all to the back all right next let's add the style to this site logo so let's create a custom class something site dash logo now go to the header component css file inside this let's define the site logo styles the css selector is this custom css class that we created so dot site dash logo and the css scope Inside this, set the padding top and bottom to 5 pixels and the left and right to 20 pixels. Next, set border radius to around 20 pixels. After this, set the background color. For this, we're gonna use the secondary color. If you can remember, we defined our theme color palette using the CSS variables. So let's use the secondary color CSS variable. Inside this, so we define the CSS variable something like this but in order to use this variable we have a method very simple first the var keyword after this parenthesis inside this pass the CSS variable name which is this secondary color so double dash or the double hyphen and the variable name secondary dash color that's it Next, let's add the text color. So, color colon. For this, let's use the primary color CSS variable. So, inside this var, inside brackets, pass the variable double dash 
primary dash color okay now save this and back to the browser um, this bit small let's add a font size around 1.5 m save this and back to the browser perfect we got this our beautiful site logo as we designed in the figma looking beautiful right so we have completed the header section design successfully next let's dive into the category nav bar all right let's begin the category nav bar design as always first let's add the html markups for this open the category nav bar component html file so this is a nav bar so let's use the html file nav tags so nav and hit enter inside this nav tags let's create a div for bootstrap container class um, first let's add the html markups after that we'll add the bootstrap classes okay next again another div this also for another bootstrap class don't worry about that for now just follow these html markups inside this div let's create an unordered list for categories so ul hit enter inside this create four li tags with anchor tags li greater than sign a and hit enter now duplicate this four times all right next let's add some dummy categories for the first one design second one inspiration third one sports and the last one is something politics so this is it for the html markup save this and back to the browser wait we cannot see anything here why is that can you guys guess yes as you know in order to show this inside the browser we have to add this category navbar component selector inside the app component so add the selector inside the app component html file like this header component selector category component selector is this app dash category dash navbar so add this perfect okay now save this and back to the browser still we cannot see any of the markups of category navbar again why is that we added the component selector but still we cannot see the category navbar components markups the problem is now all the markups of category navbar is behind this header area wait i'll show you this back to the app component html file and just comment this header component selected save this and back to the browser now you got what i'm saying right so in order to show this after the header area we have to add a margin for this category navbar so let's do that first uncomment this header selector save this and now go to the category navbar css file let's add this style directly to this nav tag so inside this nav and the css scope inside this scope add this margin dash top 100 pixels i added 100 pixels cause this header area height is 100 pixels if you can remember we add this in the previous lecture perfect now save this and back to the browser as you can see here now we can see this category list without any problem or right, let's make this category list looks perfect first let's add the bootstrap classes as you know we are using the bootstrap css framework to style our angular blog app so we don't need to write css from scratch all right inside the category navbar html file add these bootstrap classes to this nav tag navbar navbar dash expand dash lg and fixed dash top this navbar give us the nice padding this fixed top class will always fix this category navbar on the top of the page this navbar expand lg class will set to full width on larger screens all right next add the class container to this div we already learned about this bootstrap container class in detail in the bootstrap section 
Next add this bootstrap class for this div. Navbar dash collapse justify dash content dash center. This will set this ul tag middle of the page. Alright, next for this ul tag, add the navbar dash nav bootstrap class. After this, add the nav dash item bootstrap class to this li tag. Next, add the nav dash link bootstrap class to this category link. Now do the same for these other list tags as well. Alright, that's it. Save this and back to the browser. So this is how this looks like with the default bootstrap styles. This all now bootstrap class gave us this horizontal unordered list. Perfect, right? Next, let's make this little better by adding some custom CSS. Go to the category now by CSS file. Inside this, first let's define a height to this nav. So inside this nav, set the height to around 50 pixels. Next, let's add the background color to this. This time, let's use the CSS variable from our color palette. So background dash color var inside brackets CSS variable name is double dash navbar dash footer dash color. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. So now we got this nav area with this background color. Alright, let's add some styling to this nav link. First I want to increase this left margin for that let's use the bootstrap margin utility class inside this html file inside this li tag after this nav item class add this m this stand for margin and now we want to add the left margin so l after this the size add 3 ml dash 3 so this will set margin left to this link and this to all other links as well okay save this and back to the css file inside this let's add some styles to this nav link this time i'm gonna override the bootstrap style so for that i'm gonna use the same bootstrap class nav link so the css selector is dot nav dash link and the css scope Inside this, let's set the text dash transform to uppercase. I need these categories in uppercase inside the category number. After this, set the color to primary color. So for this also, let's use the primary color CSS variable. So first, var keyword. After this, inside brackets, pass the variable double dash primary dash color. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. Look at this, as you can see here, this category navbar is looking awesome. Alright, in this video, let's design the footer area. As usual, first add the HTML markup. So open the footer component HTML file. Inside this, add these markups. This time we are designing the footer. So let's use the footer HTML5 tags. All right, type footer and hit enter. Inside this footer tag, first create a div with bootstrap container class. Next inside this, let's add another div with row bootstrap class. I'm using the bootstrap row cause inside this footer, we have these three columns, one for the site logo, one for this menu, and last one for this copyright text all right inside this row create another div with these bootstrap classes call dash md dash 12 and the text dash center as you know this call md 12 will give us the full width column if you can remember we learn about this in the bootstrap section 
So this bootstrap text dash center utility class will add all the elements inside this div on the center of the page. Okay, next inside this first let's add the markup for the site logo. Inside this div, create a div with class site dash logo. Now inside this, add the site name ng dash blog, all capital letters. Perfect. Now inside the second div, create a ul tag with bootstrap class nav and justify dash content dash center. This is for the footer menu. Now inside this ul tag, let's create the menu item list. So for this create a li tag with the nav dash item bootstrap class. Now inside this create a anchor tag with this bootstrap class nav dash link. Alright, this first link will be home. Now duplicate this three times. The second menu item is about next terms and condition. The last menu item is contact. Alright, we have successfully created the footer menu. Next, let's add the markup for the copyright text. After this, you will add this p tag with these bootstrap utility classes mb-2 and mt-2. Now inside this add the copyright text. That's it. We have successfully markup all the HTML and added all the relevant bootstrap classes as well. So in order to see this footer inside the browser and this footer component selector inside the app component is fine. After this header and category number component add this footer component selector app dash footer. And one more thing, for now comment this header cause this footer component will be go behind these components. So we cannot see that in the browser. Alright, save this and back to the browser. So now this is how this looks like with the default bootstrap styling. So now let's make this looks better by adding some custom CSS styles. Inside the footer component CSS file. First, let's add the styling to the footer tag. So CSS selector is footer and the CSS scope. Inside this, add these styles. Set the height to 130 pixels. Padding to 15 pixels. Background color. Um, for this, set the footer and navbar CSS variable. So var inside brackets variable name is this double dash nerva dash footer dash color all right next let's add style to this site logo the css class is site dash logo now inside this add these css styles set the padding top and bottom to 5 pixels left and right to 20 pixels Set border radius to 20 pixels. Set the background color to secondary color CSS variable. Var inside brackets double dash secondary dash color. Set the text color to primary color. Var inside brackets double dash primary dash color. So now after this set the font size to around 1.2. Alright, next let's change this nav link color to primary. So dot nav dash link and the scope. Inside this, set the color to the primary color variable. So that's it. Save this and back to the browser. So looks perfect, right? So we have successfully completed the footer designing. Wait, before the end of this video, I want to show you something. Some of you may be noticed this already. Look at the site logo CSS style inside this footer CSS file. If you can remember, we add the same styling to this header 
site logo as well all these styles are same on both except this font size so repeating the same style in both of these style files is not a good practice right so we can get rid of this by defining a global style for this site logo so this is very simple so inside our global style css file copy and paste and this this font size is different for both so not same so remove it from here we don't need that now inside the header CSS, remove these old styles and keep this font size style. Do the same for the footer CSS as well. Keep the font size. Now save this all and back to the browser. Nothing changed. Everything seems like previous, which means all working fine. So guys, always make sure to follow the best practices. Um, this is not done yet. If you look at this, this nav links color style also repeated in this category style and also in this footer css file for this also we can create a global style so remove this from footer css and paste it inside the style.css file now remove the color style from the category css file that's it save this all and back to the browser Perfect. Before this, I comment this header and category number component to see this footer component properly. Now let's fix this. I comment this, save this and back to the browser. As you can see here, footer also behind this navbar. So for now, Let's add a margin to take this bottom of the page. Go to the footer CSS file inside this footer selector. Add this margin dash top. This time set this to around 85 VH. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. Perfect. Now we can see everything perfectly. Alright, this is it for this video let's meet you in the next lecture all right now we have successfully designed the basic layout components which are the header component category bar component and this footer component so now let's design this postcard if you look at our blog app design we have this postcard almost in every main page several times so what i'm planning to do is i'm going to create just one component for this postcard and we use that component to fill these postcard areas so let's do that so first generate a new component for this postcard so inside the integrated terminal let's generate the new component so for this run this command so first ng g as you know this this g stands for generate after this c this stands for components and now pass the path and the component name so first the path let's generate this component also inside of this same layout folder so layouts slash and the component name is postcard this is a two word name so post dash card that's it now to run this command hit the enter key perfect our new postcard component is ready so first thing first let's add this postcard component selector inside the app component so inside the app component html file add this postcard selector as a custom html element like this previous component selector add this between this footer and category number app dash post dash card and hit enter now save this and back to the browser inside the browser we cannot see anything new we added this new postcard component here but we couldn't find this p tag text postcard works why is that because this text is located under this header wait i'll show you this comment this header area save this and back to the browser 
Now we can see this postcard works here. So in order to see this inside this, we have to add a margin to this. So let's do that first. So now uncomment this header and this category navbar. Now create a div with class app dash body. This is just a custom CSS class, not any bootstrap class. So after this, put this postcard selector inside this div. Now go to the app component CSS file and add these styles. So the CSS selector is this app dash body class. So dot app dash body and the CSS scope. Now inside this set this app dash body divs min height to around 85 vertical height. This will set this div min height to 85 percentage of the browser height. Next set the margin top to 150 pixels. Cause this header height is 100 and this category navbar height is 50. So altogether we have to set this divs margin top to 150 pixels. Then only we can see this div clearly. Perfect. Now save this and back to the browser. As you can see here, now we can see this postcard works. Perfect. Alright, basic setups are done. Next, let's design the postcard. So go to the postcard component HTML file. Inside this, add these markups for the postcard design. For this, we're going to use the bootstrap card. So first, create a div with the bootstrap class card. Inside this, first add an img tag for post image. So img and hit enter. For now, just get an image URL from pexels.com and add that URL to this image src. In the later sections, we will make this dynamic. After adding the src, set the alt text to something post image. After this, add this bootstrap class to this img tag card dash img dash top. We learned about this in the bootstrap fundamentals section. If any of you cannot remember this, I recommend you guys to go through on that section again. Okay, next create the card dash body div. So div dot card dash body and hit enter. If you look at our design in Figma, first inside this card body, we have these labels. One is for the category, one is for featured, one is for views count. So let's design that. Now inside this card body, create a small tag with these bootstrap classes bg dash light text dash danger and text dash center so you guys already know this bg dash light will set the background color to light gray color like our design this will set the text color to bootstrap danger contextual color at last this text center will add the small tags text centered Okay, inside this, add this category. After this, we need another label for the featured. So duplicate this and change this text danger to text dash success. After this, add an additional class to this ML dash three. So this will add a margin left to this label. Now change this text to featured. Again, we need another label. So again, duplicate this. This time the text color will be info. Next change this text to weaves and add a random number. That's it. We have created the markups for the labels. After this we got this post title. So let's add the markups for that as well. Inside the VS code after these labels add a h5 tag with this bootstrap class empty dash one so this will add a margin top to this nothing fancy 
All right, for now, set a dummy title. As I said earlier in a later section, we will make these all dynamic. Okay, next for this summary text, for this create a p tag. Inside this also add a dummy text. All right, next let's add the markup for this timestamp. So copy and paste this one of these small tag. Change this text color to warning color. Now change the text to this dummy timestamp. Perfect. Now we have successfully completed all the HTML and all Bootstrap class markups. Now let's save this and back to the browser. So this card is set to the full width. Mm, let's set a max width to see this card properly. Inside the postcard CSS file, let's add a max width style to this card bootstrap class. So card max width, set this to around 400 pixels. Alright, save this and back to the browser. Look at this. This is the default bootstrap card styles looks like. So let's make this a little better by adding some custom CSS. So go to the postcard component CSS file and add these styles. Nothing much, just remove the default border and set a simple box shadow. So inside this same card selector, add this. First set the border to none. Next set the box shadow. So box dash shadow for this add these values. 0 pixels. 0 pixels, 33 pixels, minus 10 pixels and last set the shadow color RGBA inside brackets color values are 71, 114, 254 don't forget to add these commas and as a last value pass the opacity around 0.3 that's it. Now save this and back to the browser. Now look at this postcard. This looks perfect than the previous default bootstrap style. Right? Alright, so this is the end of the postcard styling. Next, let's design the subscription component. Alright, in this video, let's design this subscription card. This is also used in multiple places inside our main blog app. So let's make this a separate component and we can just use that component in all these pages. Perfect. We already generated this component in the previous lecture. So let's dive into the design straight away. So first, let's add the HTML markups and bootstrap classes. So open the subscription form component HTML file and add these markups. So first, create a bootstrap card div because this subscription form will be placed inside of a bootstrap card. div.card, hit enter. Inside this, as usual, card-body-div. Now inside this create a div for the subscription card header. So create a div with these bootstrap utility classes. Text dash center. MT dash three. MB dash five. This will set the text to center. This will add the margin top and this will add the margin bottom. Now inside this div create an H3 tag and add this as a heading text subscription form all capital letters next create a p tag with these classes m dash auto this is a bootstrap class and add another custom class subs dash text that's it hit enter this m dash auto will set this p tag middle of the sub card inside this p tag for now just add a dummy text all right next let's design this form with these two fields and with this button after this form tag with these bootstrap classes form dash inline 
and mb-5 this form dash inline will create a horizontal form as you already know this mb will add a margin to the bottom okay next inside this form let's create the fields inside this create a div with these classes form dash group and call dash md dash file now inside this div create an input with the class form dash control the type will be text set the place order to your name next we need another field for the email this also the same as this so duplicate this and change the type to email all right next let's design the subscription button create a div with this booster class called dash md dash 2 now inside this create a button with these booster classes btn btn dash info btn dash block and add this custom css class btn dash sub the button text will be subscribe all capital letters that's it for the markups save this and back to the browser so this is how this looks like with the default stylings so now let's make this looks better all right now open the css file of this component inside this let's add these stylings first let's add the style to this card dot card and this scope so this subscription cards background is set to secondary color so let's add that first so color and use the css variable so var inside brackets double dash and the variable name is secondary dash color now i want to remove the border of this card and add a box shadow so set the border to none the box shadow will be the same as the postcards shadow value so copy it from the postcard component CS file and paste it here wait before we move on to the next style if you see this carefully this border style and this shadow styles are the same on this postcard and this subscription card so we can make this style as a global style rather than repeating the same code again and again so in this both components we will use the same shadow and border non styles for these inputs as well so let's create a global class for this shadow effect inside these styles.css file and these create a new global css class something shadow dash effect inside this copy and paste this box shadow and this border style okay. now remove this from the postcard component and add this shadow dash effect class to this card div do the same for the subscription card as well remove this style and add the shadow effect global class to this sub card save this and back to the browser everything seems looks perfect right okay let's continue the design let's add the styling to these inputs so the css selector is the input field so input and the type is text pass that inside of a square brackets after this the css scope inside this set the height to around 60 pixels set the padding left to around 20 pixels set the font size to around 13 pixels and at last set the width to around 100 percent if you can remember i said that we're going to use the box shadow effect on this input as well 
So add the shadow dash effect class to this input fields. Save this and back to the browser. Look at this input. This is much better than the previous default stylings. So next let's add the styles to this email field. This field style also the same as this input field. Let's add the selector to the same style. So after that add a comma. This is also an input field. So input inside brackets. The type is this time email. Because we set this type to email. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. Looks good but having a small problem. Why this design is different than this text field? Can you guys guess? Yes of course. We didn't add the shadow effect class to this email input. So add that. Now save this and back to the browser. Looks awesome. Alright now let's design this subscribe button. Back to the VS code. For this button we added a custom class btn-sub. So let's use this custom class to style this button. Inside this is a file dot btn-sub and the scope. Inside this add these styles. Set the height to around 58 pixels. Set the border to none. Set the font size to around 13 pixels. And at last set the background color to primary color CSS variable. So va inside brackets double dash primary dash color. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. Looks awesome, right? So guys before the end of this video let's set the width to this p tag because this is taking the full width of this card. So for this also we added a custom CSS class dot sub dash text and set the width to around 500 pixels. Save this and back to the browser. Looks perfect. In the previous I did a mistake here. In here as you can see this forms input styles are not applied because this input CSS selector is wrong. This must be something like this. Type equal after this the input type not just the input type. So change this email input type also like this. Perfect. Save this and back to the browser. Now this looks much better than the previous. Um, let's add a small margin to the top here to separate this dummy text and the form. Back in the VS code, add empty dash file to this form tag. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. Looks perfect. Alright guys this is it for this section. In this section we designed the header component, we designed the category number component, we designed the footer component and also we designed the postcard component and the subscription card component. Hope you guys enjoyed this section. Alright we almost completed our blog's front end design. Now in this section we are going to design all the pages. So in this section, we'll prepare app component to load the layout of the pages correctly. We'll design the home page all sections. We'll design the single category page. We'll design a single post page design with the comments area section. And also we'll design all the other pages about terms and conditions page. So this section is going to be awesome. Let's get started. So before everything we have to prepare our main app component to show these pages components correctly inside the browser. So let's do it. In previous we added these postcard and the subscription cards component selector inside this app body div tag. Now we don't need that so remove it. Now I want to show all the pages components inside this app body div. 
course if you can remember we added this stock margin to this app body so we can see this app body tag without this going back to the header and this category number hope you guys got the idea so inside this put this router outlet because this router outlet is the one going to load the components according to the navigation URL or the router this also we defined in the previous section perfect now save this and back to the browser in here now we can see this home works which means home component is loaded successfully now navigate to the category router perfect this loaded the single category component now go to the post router perfect everything seems to work as we expected so now in the bottom we have this footer component in the previous section to get this to the bottom of the page we added this margin top to this so now we don't need that remove this margin top from the footer component css file now add this footer component selector inside the app component html file after this app body div i already have this if any of you are missing this add this perfect save this and back to the browser this is now not in the bottom of the page so let's set this footer bottom of the page nothing fancy just add a min height to this app body div so inside the app component css file add this style inside this app body css selector min height set this value to around 35 vh save this and back to the browser now this is fit to the bottom of the page looks good right now let's set up the subscription card as you know the subscription card is also inside of all the pages so we'll add that also inside the app component so before this footer add the subscription card selector app dash subscription dash form and hit enter this will complete this as an html custom element save this and back to the browser mm, this is taking the full width of the browser window so let's set a width to this subs card so go to the subscription card component css file and add this style inside this card selector width and set this to around 1200 pixels perfect save this and back to the browser let's set this to the center of the page so for this we have to use the bootstrap justify content center class in order to use this class we have to use the bootstrap container class and the bootstrap row class so let's add that first create a div with a bootstrap container class inside this create another div with these classes row and justify dash content dash center now place this subcard component selector inside this row div save this and back to the browser now we got this subscribe card in the center of the browser view and one last thing let's add a small margin to this bottom and top so back in the VS code, add this inside this container div mt-5 and mb-5. This will add margin top and this will add margin bottom. So that's it. Save this and back to the browser. Looks perfect. Alright, from now on let's get started with pages designs. So first let's design the home page in our design as you can see inside the home page we have this featured area and this latest post area so let's start with the featured area design for the home page we created a separate component in the previous lecture so first open the home component html file and add these markups for the featured post area so this is a featured area section so let's use this section html file tags so section and hit enter for this tag 
let's assign a custom CSS class. The class name is featured dash section. Now inside this, create a div with bootstrap CSS class container dash fluid. Inside this, create a bootstrap row. Inside this row, create a full width column. So div with col dash md dash 12 bootstrap CSS class. And also add these utility classes as well. Text dash center and the empty dash file. So I'm going a little fast because we learned all these bootstrap classes when we learning bootstrap, right? Hope you guys remember these bootstrap classes. Okay, inside this column div, create an h2 tag for the heading. For this h2 tag, add this bootstrap class, text dash white. The heading will be featured post. Next, add a p tag for a small description text. Set this p tags class also to text dash white. For now, just add a simple dummy text for this p tag. Perfect. After this first row, create another nib row, div dot row, and hit enter. Inside this, add the div for the card column. So div dot call dash lg dash three. As we learned in the bootstrap section, this will set size three columns on larger screens. Alright, inside this, we can render the postcard component. So place the postcard component selector inside this app-post-card. I think that's it for the HTML markups. Now save this and back to the browser. As you can see here, this is the default style will look like. Nothing looks great, right? So let's make this by adding some custom styles. So back in the VS code and open the home component CSS file. Inside this, add these styles. The CSS selector is for the featured area section is featured dash section. So dot featured dash section and the CSS code. Inside this set padding dash left to 130 pixels. Padding right to 130 pixels and also padding bottom to 130 pixels. Next set the background color to the primary color CSS variable. So after this background dash color and set this to primary color CSS variable. So var inside brackets double hyphen and primary dash color. That's it. Now save this and back to the browser. Perfect, right? Um, let's fill this row by adding some postcards. Now we have only one, right? So back in the VS code, duplicate this column div with the postcard component. Duplicate it three more times because in a row, we're gonna add four featured postcards. Okay, now again, save this and back to the browser. Wow, and this looks perfect. Very simple, right? Nothing fancy. We are just using the bootstrap default styles and a little bit of custom CSS codes to make this looks beautiful. Um, this is it for this featured post section. So let's dive into the next lecture. Okay, now let's design this latest post area. As you can see, this design inside the home page, after this featured area, we got this latest post. Inside this, we have these postcards. Nothing much, just a simple layout. So let's do it. Back to the VS Code. This is also going to be inside the home page component. We can create a separate component for this, but this is only on this home page. So no need to create a separate component. So let's add the markup for the latest post area inside this same 
component. So after this create a section tag with these bootstrap classes container and empty dash file. Inside this section create a full width column with the text center. We define the full width column like this in bootstrap call dash md dash 12 and don't forget to add the text dash center bootstrap class as well. Inside this div create an s2 tag and s2 text will be the latest post. After this create a p tag and just add this dummy text. That's it for this section heading area. Now after this heading row create another bootstrap row for postcards. Inside this row create a column with size 4 and also add another bootstrap class to this empty dash 3. Perfect. Now inside this we can show the latest postcards. As you know we use a separate component to render the post list. So add that post component selector inside this column div app dash post dash card. Now let's copy and paste this three times. I am duplicating this just for now. We will make this dynamic in a later section. So that's it. Save this all and back to the browser. As you can see here, we got this latest post area. Awesome, right? Alright, in this video, let's design this single category page. In this page, we don't have anything big, just this hero area with this category name. And down below, we got this list of postcards. Then down below, as usual, we got this subscription card. We don't need to design this subscription card and these postcards because we created separate components for these postcards and subscription cards. So now we can just simply reuse that postcard here. So let's see this in action. In the previous lecture, we generated the single category component. So we can start the design straight away. Open the single category component HTML file. As usual, let's start with the HTML mockups. Then we can move on to the design. All right, let's begin. If you look at the Figma design, at the top of this page, we got this hero area. So first let's design that. Inside the component HTML file, create a div. Inside this, create an h1 tag. The h1 text is, for now, let's just add the category name, something general knowledge. Later we can fetch this from the database. After the h1 tag, add the p tag and add some dummy text. That's it for the HTML markup for this hero area. Before we move further, let's see how this looks like in the browser. Save this and back to the browser. Now we are in the main root router. Navigate to the single category router, which is this. If you can remember, we created this router in the previous lecture. So guys, this is how this hero area looks like without any stylings. Wait, one more thing. If you look at this markup, we added only this hero areas HTML markups. But in the browser, we got this header footer and this subscription card. How do we got this? Yes, of course, we learned this before. When we navigate around the Angular app using the Angular router, this will load that related component into this weave using this router outlet inside the app component. So in this app component, we got this header, footer and subscription component. That's why we got this all in the view. This is very useful and no need to import these layout components again and again, right? All right, now let's style this hero area. I think we don't need to write any new CSS styles. In the design, we have this green background. So let's add this. For this, we use the primary color. 
create this global style BG theme primary for background colors. So now we can use this same CSS class. So inside this div, add this class bg theme. Save this and back to the browser. Awesome, we got this green background color. Now we cannot see this text properly. So add this bootstrap class to make this text white. So text dash white. And also add padding to this. For this also we can use the padding bootstrap utility classes p-5 now save this all and back to the browser um, now the background of this hero area is perfect but the text is not in the right position so let's fix this for this we can add the bootstrap container class so inside this main div create another div with the bootstrap class container after this put this h1 and this p tag inside this container div save this and back to the browser now this looks perfect all right let's move on to the next this list of post for this also we don't need to design anything we already designed the postcard component so all we have to do is import that postcard component to this single category component let's do that first create a div with the container bootstrap class inside the container class define a bootstrap row div inside this in the design we are showing three postcard in a row so create a bootstrap four column grid why is that if you can remember bootstrap is a 12 grid column based framework so 12 divided into 3 answer is 4 hope you guys remember this so create a div with bootstrap class pol md 4 inside this div import the postcard div we display another component inside of another component using the component selector so the postcard component selector is this so inside this single category component html file and this selector app dash post as an html tag this is not something new we already learned about this in detail right okay now duplicate this div five times to make two rows of postcards that's it save this and back to the browser as you can see here we got this list of postcards this looks okay but we are having uh, some margin issues this postcard container is stuck with this hero area and also as you can see here the second postcard row is stuck with this first postcard row so let's fix this very simple back in the vs code add empty dash 5 and mb dash 5 bootstrap margin utility classes for this postcard container this empty will add margin top and this mb will add margin bottom okay now let's add the same mb dash 3 margin utility class to this postcard as well that's it save this and back to the browser look at this this looks perfect as our figma design right awesome so we have successfully designed the single category page let's move on to the next page our next page is the single post page this page layout also easy to design using the bootstrap not too hard so on this page also we got these layout components header category number and this subscription card like the other pages inside this page mainly we got two columns left side we got this single post details card which includes post image and the post content at this bottom of the same left column we got this comment section which includes this comment form and the comment list area at the right side column we got this similar postcards list 
that's it this is not hard but the layout is a bit tricky so let's begin so we're going to use bootstrap to design this layout right so inside the single post component HTML file add these markups first create a div with the bootstrap class container inside this create another div with bootstrap row inside this we have to create this left side and the right side columns like the design so for the left side column we'll allocate nine columns from the bootstrap grid for this right side column we'll allocate the remaining columns which are three columns because you already know that bootstrap column grid size is 12 so this is 9 and this is 3 total 12 right okay let's add the markups inside this row create a div the first column size is 9 so the bootstrap class is called md-9 after this div create the second column div inside this same row div so div dot call dash md dash 3 and hit enter so this is 9 and this is 3 altogether 12 hope you guys got the idea perfect now inside this create a bootstrap card so div with bootstrap card class inside this another div with bootstrap class card dash body before this card body let's add an image tag to load this post featured image so before this card body tag add an image tag with these bootstrap classes card dash img dash top img dash fluid hit enter just for now let's add an image url from pixels.com that's it now inside the postcard body first thing first we got these labels for category featured or not featured views count and for this timestamp so let's add them very simple create a small tag with these bootstrap classes bg dash light text dash danger and text dash center this is for the post category label so inside this add a category name something um design so duplicate this label for another three times set this second label for the featured label so the featured text color is green which means it's bootstrap success color so change this danger to success and also change this text to featured next for the views label so change this to info color and change this text to views and add some dummy views count perfect next this is for the timestamp so change this text color to warning and add a dummy timestamp so at last add ml-2 bootstrap utility class to these all labels except this first one as you know this will add a margin left to these labels perfect okay next in the card body we got this post title so let's add an h1 tag so h1 with these utility classes empty dash 3 and mb dash 3 so this empty dash 3 will add a margin to top and this will add a margin to bottom so for now we just add this dummy heading to this h1 tag next we got this post contents so for this add a simple p tag and add this dummy text simple right so that's it for the html and bootstrap markups so save this all and back to the browser so now navigate to the post router but if you can remember in the previous lecture we defined these routers so in order to see this single post component inside the browser we have to navigate to this post router simple right hope you guys remember this so inside the browser navigate to this post router after this main url slash post as you can see here we successfully designed this post details card there is nothing much to add the custom CSS code 
just add the shadow effect to this card. So back in the VS Code, for the drop shadow, we created a global CSS class in the previous. So now we don't need to write this same style again. We can just add this class name to this bootstrap card. So inside this card div, add this shadow dash effect class. Save this and back to the browser. Perfect. Looking awesome. So we successfully completed the design of the postcard details. Now let's add the related postcards inside the second left column. So this is easy, nothing much to do. We already designed the postcard component. Uh, we can use that here. So inside this second div, add the postcard component selector, app-post-card and select this autocomplete. This will add this as a custom HTML element. Perfect, now duplicate this few times. That's it, save this and back to the browser. Look at this, looking awesome, right? All right, let's design the comment section. So in our Figma design, first we have the comment form. Then we have the comment list area. So let's start this with the comment form. So we created a separate comment form component for this in a previous lecture. So open the comment form component HTML file and add these markups. First create a div with the bootstrap class card and empty dash file. Inside this create the card body bootstrap div. Inside this create an h4 tag and add this text as the h4 tag leave a comment so after this h4 tag create a p tag and add this text you can leave a comment using this comment form perfect next we have the comment form so create a form tag we don't need the action attribute as you know in angular we don't use this so remove it in a later section, we'll make this form an angular reactive form. Now inside this create the inputs for the comment form. We got only these two input fields. One is for the name and another one is for the comment. For this comment, we'll use the text area. Okay, inside this form, create a form group bootstrap div. Inside this, first create a label and this label text will be name. After this create input and this type will be text. After this add the form control bootstrap class to this input field. After this set the placeholder to enter your name here. Perfect. Again after this create a field for the comment text area. Again another div with bootstrap class form dash group. Inside this div, create a label and the label text will be comment. After this, create a text area. Keep this call and row size as default. Set the class to form dash control. And at last, don't forget to add the placeholder. The placeholder is add your comment here. Next, add the submit button. So after this, create a button with these booster classes, btn, btn-info, the button text will be add a comment. That's it for the markups, save this and back to the browser. We cannot see the comment form here. Why is that? Because we didn't add the comment form component selector inside this single post component. So let's add that. The comment form is inside this first column. So after this post details card, add the comment form component selector, app-comment-form. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. So this is how this looks like with Bootstrap default styling. So now let's make this awesome by adding some custom stylings. Nothing much to do. First add the shadow effect to this comment card. So add the shadow dash effect global CSS class to this same card div. Next I want to add the same shadow to these inputs as well. 
So add that shadow dash effect class to these inputs. Now save this and back to the browser. Now this looks better than the previous. But I feel that this input field is a bit small. I want to make this same as the subscription cards input style. Not only that, I want to use the same the subscribe button style to this submit button as well. So let's do it. So we already defined these styles in the subscription component CSS file. So in order to use those styles inside this post form component, we have to make them as a global style. So remove this input style and this button dash sub style from here and paste it inside the styles.css file. As you know, the styles.css file is the global style file in our Angular app, right? So after this, change this btn dash sub to something btn dash theme. That's it. Now save this all and back to the browser. Input style is applied. But these button styles are not applied because we applied this input styles direct to the HTML input tags. But for the buttons, we created this btn dash theme custom CSS class. So in order to apply these styles on the button tags, we have to add this custom class to the button tag. You guys already know this, right? So we have to add the button styling to the subscribe button and also add comment button. So first go to the subscription card HTML file and change this class to btn dash theme. Now go to the comment form component HTML file and add the btn dash theme class to this submit button. Perfect. Now save this all and back to the browser. Look at this. Looks perfect. Right? Awesome. Wait, before end of this video, if you notice this subscribe cards inputs width is not set to full width. So to fix this, we have to add this width 100% style inside the subscription form component CSS file. So copy this input style and paste it inside the subscription form component CSS file and remove all the style except this width style. So save this and back to the browser. Looks perfect, right? So this is it for the comment form design. Let's move on to the comments area design. All right, now in this lecture, let's design this comment area. Very simple, nothing much to do. So let's start with the HTML markups. So first thing first, in order to render this comment list component inside the browser, we have to add the component selector inside the single post component HTML file. So after this comment form component, add the comment list selector, which is this app-comment-list. That's it. Open the comment list component HTML file. Inside this, let's add the markup. First create a div with these bootstrap classes card mb-5 mt-5 pb-5 and at last add the shadow dash effect global class so this shadow effect class is our global css class for add shadow effect to this card div inside this create a div with card body bootstrap class perfect so now inside this card body Create an h4 tag and add these bootstrap classes mt-3 and mb-3. I hope you guys remember these bootstrap classes. So the h4 text will be comments and inside brackets add a dummy comments count for now. In the later section we'll make this dynamic. Alright, next let's create a div for this comment area. So div and add this custom CSS class comment dash box and also add this empty dash three bootstrap utility class as well. Perfect. Now inside this comment box div, create an h6 tag with the mb dash zero bootstrap class. The h6 text will be John Doe. So after this, create a small tag for timestamp. The bootstrap class will be text-danger 
inside this add a dummy timestamp all right after this another div for the comment create a div with these utility classes md-3 mb-3 now inside this add a dummy comment after this add this reply and view reply tags so for this let's create anchor tags so a and hit enter set the href to ash symbol just for now add empty dash one bootstrap class to this the href text will be reply so now copy and paste this again and change the text to weave reply and also don't forget to add ml-3 utility bootstrap class to this weave reply anchor tag as you know this will apply a margin left to this anchor tag after this add an hr html tag this will give us a horizontal separator line so that's it for the markups save this and back to the browser look at this we almost got our design with default bootstrap styling so we don't need to write css from scratch right so okay now let's make this comment looks like this for this we have to add some custom stylings so open the comment list component css file and add these styles if you can remember i added this comment dash box custom css class to this div so let's use that to style this comment section so inside this css file dot comment dash box and the scope inside this first let's add the padding set the top and bottom padding to 15 pixels left and right to 35 pixels after this set this background color to this ash f0 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 so perfect that's it save this and back to the browser look at this now this looks the same as our design so let's duplicate this comment box few more times. Save this and back to the browser. Look at this. Beautiful, isn't it? So guys, this is it for the single post component page design. We completed all these sections on this page. So perfect. Let's move on to the next page design. all right we almost completed all of the hard design layouts now in this lecture let's design the about us page if you see this design in the figma this is a very simple layout here we got this background colored section and this simple about us text with this heading so let's see how to design this before design this page let's define some global utility classes to add background and text colors so go to the styles.css file and add this. In the previous lecture, we created this bg dash theme. Now let's create another bg class to secondary color. So bg dash secondary dash theme. Inside the scope, set the background color to secondary color CSS variable. Next again, another class to set text color to primary color the class is text dash theme dash primary and inside this scope set the color to primary css variable color var inside brackets double dash primary dash color perfect as usual let's start with the html markup open the about us component html file if you can remember we generated this when we planning the components for this section first create a section tag this time let's go a little speed i will add the bootstrap classes also on the first try because we learned about this all several times now right so hope you guys will follow this without any problem so create a section tag with empty dash 5 bootstrap tag as you know this empty dash 5 will add a margin top to this section Inside this section, create a bootstrap container div with some additional bootstrap utility CSS classes. MT-5, MB-5, P-5. And add another custom CSS class to add this background color to this section. 
bg dash theme once again this class is not a bootstrap class if you can remember we created this global css class in the previous lecture to add the primary color background right okay let's move on inside this container div create another div for the second area with the css classes p-5 mt-4 these two classes are bootstrap classes next this section is in our secondary color so add this bg dash secondary dash theme custom global css class to make this div background color to our blog's secondary color theme inside this let's add this about us heading and this about us dummy text so inside this div first thing first add the about us heading h1 tag with these bootstrap classes text dash white and text dash center this text white will make this heading text color to white and this text center as you already know this will make this heading text center of the page okay next add the about us text create a p tag and add some dummy text duplicate this three times that's it next we got this back to home button so let's add that bu button so this button is located center of the page so first create a div with text dash center bootstrap class inside this div create a button open and close a button tag after this add these bootstrap classes btn btn dash info btn dash sm empty dash four the button text will be back to home perfect save this and back to the browser in order to see this about us component we have to navigate to this about us router as you can see here i made two mistakes here first one is this heading must come inside this first box and this about us dummy text has to be in primary green color so let's fix this remove this heading from here and place it inside the first div next add this text dash theme dash primary css global class to this div this will make all of the text to primary color within this div i think that's it let's see save this and back to the browser this looks awesome but i'll change this text as our designs dummy text so save this and back to the browser perfect now let's change this button style so i want this button the same as this subscribe button if you can remember in previous we created this global style for this btn dash theme so now add this class to this back to home button as well so save this and back to the browser looks perfect right we got this about us page as we planned All right, let's design the terms and condition page. Actually, nothing to design here. This page is also the same as this about us page. So just copy and paste this about us markup into this terms and conditions component HTML file. Open this terms and condition component HTML file. Copy this about us HTML page tags and paste it inside this terms and conditions html file i'll change this heading tag about us to terms and conditions that's it save this and back to the browser as you know in order to see the terms and condition navigate to the router terms and conditions look at this looks perfect right so this is it for this section we have successfully designed our angular blocks entire front end except this contact us page don't worry we have a separate section for this contact us page in that section we will cover this so last few sections we totally completed the design of our entire blocks front end design top to bottom 
we used bootstrap framework for the main layout and utility designs and we used some custom CSS styles and global CSS styles to make this blog looks awesome right hope you guys enjoyed and completed this section without any problems if you have any questions please feel free to ask i will always be there for you until now we have completed designing our angular box front end design so in this section we're going to design the backend dashboard or the content management system and do some data manipulations using the firestore database so in this section we're going to be looking at how to generate a separate angular app for the blogs dashboard planning the dashboard components layout designing the dashboard layout using the bootstrap and with some custom css and also we will look at what is firebase and firestore what is the difference between sql database versus no sql database and at last we will look at how to connect our angular app to the firebase and firestore database so let's get started In the previous section, we completed the design of our Angular Blocks client wave. Now from this lecture, we look at how to create the backend side for add and remove post and all the technical related parts. As you know, this previously designed blog is just a static blog site. We added all this by hand coding. The subscription forms and these comment sections are not doing any logics, it's just a static design. So in order to add the post and to do all the logical stuff, we need a backend or the content management system. So let's make a simple CMS or the content management system using the Angular. For this, let's use a separate standalone new Angular app. Actually, we can add this inside the same Angular Blog Gap's front-end design Angular app. But rather than mixing all in one app, we can make separate apps. This approach is clean and in case if anything goes wrong, we can easily identify the problem and fix it. Alright, let's begin. As usual, let's create the CMS app inside our Angular course folder which is located inside my desktop. So open the terminal and navigate to the project folder. Just copy the folder path and inside the command prompt or the terminal cd and paste the folder path. That's it. Now inside this create the new angular app. You guys now know about this right. To create a new angular app we will use the angular cli so ng this is angular cli command after this new and the project name let's call this ng dash blog dash dashboard and hit enter now this is asking about the angular strict mod give this to no cause we are not gonna use this strict mod in this course so after this give yes to this cause we need the angular routing module now select the preferred styling method which is css and hit enter perfect now this will create a new angular app and install all the required npm packages awesome our new angular blog is ready now open this project inside the vs code so right click on the project folder open with vs code now run this app in a development mode using the angular cli you already know about this so open the integrated terminal and run this command ng serve oops we have a small problem here this 4200 port is already in use why is that Yes, you are correct. We are already running our Angular blog apps front end with this port. So we cannot use that same port to run another Angular app. 
So Angular CLI is informing us that we are using the default port 4200 and would you like to use another port instead of the default port? If we give yes to this, this will use something random port on our computer. So this port can be different than mine. This is totally okay, but I kind of don't like this random port number. It is difficult to remember, right? So for this, we have a solution Angular CLI as giving us the port flag to define where to run this Angular app. Very simple, stop this, control C, this will stop this running. Now again, run the ng serve. This time, we'll define the port using the port flag. So double hyphen port after this space and give the port number. The angular default port is 4200. Now it's already in use. So let's run this app using the 4300 port. That's it. Hit the enter to run this command. Perfect. This time we got our app up and running on this port 4300. It's easy to remember, right? Alright, now open this inside the browser. Localhost colon 4300. Perfect. We got this Angular boilerplate, which means this Angular app is up and running without any problems. For this backend, we don't have any designs like blocks frontend. If you can remember, we designed the frontend in the Figma, right? For the backend like dashboard or CMS, we don't need to design this on a design tool. With this backend, we only manipulate data like adding, removing, updating, etc, etc. So before we start, let's plan our blog's backend and generate the components. For this dashboard, we need a login page cause this is not accessible for all. This is only accessible for admin with the password. So we need a login page. In our blog, we have categories. So to manage categories, we need a component. So next we have post component to manage post. Next we need a separate component to manage the subscriptions. And also we need a separate component to manage the comments as well. At last we need a dashboard to show all these manageable components. As a layout page, we got only two components which are the header and the footer component. So that's it. This is the simple plan for the backend dashboard CMS. For now, these are the components that we needed. In case if we need anything additional components, we can add them to this backend at that time. Perfect. So in this lecture, let's connect Bootstrap to this Angular app. Because we're gonna use the bootstrap as our primary CSS framework. Um, wait, I'm not gonna do this. You guys already know how to do this. So pause the video and do it yourself. Once you have done, come back and continue this video. So let's begin. Alright, hope you guys did this on your own. If not, it's okay. Continue with me. To connect bootstrap, we have three methods, right? Go to the getbootstrap.com and the current bootstrap version is bootstrap 5. But in this course, I am using the version 4.6. Cause to keep this course without any breaks. Cause I trust bootstrap 4.6 is more stable than the bootstrap 5. So go to the downloads and change this version to 4.6. Go to this download section from this bootstrap 4.6 documentation. So we can use the bootstrap CDN links or you can download the compiled files from the bootstrap website and put them inside our angular app or you can use the node package managing. You can use any of these methods as your wish. 
but for this like the previous I am going to use the npm method. So back in the VS code open a new integrated terminal inside the VS code. Inside this run this command npm i this i stands for install and the package name is bootstrap. Wait we are not done yet if you run this this will install the latest version of the bootstrap which is bootstrap 5. So I don't want bootstrap 5 I need the bootstrap version 4.6. So how are we going to get that? Very simple just simply add this end of this at 4.6 without any spaces. With this we are telling to node package manager to install this exact version of the bootstrap. Hope you guys got the idea. To execute this command hit enter. That's it. Perfect we have successfully installed bootstrap inside our angular. As you know when we install a package using npm that will be downloaded inside the node module folder. Alright now let's connect this installed bootstrap package to this angular app. For this also we got three methods can you guys remember this? We did this in the previous section. The first method is linking bootstrap CSS files to the angular.json file. The second method is linking the bootstrap CSS file to the index.html file. The last method is adding the bootstrap CSS file to the styles.css file using the CSS imports. From these three methods I'm going to use the last method which is the linking bootstrap CSS file to the styles.css file. As you know styles.css file is the main global CSS file for this entire angular app. So if we link the bootstrap CSS file inside this we can use the bootstrap style with this entire app. That's why we are importing the bootstrap style inside this styles.css file. Hope you guys remember this. So let's see this in action. Very simple. Inside this style.css file, add this import statement, add import, inside double quotes, Matilde symbol, bootstrap, slash, dist, slash, css, slash, bootstrap, dot, min, dot, CSS. With this metal day symbol, we represent the node modules folder. We learned all about this in detail in the previous lecture, right? So we successfully connected Bootstrap to this Angular app. Before start, let's import the global CSS styles and variables from our blog's frontend app. This backend dashboard and the blog's frontend both are different parts of the same application. So we will use the same styling for this backend dashboard as well. So we don't need to write those styles again. We have already done it. So now we just do the copy and paste. So open the previous app in another VS code if you don't have open it. Just right click on the project folder and select open with VS code. So inside this open the global style.css file. Copy this old styles cause we need all of these global styles. Now go to the backend dashboard app VS code. In here also open the global CSS file which is this style.css file. Inside this paste the previous copied style. Perfect. Alright in this lecture let's design the header component. First thing first now let's generate the component. In the previous lecture we planned the components but we didn't generate the components. So let's generate the header component. So inside the integrated terminal type this command. You guys already know this. Can you guys guess the angular CLI command for generate components? Yes of course you are correct. ng g c and the components path and the components name. 
so as previous we'll put all the layer components inside layouts folder this is not must but always try to organize your app in a good manner so layouts slash component name is header hit enter to execute this command perfect we successfully generated our first component for the back end now let's start the design so for this header also i'm going to use the same style as our front end so we don't need to code anything new just copy this from the front end design so go to the other vs code window which which is loaded our front end blog application in here open the header component html file and copy these all html markups now go to the back end vs code and open the header component html file and paste the copied code now again back to the front end blog vs code and open the header component html css file and copy these CSS styles and paste it inside the backend's header component CSS file. That's it. So guys, keep this in your mind. We can create this same backend also inside this frontend. If we do that, we don't need to generate these layout components again and do the designs. We can use the same header component, right? But I'm doing this in a separate Angular app to make this understandable and I want to show you guys to connect the two different angular apps to one database and do the data manipulations. You guys will understand this at the end of this course. So for now just follow everything like mine. Alright save this all. Before going to the browser, in order to see this header component inside the browser, at the header component selector inside the app component so app dash header dash component as you know we'll use this component selector as an html element to render this inside the browser perfect save this and back to the browser look at this we got our beautiful header with the site logo like our front end's header awesome right Alright, let's design the footer component for the backend. For this footer component also, we're gonna use the same frontend's footer. So first thing first, generate the footer component. So inside the integrated terminal, ngc, and we'll generate this inside the same layouts folder. So layouts slash component name is footer. Perfect, we successfully generated the footer component. Now let's Copy the HTML structure from the frontend footer component HTML file and paste it inside the backend footer component HTML file. Now do the same for CSS styles as well. Perfect, save this all. Now let's add the component selector inside the app component. Wait, before that, let's create a div with app dash body CSS class, same as this front end app body div. Copy this style from the front end and paste this inside the app component css file so now reduce this top margin to 100 pixels cause in this backend we don't have this category navbar right so this header height is 100 pixels so that's why i change this margin top to 100 pixels to locate this app body div after the header component we learned about this right okay now inside the app component HTML file, add the footer component selector after this app body div app dash footer. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. 
Mm, wait, we don't need these footer menus. So remove it from the footer component. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. Looks awesome, right? All right, now let's design the backend dashboard component. So first let's generate the component. So inside the integrated terminal, ng, g, c, mm, we'll generate this component inside the main app root folder. So no need to add a path. Just type the component name, which is dashboard. Hit enter to execute this command. Perfect, we got the dashboard component. Not like the previous layout header and footer component, we don't have any codes to copy and paste. We have to design this dashboard component from scratch. For this, I'm not gonna use any complex layout. We'll do this with a simple layout. So first let's add the dashboard component selector inside the app component. As you know, in order to see this inside the browser, we have to add the component selector inside the app component so inside the app component HTML file add this app dash dashboard select this auto complete this will add this as a custom html element perfect save this and back to the browser we got this dashboard works which coming from dashboard component all right now let's start with the layout html markups so inside the dashboard component HTML file, add these markups. First create a div with the booster class container. Inside this create another div with row bootstrap class. So inside this row, create another div for the bootstrap column called md-4 and with another bootstrap utility class mb-5. Inside this column div, create bootstrap card with shadow dash effect global CSS class. If you can remember, we created this CSS class to add a drop shadow to an HTML element. Hope you guys remember this. Now inside this, create card dash body div with these classes, text dash center, bg dash theme dash secondary this text center is a bootstrap class which will set text to the center of the card body and this bg dash theme secondary class is this global css class to add secondary color background perfect now inside this div create an h2 tag with these css classes text dash theme dash primary this is another global CSS class for primary colored text. These two text will be category. I am creating this card for category menu. After this create a p tag and add this paragraph. Manage your category details here. Mm, that's it for the HTML markups. So save this and back to the browser. Look at this. We got this card. Now let's increase this margin and also increase this height of the card as well. So back in the VS code, first let's increase the margin. In the previous lecture, I added margin top 100 pixels to this app body div inside the app component CSS file. So now let's increase that to 150 pixels. So save this. Now go to the dashboard CSS file and let's increase the height of the card this is a selector is the card so dot card and set the height to around 200 pixels save this and back to the browser looks great
Now let's add an icon for this to give a nice look for this card menu. For this I am going to use the font awesome icon library which is the most popular icon library for websites. So in order to use this we have to import the icon library to our angular app. Like the bootstrap import we have several methods to import but for this I am going to use the cadn method that is easy to compare other methods. So search for the font awesome cdn in google search. Go to this link, go to this first link, scroll down and copy this cdn link. Now go to the VS code, open the index.html file. As you know this is our angular apps main html file. So inside the head tag paste the copied cdn link. That's it. Now let's add the icon. So we can see the icon library from font awesome website. Go to this icons tab. In here we can find all icons. So filter this to free. So this will show all the free icons because we are using the free version of the font awesome icon library. We can search for an icon from here. Let's search something list. Mm, let's use this icon. Click on this. In here we can find the markup for this icon. Click on this HTML markup. This will copy this to the clipboard. Now go to the VS code. Before this h2 tag, let's put this inside of h1 tag. So create h1 tags. Inside this, paste the copied font awesome icons markup. Perfect. Save this and back to the browser. Looks good. Now let's add the margin top to this and also set this icons color to primary color. Like this text. So back in the VS code. To add a margin, let's use the bootstrap empty-3 bootstrap utility class. For the primary color, let's use the text-theme-primary global CSS class. Perfect. Save this and back to the browser. Looks awesome, right? For now, keep only this one category card menu. We'll add other menu cards in later sections. For blog app, we're gonna use Firebase for all our backend needs. So what is this Firebase actually? Firebase is a backend service for mobile and web apps. So it has so many inbuilt features like real-time databases, cloud functions, analytic tools, testing tools, push notifications, authentications, hosting, likewise so many features are there. So with this, we can create our mobile or the web app without worrying about backend needs like database hosting, scaling and so on. I think most of you are know about this cause this Firebase is pretty much popular among developers and small and big companies these days. So firebase.google.com. So this is the landing page for the Firebase service. You can find all the details here. Firebase is not totally free but Firebase has a free time which is very helpful for startups and for students like you to develop small apps like this. Once your app grows you can pay. We can find the pricing details in this pricing tab. For now we don't need to think about the paid version. We'll use only the free version of this Firebase. And also Firebase is developed and maintained by Google. Therefore we don't need to worry about data privacy and security and the lifetime of this Firebase. So let's see how to create an account for Firebase. It's very easy, go to this sign in. Like all other Google services, you have to join this with your Gmail account. So create an account with Gmail if you don't have a Gmail account. You can create a new account with this. 
I already have a Gmail account so I will create my account using this Gmail account. Perfect we have created successfully a Firebase account. Now we have to create a project. So you can create as many as project as you wanted. So create the project by clicking this add project. Give a name for the project something ang dash blog down here as you can see this will create a unique name for this project once you are done click this continue in the next step this will ask about to set up google analytics for our project um, for now we don't need that so untick this switch and click continue this will create our Firebase project. This may take several seconds and two minutes. So wait until this complete. Once it completed, you can see this continue button. Click on it. This will open the Firebase project dashboard. As I mentioned earlier, this Firebase is not limited to one service. This has so many features from app development to deployment. This has authentications, database, storage buckets, hosting, cloud functions, and so on. And also, we got some useful reporting tools like Crashlytics, performance trackers, analytic tools, machine learning, app testing tools, and so on. Lots of features are there. But in this course, we're gonna use some of these features to make our Angular blog live and dynamic. So we'll use the authentication for user login for our Angular app CMS or the backend dashboard. We'll use this Firestore database as our blog's database to store blog posts and other useful data. We are not gonna use this real-time database cause the Firestore is more advanced and easy to structure compared to this real-time database. Next we'll use storage to store post images. Yes of course we'll use the Firebase hosting to host our final blog app. The beauty of this is all of these features we're gonna use for free. So the important feature that we're gonna use in this course is this Firestore database. So what is this Firestore database? So Firestore is a cloud NoSQL document based database. This is different than the traditional table based database like SQL database. So in SQL database data is saved in a table but Firestore database save data in a documents. So what is a document? It is a group of key value pairs. For example, details of a user A the username is a user A, gender male and age is 30. You can see here this is the key and this is the value and this is a group of key value pair. So we call this group of key value pairs as a document. Group of these documents we called collection. In our example we have a group of user details documents. So collection of these users documents, we can call this as a users collection. Hope you guys got the idea, right? In a Firestore document, we can also have only one key value pair. There is no limitation for this. In another document, we can have different types of key value pairs. So we don't need to create every document same as this. So we can differentiate the key value pairs inside of a Firestore document. So in Firestore we can store string values, number values, boolean values, map coordinates, arrays, timestamps, geo point values, references and also we can store null values. So in Firestore how do we add relations? Think if a user has many hobbies, how do we add multiple hobbies in a document? In the SQL database, we have users in a separate database and we can store hobbies in another separate table by importing the user ID. We can connect each other tables. 
So by importing the user's ID, we can connect each other tables. In NoSQL database, also we can do the same. We have a user's collection. Every each document has its own unique IDs. And also we can add the hobbies collection and create a document for a hobby and we can import the user ID to connect each collection. But we can do this in a better way. In Firestore, we can create collections inside documents. So let's look at an example. Take this user A has two hobbies. One is reading books and the second one is watching movies. We can store this data by creating a hobbies collection inside this user collection. So hobbies collection and this hobbies collection has two hobbies. One is reading books and another one is watching movies. If the user B has three hobbies, we can save that again another hobbies collection for this user B document and inside this hobbies collection, three hobbies documents, one is traveling, one is sleeping and one is playing games. So if the user C doesn't have any hobbies, no problem, we can leave this empty. So this is the beauty of Firestore NoSQL database. So hope you guys got the idea. This is just a simple example. So you guys will get to know more about this while you continue this course. So in order to use this Firebase with our Angular app, we have to connect our Angular block to this Firebase. First we have to create an app because we need some credentials. For that we have to create a Firebase app. Please don't get confused. Previously we created this Firebase project. So now under that project we have to create an app. So to create a Firebase app, click on this web icon. Because we are creating a web app, so click on this. Give a name for the app, something ng-blog-app. In the later section, we'll use Firebase hosting to deploy our app, but now no need to set up that. So leave this untick. Now click this register app. Now here we can see our app credentials. We don't need all of these code. We need only in this object API key to app ID. So copy it. Now go to the blocks dashboard VS code. Open the environment.prod.ts file. Inside this environment object, create another object something Firebase config colon and the object scope. Inside this object, paste the copied Firebase credentials. API key to app ID. Perfect. Now we have all the credentials to connect our Angular app to Firebase. Now let's see how to connect with the Firebase using these credentials. For this, we're gonna use an npm package, which is the Angular Fire npm package. This is the official Angular library for Firebase. So let's add this library to our Angular app. So we can add this using the npm and also with the ng command, which is Angular CLI. So I'm gonna add this using the Angular CLI method. So inside the integrated terminal, please note this, throughout this section will work only this Angular dashboard app, not in the Angular blog apps frontend. So add this inside the blog app dashboard. So perfect. So inside the integrated terminal type this command ng add at angular slash fire and hit enter. So this will install the angular fire npm package inside our angular app. This may take several seconds to minutes. Please wait until this complete. Once it's done, this will ask to log in to our Firebase account. For now, we don't need this, so cancel this operation by pressing Ctrl C. So that's it. So we have successfully installed the Angular Fire on our Angular block. Now let's see how to import the Angular Fire to our Angular app and connect 
with the fire base. So first thing first we have to import the angular fire module into this angular app. So go to the app module ts file. As you know this is our angular apps main module. We will declare all the module imports here. Then on angular nodes we using that module with our angular app. So the top of the page add the import statement import inside curly brackets angular fire module so please follow these capital simple letters carefully Fr after this from this is coming from the angular fire so inside quotes at angular slash fire perfect we successfully added the import statement now let's connect this with the firebase so inside the import array add this angular fire module which is this imported module from angular fire so after this dot initialize app this a is capital after this parenthesis this is required the firebase config object which is we created in the environment file so in here we exporting this environment object so we can import that to this app module file and pass that to this angular fire module parenthesis as a parameter so first let's import the environment object so add this import statement import inside curly brackets the exporting object name is environment all simple letters after this from the path for this environment file so inside codes this is inside the src folder environments and the file name is environment.prod if you notice we added this firebase credentials inside this environment.prod.ts file not inside this environment.ts file so carefully import the correct file all right we successfully imported the environment object now pass this firebase config object to this so inside this parenthesis this is this is inside this main object which is this imported environment object so environment dot firebase config perfect so save this all check the command line we got no errors which means we successfully connected our angular app to firebase perfect before the end of this video one more thing guys with this angular fire module we initializing our app with firebase but in order to work with firebase features we have to import them one by one to our angular app for example we're gonna use the firestore database with our angular app so in order to work with firestore we have to import that so let's see how to do that angular fire is coming with all of these features as separate modules so in order to work with them we have to import them so now we are dealing with the firestore so the angular fire module name is angular firestore module so import inside curly brackets the module name is angular firestore module please carefully follow these capital simple letters so after this import this is coming from at angular slash fire slash firestore so now add this inside the import array in order to identify this as an imported module. So after this comma and the module name is angular firestore module. No need to pass any parenthesis. So that's it. Now with this our angular app knows that we are using the firebase firestore with our project. So like this we can import the firestore features one by one. For now we are dealing only with the firestore so no need to import other modules. Alright guys this is it for this section, in this section we generated a new angular app for our blog apps backend, we planned the components, we imported the bootstrap, global styles and we designed all the main components, header, footer and the dashboard. And also we learned all about firestore and firebase, at last we learned how to connect our angular app to firebase using an angular model called angular fire. In this section you learned about firebase which is totally different than angular some of you may be new to firebase you may not get this at the first shot so don't worry continue to the next lesson while we're working on the next sections you will understand 
this in detail as always if you guys have any questions you know how to reach me right ask the question in the q a area i will always be there for you all right if you can remember in the previous section we learned about firebase cloud firestore and we learned how to connect our angular app to firebase using the angular fire npm package so this section will be going to the next part of the previous section so in this section we're gonna learn about how to perform crud operation which is create read update delete operations to the firestore database so in this section we'll look at how to create a new record for categories in cloud firestore how to read cloud firestore data and load them inside our angular app how to update an existing data and at last we'll learn how to delete an existing firestore data so we'll do all these operations based on post categories so let's get started as i mentioned in the intro video in this section we look at how to perform save update delete and read data from cloud firestore using the categories so let's see how to do that first thing first we need a category component to manage post categories so let's generate the categories component inside the integrated terminal ng g c will generate this inside the same root app component so we don't need to add any folder needs just simply add the component name categories and hit enter this will generate the categories component inside the app folder perfect now we have the component but in order to see this categories component inside the browser we have to add this component selector inside the app component or we have to define a router for this if you can remember in the previous section we designed this dashboard and this menu card for the category so now what i want to do is i want to open the category component when clicking this category menu card so for this we can use the angular router let's see how to do that very simple open the app routing module ts file as you know this is the file where we declare our all routing navigations for this angular application in the routing and navigation section we learned about this in detail hope you guys remember this so inside this routes array we can define our routers so first let's define the root router inside this array create an object scope we pass routers as an object for this router array the first key value pair is path colon set this to an empty path string now i am declaring the router to the main root path that's why i set this to an empty string hope you guys remember this after this comma and the second key value pair is component colon the value is set this to the dashboard component because i want to show the dashboard component in the root router select this auto complete this will import the dashboard component module to this router module all right next let's define the router for the categories so after this comma again another object first key value pair is path and colon this time the path is categories so put this inside quotes for this previous router i set this as an empty string because this represents the main router or the url of our angular blog in a, in our case which is this local lost colon 4300 url hope you guys got this so the component is for this categories router which is this newly generated categories component select this auto complete this will import this inside the router module perfect we successfully created the basic routers for the categories save this and back to the browser at the base or the main url we got this dashboard component but if i navigate to the categories router nothing got changed till i got the same dashboard component 
according to our routers at this categories router we should get the categories components view inside the browser but we got the same dashboard view why is that can you guys guess if you look at our main component which is the app component html file inside this we added this dashboard selector directly to this component that why we are getting this dashboard component view inside this main url this is not loaded using the router so in order to load the router component inside the browser we have to add the router outlet here hope you guys remember this we learned this right so remove this dashboard component selector and add the router outlet directive here once again this route outlet will open the relevant component according to the router perfect now save this and back to the browser at the base url we got the dashboard navigate to the categories as you can see here this time we got this categories work text here which means this is loaded the category component inside the browser beautiful so this is not done yet now what i want to do is i want to navigate to the categories router when clicking this category dashboard menu card how do we do that can you guys remember for this we have another directive called router link we learned about this right so let's do this i want to navigate to the router when clicking this category card so inside this card div add this router link this l must be capital equal sign inside quotes pass the router which is this categories pass this with the slash symbol that's it save this and back to the browser now click on this category card as you can see here this navigate to the categories router perfect before the end of this video let's do another small thing I want to change this card cursor to a pointer or the hand cursor when hovering this card. So go to the dashboard CSS file. Inside this card selector, add this cursor pointer. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. Looks perfect. So now let's design the new categories form. In order to save a category inside the Firestore, we need a form to add the user inputs for categories. So let's design the new categories form. This form is just a simple form with one single input. So no need to separate component for this. We'll add this form inside this same categories component. So inside the categories component HTML file, add these markups. First create a bootstrap container div, inside this create a bootstrap row div, inside this row create a full width bootstrap column which is called dash md dash 12. Now inside this add an h3 tag with a bootstrap text dash center class. The text will be nav categories. After this, a p tag with these bootstrap classes, text dash center and mb dash file. The p text will be you can add new categories from here. Perfect. Next, let's design the form. So, create a form tag with these bootstrap classes form dash inline and text dash center now inside this create a div with these classes form dash group called dash md dash 10 perfect now inside this create an input tag with these classes form dash control and shadow dash effect after this don't forget to set the placeholder add new categories after this div, create another div with this bootstrap column class called dash md dash 2. Inside this, create a button tag and set these classes btn, btn dash blog, btn dash info, mb dash 2. And button text will be add category. 
all right this is it for the markup so save this and back to the browser mm, this is how looks this form with the default bootstrap styles so let's make this little looks better by adding some custom CSS styles for this we don't have to write anything new we'll use same global style classes for this so first let's make this area background color to the secondary color for this we have created this global style class let's add that to this column bg dash theme dash secondary after this add p dash 5 bootstrap utility class to add inner padding to this div at last add the shadow dash effect class to this as well perfect save this and back to the browser looks perfect now let's make this button looks better for this we'll use this btn dash theme global css class so add this class to this button btn dash theme perfect save this and back to the browser look at these guys looks beautiful isn't it and one last thing set this heading to the primary text color for this also we declared a global style which is this text dash theme dash primary css class and this to this h3 tag now save this and back to the browser looks perfect all right in the previous lecture we designed this beautiful form for inserting categories to the firestore this is still just a static form this form is still not functional so in order to make this form functional we have two methods in angular can you guys remember this yes of course in angular we have two approaches to handle forms one is template driven forms approach and the second one is reactive forms approach so for this save category form we'll let's use the template driven form approach cause this form is just a simple one input form with simple validations we are not doing anything complex so no need to go for the reactive form approach just use the template driven forms so let's transfer this simple static html form as an angular template driven form hope you guys remember this we learned about this also in detail in the angular forms section if any of you cannot remember this please go back to the angular forms section and learn it again all right in order to work with angular template driven form first thing first we have to import the angular forms module to our angular app so as you know we import all the modules in angular modules file so open it inside this import the angular forms module first add the import statement import inside curly brackets the module name is forms module this f and m must be capital after this from inside double quotes this is coming from add angular slash forms after this don't forget to add this inside the imports array forms module perfect we successfully imported the forms module now let's make this form as an angular template driven form for this first we have to add the ng form directive to this form very simple just simply create a template variable if you guys remember we create template variables in angular using the hash symbol right so hash symbol and your variable name this name can be any name I just named this variable as a category form next assign all the equal symbol inside quotes assign this to the ng form directive perfect we successfully made this form as an angular form next we have to turn this input into the angular template driven forms input for this we will use another directive ng model directive 
So inside this input tag, add the ng model directive. Ng model. This is not done yet. If you guys can remember, in order to work with ng model directive, we must add the name attribute to this input field. So name. This input field name is something category. That's it. So guys, I'm not going to actually explain all the technical parts for these directives and all because we learned all about this in detail in the angular forms section if any of you missed that section or forget about this please go through that section again and continue this section hope you guys understand this save this and back to the browser we got no errors in compile time and in this runtime which means everything working as we planned. Alright, so guys, I have a small task for you. Now we have created the template driven form. Now I want to capture this input's value and store it inside of an object called something category data. So this is the task for you guys. You guys are gonna do this for me. Very simple, just capture this input's value and assign it to the category data object. We did this when we learning template driven forms. So guys, try to do this your own. Once you have done it, continue with the next lecture. Alright, hope you guys did the task well. If any of you missed the task to do it your own self, it's okay, no problem. Continue the task with me. So in order to capture the value of this input, first thing first, we have to submit this form. So for this, if you guys can remember, we used another directive called ng submit. So inside this form tag, inside brackets, ng submit equal sign. When we submit this form, let's call a method something called on submit and this is a method so don't forget to add the parenthesis so with this parenthesis i will pass this ng form as a parameter let's do that so we assign this ng form to this template variable so now we can pass the template variable in here so the template variable name is category form keep this in your mind when we declaring a template variable, we use this as symbol. But when we using the template variable, we don't use this as symbol. Just simply use the template variable name like this. Alright, we successfully created this form submit. As you can see here, we got a compile error because we still don't have this method in our Angular app. So let's create that. As you know, in Angular, we do all the logical stuff inside the component is file. So open the category component file and let's create the on submit method. After this ng on edit lifecycle method, let's create the on submit method. On submit, this s is capital and the parentheses and don't forget to add the method scope. Perfect. We are getting a compile error. Why is that? Yes, of course, we are sending a parameter value from here, but we are not capturing the value with this on submit method. So let's capture that. So inside this parenthesis, create a parameter variable something form data. This can be any name. I just use this with this. We are getting the category form data. Hope you guys got the idea, right? Okay, inside this method, let's just log this parameter variable and see what we are getting with this. Save this all and back to the browser. Fill this category form and hit the submit button. Inside the console, we got this angular form group. Hope you guys remember this. We learned about this angular form group in detail in the template driven form section. So inside this, we got lots of details, but for now, we only need this value object. Inside this, as you can see here, we got the typed category value. So in order to get this value, we have to access this value object. Very simple. After this, just simply add this dot value. 
Now we can save this and back to the browser. This time we got only this value object. Perfect. So now we have the value. Now let's assign this to an object called category data. If you can remember, this is our task, right? So let's see this in action. First, let's create the object. Let object name is category data assign create an object open and close the curly brackets inside this the key is category and the value is this parameter dot value dot category this category is this value object key that's it now let's log this category data object so this all and back to the browser we got the value of the input as this object perfect right all right now we have the category value now what i want to do is i want to save this category inside the cloud firestore this section is all about how to perform crud operations to cloud firestore right so let's begin when I giving the introduction about the Firestore database, I said that this Cloud Firestore is a cloud based, no SQL document based database. And I gave a small explanation about what is this document based database. Hope you guys remember that. So in Firestore, we have data as a document. So instead of a document, we save key value pairs like the JavaScript objects like this. This object has only one key value pair, which is this category. The Firestore document also looks like this object. So we pass a JavaScript object to Firestore as data when we're saving data inside the Firestore database. So that's why I prepared this category forms a value as an object. All right. Now in this lecture, let's see how to pass this categories data object to Firestore and save this inside of a categories collection so in order to use firestore first thing first we have to activate the firestore in firebase console so go to the firebase and go to this firestore tab in here click on this button now select this test mode because we're going to use this firestore in test mode not in the production mode in the next window select the data center you can select a data center which is near to your visitors location i will keep this as a default that's it click this button this will configure and create our firestore database perfect all right now we have the firestore database next we have to import or tell our angular app that we're going to use angular firestore as our database if you can remember we did this in the previous lecture for this we used a package called angular fire we import that to our project and we connected our firebase project to our angular app using this angular fire module after this we imported the angular firestore module which also coming from this angular fire package with this we are telling our angular app to that we are using angular firestore database with our angular app all right so guys, in order to work with Cloud Firestore, we must import this Angular Firestore module to our Angular app. Otherwise, our Angular app will break and lead us to unnecessary bugs. Hope you guys got the idea. So next, go to the categories component .es file. From here, we have to pass this value object to the Firestore to save this inside the Firestore database. For this, we're going to use a service called Angular Firestore, which also comes from this Angular Firestore module. So first let's import this service to this category component import inside curly brackets angular firestore this a and f is capital letters please follow these capital simple letters carefully so this is coming from at angular slash fire slash firestore perfect as i mentioned before this angular firestore is a service so in order to use a service in angular we have to inject that service to the constructor right we learned about this okay so let's inject this to the constructor private and a variable name something afs this stand for angular firestore okay 
this can be any name this is just a variable name so after this colon and this service angular firestore perfect we successfully injected the service to this constructor which means now we can use this inside this component without any restrictions we almost done guys now let's see how to save the data inside the firestore using this angular firestore service so i want to save this category when submitting this new category form so inside this on submit method after this we have to access this injected angular firestore service so this dot afs after this we have to mention the name of the collection if you can remember firestore is saving the data inside the firestore database as a document and document saved inside of a document collection in other words we can say a list of documents as a collection right so in order to save a document inside of firestore first we have to define a collection so hope you guys got the idea so after this dot collection and parenthesis inside this pass the collection name as a string inside codes the collection name is something we are trying to save a category document right so we'll call this collection as a categories a plural word list of category documents categories collection right don't forget to pass this inside of codes perfect next we are doing this save or the add data to the file store right so next we have to pass the operation which is add so dot add and the parenthesis this add method is required the data document which we want to save inside the file store which is this category data object so pass this inside this as a parameter for this add method that's it guys this is the query for saving data very simple and clean right so the query is done but we have another small work which we have to handle the callback because this return a promise so let's see this in action nothing much simply add the dot then method after this this return the document reference that we saved inside the file store database so inside this arrow function the parameter variable name is something doc ref I named this like this cause this is returning a reference of the document that we saved inside the firestore database this can be any name okay after this callback function inside this for now just log this doc ref after this we can catch the errors so after this then dot catch and the arrow function error and the function inside this function let's log the error that's it save this and back to the browser type a category something angular hit this add category submit button open this browser console inside this we got this document reference object printed here expand this don't get afraid we are not gonna use any of these values we'll work on only with this id so expand this in here we got the id of our newly created category document so we got this id which means we successfully saved our firestore category data document inside the firestore so let's confirm this go to the firestore database in here still we got nothing reload this page look at this guys we got our categories collection inside this we got this id click on this we got our document category and angular key value pair if you can remember we type this inside this input right so congratulations guys we successfully added our first data inside of the firestore database perfect
So guys, in the previous lecture, we saved our first record inside the file store database. So as you can see here, this first data saved inside of the main parent collection called categories. As I mentioned earlier, in order to save data inside of a file store, we have to tell this query where to save this data, which is this categories collection. Without this, we cannot save a document or the data inside the file store. So go back to the categories browser view and save another category, something HTML. Click on this button. This will save this inside the file store. Perfect. We got this callback document reference inside the console, which means this saved successfully inside the cloud file store. So go to the Firebase console inside this file store database. As you can see here, this time we got two documents open this so this is the new category that we saved html as you can see here this also saved inside of this same categories collection in case if we want to save data inside of another collection very simple all we have to do is just change this collection name to something different name categories one save this and back to the browser save something Back to the Firestore console, in here, as you can see here, we got this NIV collection. Inside this, we got this category document. So guys, this is how we create collections and save data documents inside of Cloud Firestore database. The next thing about this Firestore is, in every document that we save inside the Firestore database, we will get this auto-generated unique ID. So we use this ID to retrieve or identify a document inside of a Firestore collection. This will be auto-generated by Firestore. In case if you don't like this ID, you can set your own ID for these documents. Next, I want to show you another thing which is this document structure of a cloud Firestore document. The beauty of this is there is no structure for this. Think that we want to add another key value pair for this document, something status. We can add that to this object status. And if value is something active, put this inside of quotes. Save this and back to the browser. Save new category, something bootstrap. Inside the Firestore console, we got this new document with these two key value pairs, status and the category. If we look at the documents that we saved previously, all of these documents not included this status. But this is not an issue in Cloud Firestore. If any of you know about SQL database, we cannot do this. We have exactly passed all the data same as the SQL table. Otherwise, data will not save inside the SQL database. We cannot save different data like these documents. This is one of the beauties of Cloud Firestore. Some of you may not get this if you don't know about SQL databases. So don't worry if you don't get it, leave it. You will get used to this while we're completing this course. Alright, before the end of this video, I want to show you another awesome feature of Cloud Firestore, which is in Firestore, we can store collections inside of documents. As I said earlier, this is the collection and inside that we have the list of categories, documents, right? In case if you want to add a sub collection, we can add that inside this documents. For example, think there are subcategories for each of these main categories. How do we save that inside the Firestore? Very simple. We can create a sub collection inside this categories document and add the sub categories documents inside that subcategories collection. Inside this Firestore console, we can create collections and documents manually. So now I want to create a subcategory collection inside this Angular category document. So click on this start collection. In here, give the collection ID or the collection name. This collection for subcategories. So give the collection name subcategories. Use all simple letters. Perfect. After this, click on this next button. Now with this prompt, we can create 
the subcategories document inside the subcategories collection. With this document ID field, we can create the ID for the document. You can remember, as I said earlier, Firestore will automatically generate a unique ID for a document. If we click this auto ID, this will automatically generate the ID for us. In case if you want to add something custom ID, you can provide that here. So we'll use the auto generated ID. So down here with this, we can create the documents key value pairs. For this, we'll create only one key value pair for subcategory. So we can provide the key with this field. The field or the key is subcategory. Next, we can give the type of this field for a Firestore document field or for a key value pair, we can set one of these data types such as string values, number values, boolean, map, array, null, timestamp, geo points and references. So for this field, we're going to use the string value. So select this string value. Perfect. Um, next, we can give the value with this. So for this, let's add the subcategory name, something subcategory one. That's it. In case if you want to add another value for this document, we can use this add field and we can remove unwanted fields with this remove icon. Perfect. We can save the document using this save button. Awesome, right? As you can see here, we have successfully created the sub collection inside of this category document. So inside the subcategory collection, we got the subcategory one document. Inside this, we can save as many as subcategories. And also guys, inside of this document, we can create as many as sub collections. If you need another sub collection, we can create that using this same add collection. The process is same as previous. If you notice inside the sub collections document also got this start collection. What is this? Yes, of course, in case if you want to add another sub collection, we can add that here. Likewise, we can next collections inside sub collections as well. Perfect. Don't think this too much. This is for pro developers. We can almost do everything with one main collection and with one layer of sub collections. So don't think about this too much. So while you're getting experience by creating advanced apps, you will get used to this. So in the previous, we learned about nesting collection in documents and we save a new collection inside of the main category document, right? For this, we use the Firebase console UI. But in this lecture, let's see how to do this programmatically. So first thing first, we need a subcategory object or the document to save inside the Firestore. So for this, we'll create an object like this main category. So duplicate this and change the object name to subcategory data and also change this key value pair subcategory. So this time we no need to set up any form for this just encode a subcategory name something subcategory one. Awesome. We now have the object. Let's see how to save this inside the Firestore. With this, we are saving the main category inside the main categories collection. I want to save this second subcategory inside the main category that, that we saved. In order to save the sub collection inside of the document, we need the document ID. If you can remember, this document ref is included the document ID, right? Um, wait, I'll show you this again. Back to the browser, save a new category. Inside the browser console, we got this document ref. And inside this, we got this ID, which is this newly created categories document ID. So let's see how to save the subcategory document inside of main category document. Very simple. It's also same like this. So inside this promise callback, after this log, this dot AFS, which is this Angular Firestore service dot 
collection the main collection name is categories after this this time we are not inserting this inside this main categories collection so we're gonna insert this inside the document that we inserting with this first query so after this we have to access the document so doc inside parentheses we have to pass this category documents id we capture the collection with the collection name but we access the document with the document id so we have to pass the id here as you know we are getting this newly inserting document id with this document ref callback so this docref dot id pass this inside this doc parenthesis perfect after this dot collection because again we're gonna save this inside the subcategories collection so this collection name is subcategories after this we're gonna insert the subcategory data object so dot and inside this parenthesis pass the object name subcategories data that's it as usual at the promise callback this also same as this dot then this time we are getting another docref so name this something docref1 and the callback function inside this for now just simply log this second docref that's it save this all and back to the browser save a new main category something firebase click this button perfect we got this document ref log here which means our data saved successfully inside the firestore just check this in the firestore console look at this this is our newly created document firebase as you can see here inside this we got this subcategory sub collection inside this we got this document perfect so guys this is how we insert sub collection data documents in the firestore in any case, if you want to add another sub collection, we can simply expand this query same like this. Wait, I'll show you this. Inside this second callback, as usual, first we have to access the Angular Firestore service, which is AFS. So this dot AFS dot the main level collection. So dot collection and the collection name is categories. Next, the document, which is the first level document ref id, document ref dot id. After this, again, the second level sub collection, so dot again collection, and the collection name is subcategories. Next, again, the subcategory document, and the id is the second doc ref dot id. After this, the third level collection, and the collection name is something sub sub categories as you know this is just the sub collection name you can add any name that you want so after this add because we're gonna add the data inside this second level collection and uh, let's pass the same sub category object as a document for this second sub categories collection that's it for the query we have to do one more thing which is this callback function dot then and this is the third callback document reference so name it something like docref2 and the callback function perfect inside this let's log something second level subcategory saved successfully that's it save this and back to the browser go to the app simply add another category something um, i'm running out of options let's name this javascript save this by clicking this button perfect we got this log which means data saved successfully go back to the firestore console find out the new document that we saved here it is javascript inside this we got the subcategories collection inside this we got the subcategory document open it inside that we got this the second level collection sub subcategories inside that we got this document beautiful right so guys if you look at this carefully we can find a pattern for sub collection which the first in order to create a sub collection we must have the first main collection so this is the main collection inside that we got the document inside that again sub collection 
inside that sub collection document inside that again the second level sub collection and the document so collection document collection document and so on so this is how this query works so guys in this course we don't go deep collection nestings like this i just wanted to show you how this works sometimes you may need this for your applications in the future who knows right So in the previous lecture, we learned how to save sub-level collections in Cloud Firestore. If you look at this query, we are almost repeating this doc and collections several times. This looks kind of noisy, right? For this, we have a solution. So let's see this in action. We can sort this using the Firestore path URLs. You guys may wonder what is this? This is just a path for a particular Firestore document. Inside the Firestore console, click on this main categories collection. Look at this top. We got this categories collection name. Click on this pencil icon. We can see this collection name. Now click on this document. As you can see here, now we got this categories document ID. Now click on this sub collection. We got that here. So this is the path URL for the Firestore. This path is represent this sub collection. If I click the sub categories document, this is giving me this sub collection with this path URL. So this is also like our query. First the main collection, then the document, then again sub collection and the sub category document ID. Hope you guys got the idea. So what we can do is we can simply use this path URL to simplify this query. So let's see this in action. Very simple. All we have to do is um, I'll add this code before this. So you, you guys can see this and compare these two codes and understand what is the difference, right? So as always, in order to connect to Firestore, we have to use the Angular Firestore service this dot afs this time we're going to use another method called doc so dot doc inside this parenthesis we have to pass the path url of the where we want to save the data so we have to pass this as a string between these we have to add the id variables so for this we'll use the template string so we'll add this inside of backticks instead of quotes. So first look at this previous query. We have to pass the collection name. So the collection name is categories. After this slash, now we have to pass the first level subcategories document ID. So if you can remember, we can access the Firestore document using the document ID, right? So let's pass the category collections id that we inserting with this main query so let's pass this as a template string dollar sign open and close the curly brackets inside this pass the id which is this first level document ref dot id perfect next we have to go inside another level of sub collection which is this sub categories next the sub category document id that inserts with this second query. Again, template string. Inside this, the ID is docref1.id. Next, we're gonna insert this document inside this subcategories collection. So now we have to pass this same as this. So dot collection, inside parentheses, the collection name, sub subcategories after this dot add and we have to pass the data inside this and the callback function like this i'm not gonna add the callback function so guys look at this this code is rather simple and less noisy than the previous collection came and stacked query so one more thing some of you may wonder that why we add this last collection like this we can add that to this path URL like this previous collections. 
yes you are not wrong but guys in order to save data inside the firestore we have to access this add method which is only in this collection method where i'll show you i duplicate this and remove this collection and i'll try to add the add method after this second subcategory document add this slash and the second level collection is sub subcategories now we have to access the add method so dot add look at this we are getting a compile error saying that this add property does not exist in angular firestore so this is why we added this with the collection method so when we using this path url method we have to add the last collection that we inserting the data like this so hope you guys got the idea so let's see how to make this second subcategory query like this path url query very simple this dot afs dot doc inside this backticks and the first level collection is categories slash now pass the category document id as a template string after this guys can we add the subcategory collection here yes we can but we are inserting the sub collection document inside this subcategories collection so in order to access the add method we have to add this as a separate collection method so dot collection inside this parenthesis the sub collection name is sub categories we have to pass this as a string right after this all the codes same as this dot add and the data pass this inside the add methods parenthesis after this the callback function hope you guys got the idea so now let's see how to make this first level query like the path url query but can we do that this is the main category document that we inserting into firestore so in order to access the add method we must have to use this collection method we cannot access that with the doc method so for this first level collection we cannot use the path url method so we have to use this same as this for the first level query this looks okay right we are getting a big link of noisy code when we stacking sub collections so here after in this course we'll use this path url method only when we need it perfect All right. So until now we learned how to save a category document inside of the Firestore database. Hope you guys learn it well. In case if you missed anything, watch the previous lectures again and again until you get the idea. Still, if you don't understand anything, please leave a message. I will be always there for you. Perfect. Now in this lecture, let's do the form validation. As you know, doing the form validation can prevent sending or saving invalid or empty data inside of the database. I'll show you an example. Click this add category button without filling this form. Look at this. We got this document reference which means data saved inside the database. Go to the Firestore console. In here we can see this empty category document. So guys, saving empty data like this is not a good practice. So in order to prevent this, we can do a simple form validation at the client side. So let's see this in action. If you can remember for this category form, we use the template driven form approach. So let's validate this using the same template driven approach. So first we have to create a template variable and assign it to this ng model. As you know, with this ng model, we are creating the new instance of the form control class, right? So in order to access the form control class new instance, we have to assign that to a template variable. So create a template variable, something new category. After this, assign and this ng model. Put this inside quotes. Next we have to tell this input which validation we are going to do. 
for this we are gonna do the required validation so we have to add the required HTML5 validation attribute to this input that's it validation is done next we have to display the error message so after this input inside this same form group div create another div with these bootstrap classes alert and alert dash danger after this inside this div opening tag add the condition ng if equal sign inside quotes add the condition the template variable name which is this new category dot touched after this end operator again new category dot invalid so with this condition we are checking that if the user is touch this input and this input is invalid if these two conditions are true this will show this alert div inside the browser so we learned all about this in detail right so next add the error message category field is required perfect mm, we are not done yet now let's add an error style to this input so let's do that for as you know we can use the ng class directive for this so inside this input add the ng class directive open and close the square bracket inside this ng class the c is capital after this equal sign inside double quotes pass the condition first we have to pass the css class name for this we're going to use the bootstrap is dash invalid class so pass this inside single quotes after this colon and the condition is same as this so copy and paste it here that's it so don't forget to put this inside of curly brackets so now save this and back to the browser click this input and click outside as you can see here we got this error message and this red border on the input field now type something the error message is disappeared perfect the error message is okay but still if I click this button, this form will submit and save the empty data inside the cloud Firestore. In order to prevent this, we have to disable this submit button. So let's see that in action. So back to the VS code and simply add this property binding to this button. So inside this button, add this square brackets, inside this the property that I want to add to this field which is disabled after this equal sign and the condition this time I want to disable this button when this total form is invalid so this form template variable which is this after this dot invalid that's it save this and back to the browser look at this awesome right now this add category button is disabled we cannot click this button fill this form now this button is enabled cause this form is now errorless which means this form is now valid again empty this input field now this button is disabled so now we cannot send empty invalid data to the firestore database perfect So in the previous, we added this data inserting Firestore query inside this same component TS file. This is okay, but as a good practice, we'll put all the queries inside of an Angular service. So in this lecture, let's see how to do this. Very simple, we learned about this in detail when we learning Angular services. So let's see this in action. First, we need a service so we can generate that using the Angular CLI like components. So inside the integrated terminal, run this command. ng g. This time we're gonna generate a service. So service after this path and the service file name. Mm, I'll put all service files inside of services folder. So services slash the service name is categories. That's it. Hit the enter to execute this command. Perfect, we got our first service generated. 
inside this we got two files we are not gonna deal with this testing file and this generated for unit testing will work only with this categories.service.ts file so we don't need this testing file so remove it throughout this course will work only with this services file so open this categories.service.ts file inside this first let's create a method for saving data so after this constructor the method name is save data this d is capital this is just a method name you can use any name that you want okay so after this parenthesis and the method scope perfect now inside this we have to add the insert query we already did that right so copy this from the category component ts file and paste it here so for categories we don't need the sub collections i did this to show you how to do the sub collection inserting with the firestore query so remove the sub collection queries and keep this first level query and the callback function perfect if you look at this we are getting a compile error cause we don't import the angular firestore service to this service so copy and paste the import statement from the component is file now again we have to inject this to this service constructor copy this from the component is file and paste it here that's it angular service is ready now back to the categories component is file now we don't need these imports and this dependency injection so remove them we don't need this query as well so inside this on submit method um, i just comment and keep this for your references so perfect now what we have to do is when this form is submitted we are calling this on submit method so inside this we are creating this category data object to send to the firestore database now query is inside this service file so in order to save the data we have to access this service file so how do we do that you guys already learned this right in order to access this service we have to import that to this component is file and inject this service to the constructor so let's do that nothing fancy simply just add the injection so inside this constructor parenthesis private category service colon as you know this is just a variable name okay next the service class name which is this category service select this auto completion this will automatically import this to this component in any case if you don't see this auto complete please add this import statement manually otherwise your app can break perfect so now we imported the service now let's see how to access this save data method um, before that if any of you may notice this we are getting another compile error inside this service file what is that because this variable is not declared in this service this is inside this category component ts file so in order to get this from component to ts file we have to send that as a parameter for this save data method so add this data parameter variable and change this to something data now we don't have any compile errors perfect okay back to the work now we have to access this save data method from the component file so inside this we already have the category service injected here so this category is service dot as you can see here we can see this save data method so click on this this will add this here we are getting a compile error because this method required the data parameter so pass it so this object name is category data perfect so save this all and back to the browser save a new category we got this document ref log inside the browser console Go to the first console in here we can find our new category saved from service file perfect right 
Now this is more cleaner and well organized than the previous, right? Perfect. In this lecture, let's see how to define an interface for this category data object. As you know, this interface is simply a blueprint for an object. We can define a shape of an object using this interface, right? We learned about this. Hope you guys remember. So let's see this in action. First, let's generate an interface using the Angular CLI. So inside the integrated terminal, run this command ngg. This time we're going to generate an interface. So interface as usual after this, the path and the interface name. As a good practice, I'm going to put all the interfaces inside of a folder called models. So models slash the interface name is category. So usually we use the interface name singular and the service name plural. Like this, I named this service categories and this interface category. Hope you guys got the idea, right? Hit the enter to execute this command. Perfect Angular CLI generated the interface for us. Inside this models folder, we got this TS file. Open it. So this is the interface that we created for category object. So inside this interface, we can define the shape of this category data object. Um, for this, we got only this category field. So let's add that category and this type will be string. That's it. So we send back to the category component TS file. We created the interface. Now let's use the interface. So here inside this on submit, validate this category data object using the category interface. If you can remember, this is very simple. After this, just add colon and the interface name category. Click this auto suggestion. This will import the interface to this component. So nothing fancy, just a simple import. We learned about this in detail. Hope you guys remember this. So now this object is must same as this interface. If I add another key value pair for this, something or status, and inside codes pass a status something active. Look at this. We are getting a compile error that saying status does not exist in category object literal. Why do we getting this error? Can you guys tell me? Yes, of course. In the interface, we only define this category key. So if we add something apart from this, this will throw an error at the compile time. So with this interface, we can add an extra layer of data validation for this insert data to prevent invalid data inserting. Hope you guys got the idea. Alright, in this lecture, let's set up a success message for this inserting data. Now we get to know if this data is saved inside the Firestore or not with this document ref log inside the browser console. This is okay cause now we are in development mode. But after we launching this blog in production, at that time, it's not a good user experience to showing console log for success messages. As a solution for this, in this lecture, we're gonna show a beautiful toaster message notification using an NPM package called ngx toaster. Perfect, let's see this in action. So guys, in order to use this ngx toaster package, we have to install it first. So inside the integrated terminal, run this command npm i ngx dash toaster. Carefully follow this capital simple letters. Hit enter to execute this command. Perfect, we successfully installed the package inside our app. So now let's see how to use this ngx toaster with our angular blog apps dashboard. So first thing first, we have to import the toaster CSS style file. So open our global style, which is this style.css file. Inside this, add this import. Add import, inside codes, the metal day symbol, ngx dash toaster slash toaster. So this metal day symbol represents the node modules folder. Hope you guys remember this. Perfect. Next, we have to import the toaster module inside the app module. So in, inside this app module.js file, add 
the import statement import inside curly brackets toaster module once again carefully follow this capital simple letters from ngx toaster now inside this import array add this toaster module and in order to initialize this we have to call a method dot for root and don't forget to add the parentheses that's it so we successfully installed and imported the toaster module to our angular app so now let's see how to show the toaster message if you can remember we added our insert query inside the category service file so open it inside this callback we show the toaster message in order to use ngx toaster first we have to import the toaster service to this category service so import inside curly brackets toaster service from ngx toaster so this is a service so to access this we have to inject this to the constructor so inside the constructor add this private toaster colon toaster service perfect now go to the insert query callback and add this so this dot toaster dot success because we're going to show the toaster message when this successfully save the data inside the cloud firestore this success method required a message parameter so pass it data insert successfully pass this as a string perfect that's it save this all and go to the browser save a new category mm, we are getting an error here why is that um, oh i did a mistake in order to work this toaster message we have to install another module which is this browser animation module so let's install it Simply copy this from here and paste it inside the integrated terminal. Hit enter to execute this command. Perfect. So after this we have to import this. So copy the import statement and back to the VS code. Inside the app model TS file paste the import statement. After this don't forget to add this inside the import array. Browser animation module. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. Perfect. As you can see here, we got this beautiful success toaster message, which means our data stored inside the Firestore successfully. Perfect. So guys, this is how we set up and run a toaster message in Angular. So guys, we successfully completed inserting or the creating categories on Cloud Firestore. Now in this lecture, let's see how to load or the read data from Firestore database. So let's see this in action. First, we'll do the query. After that, we'll show the loaded data inside of an HTML table in the browser view. So as I said earlier, we'll do all the database stuff inside of an Angular service for an organized code structure. So open the category service file. Inside this, first thing first, let's create a method for this. So after this save data method, the method name is something load data. After this parentheses and the method scope. Inside this method scope, let's do the load data query. This query is a bit confusing, but don't think too much about it. Just follow these steps with me. So in order to do a query to Firestore, we have to access the Angular Firestore service. We already have this. So this dot AFS dot as usual. First thing first, we have to mention the collection name. So collection inside parentheses, pass the collection name categories, pass this as a string. Perfect. Next to get data from Firestore, we have a special method called snapshot changes so after this dot snapshot changes the c must be capital this is a method so don't forget to add the parentheses 
So guys, this is the query to get all the data from this categories collection. Next, we have to do something to capture the returning data from this method. So let's see this in action. After this, dot pipe and parentheses inside this map and parentheses we are getting a compile error in order to use this map operator we have to import this to this service so import inside curly brackets map and this is coming from rxjs slash operators so now inside this parentheses add a callback function so function name is something actions as you know this is just a variable name you can use any name for this i use these actions as a standard for this query okay after this the arrow function and the function scope inside this we have to map again this callback actions so actions dot map and parentheses inside this is another callback function an arrow function and the method scope so inside this add this const data assign a dot payload dot doc dot data and parentheses after this const id assign a dot payload dot doc dot id so guys that's it for the query you guys may wonder what is this pipe and this map methods. This is also one of the operator methods in the reactive program or the RxJS. If you can remember, we learned observable, right? Observable also coming with this RxJS. Hope you guys remember this. So with this snapshot changes method, we are getting this categories collection document as an observable. But we cannot directly subscribe to this method and get the categories documents data. Cause this snapshot changes method returning so many technical things with it. So in order to access this data, first we have to map through this observable and create another new observable with relevant wanted data by dropping unnecessary technical data. So with this pipe method, we are creating a new observable by including the data and the document ID. So this is the simple idea that I can give for this. This has a deep meaning, but I'm not going to explain that with this course. Because if I do that, I have to take this course to another different direction. And also you guys may get confused with all the technical parts. So guys, unfortunately, you have to do this in order to get data from Firestore. But don't worry. You guys will get used to this while using this throughout this course. Alright, let's move on. In order to access this data from outside of this method, we have to return this, right? So return this ID and data as an object. So return statement and the object scope. First return the ID, then the data. This return will be returned from this callback. So again, return this whole callback. So this will return to this map callback. To get this, return this whole query. That's it. Perfect. Now we have the query. Now let's get the data. So I want to load the categories soon after this categories component load inside the browser. So to do that, we have to call this load data inside this ng on init lifecycle hook method. This method will trigger soon after this component is fully initialized inside the browser DOM, right? We learned about this as well. So inside this ngunit method, in order to call this load data method, we have to call the angular service. So this dot category service, we imported the service and injected this to the constructor in the previous lecture. So after this again dot, look at these auto suggestions. Here now we can see these two methods, save data and load data. We are going to do the load data. So select this load data method and don't forget to add the parentheses here. Perfect. As I mentioned earlier with this, we are returning a processed observable using the pipe RxJS operator. So hover this load data method. Look at this. This is what I want to tell you guys. 
we are creating an observable with these two data id and this data object awesome right so as we learned in the observable section of this course in order to access this observable we have to subscribe to this observable right so let's do this after this dot subscribe and parentheses inside this callback function well this can be any name arrow function and the function scope perfect so inside this for now simply log this well variable that's it save this all and back to the browser look at the browser console perfect look at this we got this data array with categories document object data and with the document id awesome right so guys this is how we retrieve data from cloud firestore Alright, so in the previous lecture, we wrote this query to get category documents from Cloud Firestore. Now in this lecture, let's see how to show this data inside the browser view. So what I want to do is I want to show this inside of an HTML table. So let's do this. And also we'll show this inside the same categories component view. So inside the category component ts file, add these markups. So after this form row, create another row for the categories table put this inside the same container div for this row add these utility classes mt-5 and mb-5 inside this row create a size 6 column div.col-md-6 and hit enter inside this let's create a bootstrap card with shadow dash effect custom global css class Inside this card body div. So inside that, let's create the HTML table. So create a table tag with these bootstrap classes, table, row dash border and hover. Inside this table, let's create the table head. So th head tags. Inside this, tr tag. So inside this tr tag, three th tags. The first is tag is number. The second one is category. And the last one is action. This column is to show the delete and edit buttons. Perfect. After this, t head, create a t body tag. Inside this, add a tr tag. Inside this tr tag, three td tags. For now keep this empty later we load categories document data inside these tds all right save this all and back to the browser mm, table looks perfect but i want to make this table middle of the page so for this i'm going to make this table center of the page with columns so before this column add another size 3 column call dash md dash 3 so after this table column also add size 3 column can you guys guess why did I add this size 3 column? Because bootstrap grid is 12 size column, right? So in order to make this size 6 column middle of the browser view, we have to add the remaining column to both sides of this middle column by dividing equally, right? So this is 6, so the remaining size is from 12 is 6. If 6 is divided into equal sizes, one column is size 3, right? Hope you guys got the idea. So, alright, save this and back to the browser. Awesome, right? Looks perfect. Now we have the table. Next, let's see how to load the data inside this table. As you know, now we have the categories documents array list. This is what we got inside this console. So now I want to show this data inside this table. So first thing first, we have to assign this subscribe callback value data to a global variable because this is inside this subscribe method. We cannot access this variable outside of this subscribe scope, right? Create a variable something category array. And this data type will be array and array type will be object 
now assign the subscribe data to this category array variable this dot category array assign well perfect next let's show this inside the browser view the category documents are loaded as an array in order to show an array inside the browser we have to loop through this array and show the data one by one inside the view so how do we do that can you guys guess yes of course for this we can use the ng4 directive let's see this in action inside the category HTML file inside this tr tag add the ng4 directive add this with asterisk symbol after this equal sign and the loop inside the quotes the loop is let category of category array we have this number t head so for this i will use the index number of this array so let's get the index number with this so after this semicolon let i assign index that's it so now inside this tr the first td is for number so td inside this td add a string interpolation inside this show the index of this array next another td for the category so td and open and close to curly brackets inside this category data dot category so guys this is this looping category variable this data is coming from here inside this array we got this object inside that we got data object inside that we got our category so this is what i defined here next column for actions um, for this column i will add buttons for delete and update actions for now just simply create an empty td and keep it we'll add the buttons later that's it save this and back to the browser look at this we got the category documents loaded inside this table looks perfect right mm, if you notice this number is starting from zero why is that for this we loaded the index of this array so array index are starting from zero right so to solve this problem increment this by one that's it save this and back to the browser now this is starting from one perfect so guys before the end of this video i want you guys to show another awesome feature of the firestore database which is real-time data loading wait i'll show you this create a new category something react look at the table carefully soon after i hit this button the saved new category will load inside this table without any reloading boom this is one of the best features in the firestore wait i'll show you another example i load this application inside of another browser tab so these two applications are loaded separately right so i'm going to save a new category from this first browser window something this time resources keep your eyes on the table hit the add category button as you can see here this new category is loaded inside both application in real time without any refreshing the page or any delay so guys this is what real time data does so doing this real time data syncing is not an easy task for this we have to use web sockets and continuously watch for database changes but with the firestore we are getting this real time feature out of the box beautiful isn't it Okay guys and one more thing after we save the category inside the firestore still we got this category name on this input it kind of annoying right so we'll reset this form after submitting this form for this back in the vs code inside the on submit method add this we are getting the form with this parameter so form data dot reset and the parenthesis that's it save this and back to the browser now again add a new category hit the enter or click this button perfect this time this input field is empty awesome
All right, in the previous, we learned how to load data from Firestore and we showed that loaded data inside of this table. Looks great, right? Now in this lecture, let's see how to edit or update an already saved category. Think if you want to update this empty data to something category, or you want to change this JavaScript category to just only script, how do we do that? Let's learn that in this section. So before we do the update query, first we have to do some adjustments in this form to update a category. So first thing first, we need an edit button for these categories. So let's add that. If you can remember, we allocated this action column for this. So inside this last TD, which represent this actions column, create a button. Button tag with these booster classes, btn, btn-sm, and btn dash warning. The button text will be edit. Perfect. Save this and back to the browser. As you can see here, we got the edit button in front of each of these categories. So now what I want to do is I want to load the relevant category inside this same text field to edit when clicking this edit button. So let's see this in action. So first let's do the button logic. Um, I want to capture the relevant category name when clicking this button. So for this, we'll write a click event binding. So inside this button tag, open and close a bracket. Inside this event name is click. So after this, you could sign. When clicking this button, let's call a method something on edit. And don't forget to add the parenthesis. So with this parameter, let's pass the category name to this function. So the category name is this same string interpolation. So copy and paste it here. Still we don't have this on edit method. So let's create that. Inside the category component is file, create this method on edit and the parenthesis. So from here we are sending a parameter. So capture it. The parameter variable something category. After this, you don't forget to add the parenthesis. Inside this method, for now, log this parameter category. Save this all and back to the browser. Click any of these edit buttons. Look the browser console. As you can see here, now we are getting the relevant category name when clicking one of these edit buttons. Awesome, right? Okay guys, now we have the category. Now what I want to do is, I want to show this category value inside this input field. Then only we can edit, right? So for this, we can use the two-way data binding. Hope you guys remember this. So let's do it. For two-way data binding, we have to wrap this ng model with brackets and square brackets. After this, assign this to a variable something form category. Put this inside of quotes. So still we don't have this variable. So inside the component is file, create this variable form category and this type will be string. Now we have to assign this category parameter to this two-way data binding. So inside this on edit method, this dot to a data binding variable which is this form category so form category assign this to this parameter variable category that's it save this and back to the browser click one of these button look at this now we got relevant category value inside this input field beautiful isn't it now we can edit this and update this category to cloud firestore next we'll see how to do the update query just wait before end of this lecture let's do a small thing let's change this save category and this add category to edit categories when we're doing the edit so let's see this in action for this we have to make this dynamic so first let's create a variable something form status and set the type to string after this assign a default value for this and Perfect. Now change this variable to edit when clicking the edit button. So inside the unedit function, change this form status to edit. Still we are not done. So now go to the categories component HTML file and remove this save from this heading and simply add a string interpolation and show the form status variable. So after this, do the same for this button text as well. Remove this add and add a string interpolation. Inside that, add the variable name form status. 
perfect save this all and back to the browser so now we can see this as uh, add categories because this variable default value set to this and right so now click on this edit button as you can see here this and change to edit beautiful isn't it so this is how we change the user view dynamically perfect all right in the previous we prepare this form to do the editing part now in this lecture let's see how to do the update query so inside the categories service file let's create a method for the update so after this update data parentheses and the method scope so in order to update data inside the file store we need two parameters one is the edited data and the updating documents id so we have to get that from the categories component so we'll get that to this method via parameters so declare the parameters id and the edited data that's it now inside this method let's do the update query as usual in order to do this we have to access the angular file store service so this dot afs dot collection the collection name is categories pass this as a string after this we have to pass the which document we have to update this id so dot doc and inside parentheses we have to pass the document id which we'll be getting from this id parameter so pass that here after this again dot this time we are performing the update query so dot update and the parenthesis inside this we have to pass the edited data document so this also we will be getting from this parameter edit data so pass this inside this parameter perfect query is done so after this as usual callback function dot then inside parenthesis callback function doc ref and the arrow function inside this let's show the success toaster message so copy this from save data method paste it here change the message to data updated successfully perfect now we created the query next let's see how to call this edit method and send relevant parameters to this update data method so go to the categories component ts file and add this um, in the previous lecture we did this edit button logic when we click this we load the relevant data inside the input field for the edit and save we are using the same form so after this editing the category will submit the same form so this will call this same on submit method inside this method now we have to differentiate and capture the save and update actions so for this we can use this form status variable if this form status variable is add we will do the save data logic if this form status is edit we will do the edit data logic simple right so let's see this in action inside this on submit method after this object create an if else condition if and the parenthesis inside this add the logic if this dot form status equals to add put this inside quotes after this add the condition scope inside this we will do the save data logic which is this so cut it from here and put it inside this condition after this else if the condition is this this dot form status equals edit so inside this condition scope we will do the update logic so let's do this the update query is inside the category service file so this dot category service dot as you can see here this time we got this update data method so select this and don't forget to add the parenthesis perfect next this method required two parameters id and the data how do we get the id if you can remember we are getting the document id with this category array right so now what i am going to do is 
I'm going to pass this category to this on edit method when clicking the edit button and store that inside of a global variable. Then we can access that variable from this on submit method. So let's see that in action. First, let's pass the ID to this on edit method as a parameter. So after this parameter, add another parameter category.id. This is this looping variable and this is the ID. Now we go to the component ts file and create a variable to store this ID, something category ID. And this time will be string. Now inside the onEdit method, first capture the ID. So create a parameter variable, something ID. After this, inside this method, assign this ID to the category ID global variable. This dot category ID assign ID. That's it. Now we have the ID. So pass this to the subject query parameter. This required another parameter, which is the edited data. We already have this. We are submitting the same form. So we're getting that edited category value as this same form value. We assign that to this category object. So simply pass that category data object to this update data method. That's it. Save this all and back to the browser. Let's edit this category. At the end, add edit and hit this edit category button. Look at this guys. We got this success toaster message and this edited category inside the table. This means this working as we planned. Beautiful. Before the end of this video, let's do another small work. After editing this category, Reset the form and also change this edit to add form. So back in the VS code, after this form data dot reset and this dot form status assign and that's it. So we send back to the browser again edit this category, click this update button. Perfect, everything working as we planned. So guys, this is how we update existing Firestore data using Angular Firestore. So guys, we have successfully completed the update data in the previous lecture. So in this lecture, let's see our last operation, how to delete data from Firestore. Comparing to other operations, this is very easy. So let's see this in action. So for this first thing first, we need a delete button. So let's create that. Inside this same TD, duplicate this edit button and change this. Set the button to danger and add additional booster classes to this ML-2. This will add a margin left to this button, right? Next, we need a click event for this as well. So keep this click event and change this method name to on delete. For this, we need only the ID. So keep this ID and remove the category parameter. At last, change this edit to delete. Perfect. So now still we don't have this method. So create this inside the component is file. After this, add this method name is on delete and the parenthesis. With this parenthesis, we are getting the ID parameter. So capture it ID. So after this, don't forget to add the method scope. For now, I'll keep this method empty. We'll come back to this after creating the delete query. So once again, we'll put all the queries inside the category service file. So inside the category service TS file, create a method called delete data. Inside this, let's add the query. As usual, this dot fs dot collection. The collection name is categories. After this dot doc because we're going to delete a category document. So we have to pass that document ID to this query. So we have to get this ID as a parameter. So create a parameter variable, something ID. So now pass that ID to this doc parenthesis. This 
that's it for the query so as usual after this add the call back inside this add the success toaster message copy this from the previous method and change the message to data deleted perfect our delete query is ready now let's access this query from component is file so back to the categories component is file inside this on delete method let's call the delete data service method so this dot category is service dot now as you can see here we got this delete data method so select it and don't forget to add the parentheses this required the document id parameter so pass this parameter id to this so that's it for the delete query save this all and back to the browser click this delete button look at this guys we got this success toaster message and also data deleted from the database successfully that's why the data is getting disappeared from this table so guys this is how we query to delete data from cloud firestore Before the end of this section, I want to show you another thing guys. If you can remember when we inserting data into the Firestore, I showed you a simplified method for this big collection document query using the document path method like this query path method. So we can simplify this update and delete queries rather than adding this collection method. So let's see this in action. So inside this update data remove this collection method and keep this only doc method inside this we can pass the collection as a path for this we can use the javascript concat method so before this id parameter quotes inside this pass the collection name categories and don't forget to add this slash cause this is a path url after this concat these two strings by adding plus sign this is concatenation in javascript okay so this is concatting is okay but in modern javascript we have a better approach using the template strings so let's do this remove this all and add the back tick for instead of these quotes first collection name categories slash next we have to pass the id parameter variable so we'll pass that as a template string so dollar sign open and close curly brackets inside this pass the variable name id that's it perfect right so this is how we simplify this using the query path url so again we can do the same for this delete query as well so remove this collection method and copy this path from from the update method and paste it here That's it. Save this all and back to the browser. Let's see is this working or not. Edit a category. Perfect. It's worked. Now delete a category. Perfect. Everything working as we expected. So guys, there is no mandatory requirement for use this URL path queries. If you don't like it, you can use the previous collection method. For this first level collection queries, the collection method is okay. But if you're doing multi sub collections at that time, this query path URL will be very helpful for cleaner and minimal code structure. All right, this is the end of this section. This section was almost two hours long, and you guys did it well. I really appreciate your dedication and following this with me well done guys with this section we almost completed all the hard works upcoming sections will be easier than this so in this section we learned how to prepare a front end for data manipulations such as loading inserting editing and delete data and also we learned how to perform insert update delete and get data queries from the firestore hope you guys learned it well if any of you missed anything, please go through this section again and again until you get this. In any case, if you have any questions or problems, leave me a message. I will always there for you. 
So guys, this is the end of this section. We'll meet you in the next section. Until then, learn smart, not hard. So in this section, we're going to be learn to do the CRUD operations for the blog post. So in this section, we're going to be looking at how to save a new post to the Cloud Firestore, how to upload the post image to the Firebase Cloud Storage, how to load the saved post with the post images, how to set up an HTML table with post image preview, how to update an existing blog post, and also we we'll learn how to do the delete operation for the blog post. This section is filled with more logics and funs. Why do we waiting? Let's get started. All right, if you can remember in the previous section, we learned how to save, update, delete, and load data from Cloud Firestore for categories. So in this lecture, we're gonna do the same for blog post. Almost everything same, but we do some additional algorithms for category selecting, and how to upload an image to Firebase cloud storage and so on. So let's see this in action. All right. So first thing first, let's plan the components for blog post. So we need an old post component to show all the blog post. This time we're going to create a separate component for new blog post form. Cause this form is going to be with few inputs. So putting them all inside this main component like categories will not work for this so we need a new post component so those are the components that we need for this section so first let's generate the components then we can do the designs and the logics inside the integrate terminal run this command wait i'm not gonna do this we did this several times so now you guys can do it this your own so generate the old post component and new post component using the angular CLI command and generate them inside of a folder called post. So let's begin. All right. So hope you guys did it well. Very easy. Nothing much. So inside the integrated terminal run this command ng g c. This stands for component and the folder path is post slash and the component name all post. This is a two word name. So separate this with a iPhone. Perfect. It entered to execute this command. We need another component. So let's generate that in G G C folder path is post slash and the component name is new iPhone post. Perfect. We generated the required components for the blog post component. Before we dive into the design and algorithms, first thing first, we have to create routers for the components of the post. So let's do this. Inside the router model TS file, after this category router, let's add the router for the all post component. So after this, inside curly brackets, path and the router path is post. The component is all post component. Next router for the new post. So the path is post slash new. The component for this router is new post component. Select this auto complete. This will import the component path to this router module. Perfect. So that's it for the router. So next let's add a menu card for this post inside the dashboard. So we already have this menu card for the categories now let's design another menu card for post nothing much just duplicate the previous menu card and change this to post also don't forget to change this as well manage your post details here perfect next change this icon to this fas fa dash file dash image at last change this router link to slash post with this we are navigating to the post component perfect now save this all and back to the browser as you can see here this time we got this post menu card click on this this open the all post component inside the browser 
Perfect. All right. Now let's design the old post component. For now, we'll add the simple hero section. Later, we'll load old post documents from the cloud faster. So open the old post component HTML file and add these markups. Create a container div. Inside this, create another div with Bootstrap Pro class. Inside this row, create a full size Bootstrap column called md-12. Perfect. Now inside this column, create a Bootstrap card column with these custom CSS classes, shadow-effect and bg-secondary-theme. Inside this card div, create a Bootstrap card body div and also add text dash center to this div as well. Next inside this card body, add an S3 tag. The bootstrap class is text dash theme dash center. The H3 text will be all blog post. After this P tag, the P tag text will be from here you can manage your blog post. Perfect. Again at last create two buttons after this, one is for add new post and the other one for back to dashboard. So after this create a button tag with these classes btn, btn-info, bg-theme. The button text will be add a new post. Duplicate this button one more time, change info to the warning, remove this bg-theme class and add this bootstrap class ml-2 the button text will be back to the dashboard save this all and back to the browser looks beautiful isn't it perfect so now let's make this button functional still these buttons are not doing anything so what i want to do is i want to open the new post component when clicking this add new post button and also I want to go back to the dashboard component when clicking this button. For this as you know we can use the router link directive. So let's see this in action. Add router link to this add new button. Router link. The router path is slash post slash new. The dashboard router is the main or the default router. So just simply add a slash for this. This slash represents the default router. Now save this all and back to the browser. Click this button. This open the add new post component. Again click this back to dashboard button. This navigate to the dashboard component. Everything working perfectly. Alright, in this lecture, let's design the add new post form inside this add new form component. So let's begin. Open the new post component HTML file. Inside this, add these markups. Create a bootstrap container. Inside this, bootstrap row. Inside this row, bootstrap column, call dash md dash 12. And text dash center. Inside this div, create an h3 tag with these classes text dash theme dash primary the h3 text will be add new post after this p tag with this bootstrap utility classes mb dash 5 the p text will be you can add your new post here after this first row add the form tags inside this form tags create a row inside this row create a column call dash md dash 7 again inside this column create a bootstrap card and don't forget to add the shadow dash effect class as well inside this bootstrap card as usual card body div inside this let's add the first input field for this form so first create a form group div inside this label the label text will be title after this input field the input type is text and add bootstrap form dash control class to this input that's it next copy and paste this form group two times 
The second input is for permalink. So the label text is permalink. Input is the same as this. The next form group for an excerpt. So the label is excerpt and for this we'll add a text area. So remove this, create a text area. We don't need this name and ID attribute. So remove it. The class is form dash control. That's it. So this is not done yet. We'll continue the form inside the right side column. So create a column div inside the same row. The column size is, we already created this size seven column. So the remaining column size is five, right? Because full column size is 12. Okay guys, remember this. So inside this column, create two form inputs. The first one is for category list. So create a form group div inside this label. The label text is please select a post category. For this we'll add the select drop down input. So create this select tag and add the form dash control bootstrap class to this. Inside the select tag add an option tag value is empty and makes this value disabled the text will be please select a category that's it for now keep this way later we'll fetch the categories documents to this list from cloud file store after this input let's create a file select input this is for post images so again another form group div inside this label the label text is post image after this label create input field the input type is file and don't forget to add the form dash control bootstrap class to this as well next the last input field for this form which is for post content for this we'll use a text area for now we'll add this text area inside of a full width column so after this first row, create another row with these utility classes empty dash three mb dash five. Inside this row, create a full width column call dash md dash twelve. Inside this, as usual, create a bootstrap card with shadow dash effect custom CSS class. After this, inside this, create a card body div. Inside this card body, create a form group. Inside this label and label text is content. After this, create a text area. Remove this name and ID. We don't need that. At last, don't forget to add the form dash control bootstrap CSS class to this text area. Perfect. So after this, let's add the submit button. So after this first column, create another column with these bootstrap classes. Call dash md dash 12, text dash center and mb dash 5. Inside this column, add a button tag, add these classes to this button. btn, btn dash info, bg dash theme. The button text is save post. Mm, let's add another button to go back duplicate this button change this button color info to button warning remove this btn theme class and add this ml-3 bootstrap utility class to this button the button text is back to post add the router link the router link for all post is slash post perfect save this and back to the browser Navigate to the add new post. Look at this form. This looks perfect, right? So in the previous we designed this new post form. This form is not done yet. We have to do some additional works. So in this lecture, let's see what is this permalink and how to create this permalink for a blog post. So when we creating this form, I added this permalink field. 
Some of you may know what is this. Some of you may wonder what is this. Let me explain. So what is this permalink? With this form, we are creating a new post, right? In order to preview this inside the browser, we need a unique link or the URL, right? Something like our website URL slash something, right? So this is what we call permalink. In other words, we can call this permanent link. We can create this permalink as we wanted. We can use the post ID to identify this or published date or something unique name. But as a good practice, we mostly use the post title for this permalink. Because when we using the title for this permalink, this will help to rank this post inside the search engines. So for the title, we use spaces, right? Something like this best Udemy courses for Angular. For this, we used spaces between these words. But for a permalink, we cannot use spaces. Inside the browser URL, we cannot add spaces, right? So we cannot use this title directly as a permalink. So we have to make this title as a URL friendly permalink. So how do we turn this into URL friendly title? Very simple, nothing much to do. Just we'll add hyphens instead of spaces like this. Best dash Udemy dash course dash for dash angular. So this is now URL friendly permalink. Hope you guys got the idea. So we have a problem making this permalink with the iPhone for each and every post title that we're creating. It sounds like a big pain, right? So what we can do for this is we can add these iPhones by automatically when typing the title with a simple algorithm. So next let's see this in action. So in this lecture let's see how to make this permalink programmatically. This is nothing to do with angular. For this we are going to use the javascript replace method. Let's see this in action. So first thing first I want to capture this title inputs value when typing inside this input. So for this if you can remember we have an event binding called key up. So let's add that to this title input. Inside brackets the event is key up all simple letters after this equal sign let's call a method something on title change and parenthesis now in order to capture this input value we have to pass the javascript event object to this input so inside this parenthesis dollar sign event so still we don't have this method so now let's create this method inside the component ts file so go to the post component is file and add this method on title change and the parenthesis. So we are getting a parameter for this. So the parameter name is something dollar sign event. At last, don't forget to add the method scope. And one more thing guys, please remember this is just a variable name. This is a parameter variable. You can use any name for this. I just use this dollar sign event as a standard for this event parameter. Hope you guys got the idea. Alright, so for now let's add a console log to this parameter to check what we are getting with this event parameter. So save this all and back to the browser. Type something inside the title input. Inside the log we got this event object with these all values. Lots of values are there. Don't worry, we are not gonna deal with this all. We only work with this value of the title inputs event. So how do we capture the value from this event? Let's see, very simple. So after this dot target dot value. So save this and back to the browser. Again type something, look at this. This time we are getting the title value. So this is how we capture the value from an event object. Perfect. All right, now we got the value. So now what I want to do is I want to replace all the spaces inside the title with a iPhone or the dash symbol. 
for we can use the javascript replace method so back in the vs code first remove this log we don't need that anymore assign the title value to a variable something const title assign dollar sign event dot target dot value as you know with this we are getting the input value so this variable title dot replace and the parentheses this replace method required two parameters first we have to pass what characters need to change and as a second parameter we have to pass the replacing character in our case the first parameter is this space so pass this inside quotes so add the quotes and inside this simply add a space the second parameter is I want to replace the spaces to iPhone so pass this also as a string so now this return the modified value so assign this to a variable something permalink let permalink assign now log this permalink save this all and back to the browser type something and hit enter look at the console the space replaced with the iPhone awesome right but wait this is not done yet cause if I add another space look at this this time this is not replaced with the iPhone again add another space it's also not replaced this method is working only for the first space for second third space this is not working so as a solution for this we have to pass the space character to this replace method with a regex pattern so remove this and add this pattern forward slash backward slash simple less again forward slash g this pattern represent the space so again save this and back to the browser type something and add a space we got the iphone again add something and type space look at this we got this second iphone as well let's test this again add another space perfect this time this is replacing all the spaces with the iphone no matter how many spaces are there perfect so this is how we replace a character using the replace javascript method now we got the permalink now what i want to do is i want to show that inside this permalink input how do we do that if you can remember for this we can use two-way data binding right so let's do this in order to access this permalink variable outside of this scope we have to make this as a global variable so let's make this as a global variable inside the global scope permalink and this type will be string add an initial value empty value perfect next use this variable remove this and add this dot permalink now this modified title is assigning to this global permalink variable all right now let's add this to the input using the two-way data binding inside this input square bracket inside this open and close another bracket and ng model assign this to the permalink variable that's it save this and back to the browser type something look at this we are getting this inside permalink input in real time looks awesome right mm. at last so remove this font size from global input style and also set the body font size to 14 pixels and one more thing disable this input so the user cannot edit this permanently this will auto generate when typing the post title perfect all right 
In this lecture, let's work on this input file field. With this, I want to select a post image. After selecting an image, I want to show that selected image preview also here. Then we can exactly see what is selected, right? So let's do this. Mm, first, let's simply accept only images with this input. For this, we can use the accept HTML5 attribute. So accept inside codes, this type image, slash with this we want to select all kinds of images so put an asterisk that's it next before this input create an image tag to show the preview of the selected image so ing and hit enter as you know we can set this src dynamically using data binding right so in order to make this as a directive wrap this inside of square brackets now we can assign this to a dynamic variable something img src. After this add these CSS classes to this form dash control img dash fluid and at last add a custom CSS class to this img dash preview. That's it. Um, now let's create this variable inside the component ts file. Inside this global scope, create the image src variable. This type will be string and assign this to a default image path. For this, let's use an image placeholder. I have attached this image placeholder to this lecture. Please download it and put it inside this assets folder. As you know, we put all the files and images for this Angular project inside this assets folder right all right so now let's add this placeholder image path to this image src variable inside codes dot slash assets slash placeholder dash image dot jpg perfect now save this and back to the browser mm, let's add a height to this image tag Again back to the VS code and open the new post CSS file and add this style. We created this custom CSS class for this so use that img dash preview. Inside this scope set the height to around 250 pixels. That's it again save this all and back to the browser. Now this preview image placeholder looks beautiful isn't it? Alright, now let's see how to add the image preview when we select an image from this file input. For this we can use the change event binding. So let's do it. Inside this file input, add this, open and close a bracket. Inside this, the event is change. This event will trigger when there is any changes happen inside this input field. Next assign this to a method called something show preview. This P must be capital. And at last don't forget to add the parentheses. So with this method we have to access this input data. So in order to access this inputs data we have to send the event object with this as a parameter. So inside this parameter dollar sign event. Still we don't have this method, so back to the new post component is file and create this method. Method name is show preview and parenthesis. We are getting event object, so create parameter variable to capture that dollar sign event. Perfect. After this, don't forget to add the method scope. So now inside this, let's do the image preview logic. For this also we're gonna use the javascript file reader class. So let's do it. Inside this method, create a variable const reader, assign new file reader and don't forget to add the parentheses. After this reader.onload equal sign, assign this to an arrow function. So open and close parentheses and the arrow after this function scope. This function required a parameter, so pass it something e. So now inside this function, this dot img src, this global variable, 
assign e dot target dot result with this we are capturing the file when on load and assign it to the global image src variable which is bound to this image preview tag so still this is not done yet so this is coming as a blob data type in order to assign this to the src tag we have to convert this to a data url So after this, at this reader dot read as data URL. Carefully follow this capital simple letters. Inside parentheses, we have to pass the image file. Inside this event dot target dot files. This file is coming as an array. So add a square bracket and add the array index which is zero. That's it. Save this and back to the browser. Select an image. Look at this. We got this preview loaded here. Awesome, right? So before the end of this lecture, let's assign this file to a global variable so we can access it later. Create a variable, selected image and set the type to any. So inside this show preview method, this dot selected image, which is this created global variable assign event dot target dot files so open and close square brackets inside pass zero so with this we are assigning the selected image to this global variable so as i said earlier we can use this later so that's it for this lecture All right, in this lecture, let's see how to load the categories from the Firestore database and load them inside this drop down list. So let's see this in action. So in order to load categories from Firebase, we have to add the load query here. But if you can remember, we created this load data query for categories when we're dealing with categories data manipulations. So now in this lecture, we can use the same load data method with this post component as well. Actually, how do we do that? If you can remember, we added all the Firestore queries inside of an Angular service. So now we can reuse this categories service for loading data inside the new post component as well. So this is one of the beauties of Angular services. So that's why I added this inside of an Angular service file. Hope you guys got the idea. All right, back to the work. In order to use this category service, first we have to inject this to the constructor. So let's do this. Inside the new post component is files constructor at the injection private category service and this type is categories service. Select this auto complete. This will import this service to this component file. Perfect. Now inside the ng on init lifecycle hook, let's call the load data method to get the categories. So inside this, this dot category service dot load data. And don't forget to add the parenthesis. This is returning an observable. So as you know, in order to access this observable data, we have to subscribe to this. So after this dot subscribe and parenthesis inside this arrow function, the parameter variable is well, this can be any new. Okay. So after this arrow function and the function scope. Now what I want to do is, in order to access this value variable out of this method, we have to access this outside of this subscribe method. So let's assign this to a global variable. Then we can access this outside of this subscribe method. So create a global variable categories and this data type is an array and array type is object. Now assign this to this well variable perfect now we have the list of categories documents now let's load this array and load the categories inside the select tag so go to the new post html file and add this so after this add another option tag and add the ng4 loop ng4 assign inside codes let category of categories 
this category is this global array variable so inside this options tag show the category so for this we'll use the string interpolation so open and close two curly brackets inside this category dot data dot category that's it save this and back to the browser open this drop down look at this now we got the category list inside this drop down perfect right all right next let's move on to the next input field in this lecture let's make this content text area into a visivig text editor because inside this we'll add the post content so instead of a blog post content we may have multiple headings images videos and so on but with this simple text area we cannot do that right so with this we can only add simple text as a solution for this we can use a visivig editor for this we have an npm package called angular editor so first let's install this package inside the integrate terminal run this command npm i at kolkow k o l k o v slash angular dash editor hit enter to execute this command perfect package is installed next as usual we have to add this inside the app module ts file so open the app module ts file and add the import statement import inside curly brackets angular editor module please carefully follow this capital simple letters after this from inside codes at call co slash angular dash editor so after this don't forget to add this inside the import array as well so inside this import array angular editor module perfect so now we successfully installed and initialized this inside our app now let's see how to use this visivig editor very simple go to the new post component html file now remove this text area and add this in order to use the angular editor we have to add this custom html tag which is this angular dash editor this is like component selector so after this we can add the placeholder for this like an input element placeholder and text will add your content here perfect that's it save this all and back to the browser look at this as you can see here now we got this beautiful visual editor with lots of customizable options so with this we can add heading tags we can change the font font sizes text color background color we can make a text bold italic underline and so on and also we can add images videos and links as well so using this editor we can add the beautiful blog post content awesome right as you know this form is still just a simple static html form so in order to make this form logical and to get the data from the form we have to make this form as an angular template driven form or the reactive form so if you can remember in the previous lecture we used the template driven form for this categories form 
because this form is just a simple form with one input field. So in that case, the template driven form approach is okay. But for this new post form, we have different types of several form inputs. So it's better if we use the active form approach for this. So let's see this in action. So guys, first thing first, in order to use the Angular Reactive Form approach with this Angular application, we have to tell this Angular application that we are using the Angular Reactive Form. So for this, we have to import the Reactive Forms module with this Angular. So as you know, we add all the module imports inside this app module file. So inside this, let's import the Reactive Forms module. Import inside curly brackets. Module name is reactive forms module. Carefully follow these simple capital letters. This is coming from at angular slash forms. Perfect. Next set this module inside the import array as well. Alright, we successfully imported the angular reactive forms module to this angular application. Now in order to make this a reactive form, first we have to create the form group class instances and form control class in instances manually by hand coding. Hope you guys remember this, right? We learned about this in detail when we learning Angular reactive forms. So let's do this. So for this I will use the form builder service. So go to the new post component ES file and um, in order to use the form builder service we have to inject that to the constructor. So let's inject the forms builder to this constructor. Private fb. This is just a variable name. After this, set this type to forms builder. So this will complete. This will import forms builder to this component. Perfect. Next, inside the constructor, let's define the forms group and form controls. So for this, first, let's create a global variable post form. Set this type to form group. this dot post form equal sign this dot fb this is this injected form builder service after this dot group because we are creating a form group after this add the parentheses so now inside this we have to add the form controls so we pass this as an object so open and close the object scope inside this we have to pass the form control key value pairs. Hope you guys remember this. So the first key is title. This is for the title input. So the key is title colon as a value. For this we have to pass the new instance of the form control class. If you can remember for this in form builder approach we just use the square brackets. So just add a pair of square brackets. That's it. Inside this, we can add a default value of this form control. It is just an empty value. So just pass these simple quotes. Next form control is permalink. After this value is square bracket. Next except and value is just simple square bracket. Next category. After this, post image. At last, form control for the content. That's it. We have successfully created all the form controls inside this form group. This is not done yet. We created the form group and form controls. Now we have to assign them to the HTML form and for these inputs fields. So let's do this. First assign the form group to this form. For this we can use form group directive. So inside uh, this form tag, square brackets, inside this form group, assign post form, which is this global variable assigned to this form group new instance. Next, let's assign uh, the form controls. For this, we can use the form control name directive. So first inside the title input, form control name, carefully follow these capital simple letters, assign title. This is this form control key name, right? Okay, let's move on to the next field, permalink. Mm, let's copy this from the title input and paste it here. Change the form control name. This is permalink. 
So carefully add this name as this key values. Otherwise you will get unnecessary compile errors. So next for this except, paste it here, change this to except. Next we got the category select tags, paste the form control name, change this to category. Next post image and change this to post image form control name post ing next paste this inside this angular editor tags and change this to content that's it so we successfully transfer the static html to an angular reactive form in the next lecture let's add the validations So guys in the previous lecture we made the simple static html form into an angular reactive form so in this lecture let's do the form validation so first thing first we have to declare the validations inside this form build so we already learned about this if you can remember in the reactive form section we learned all about this in detail hope you guys remember this so let's begin so for this title form control we have to add two validations the first one is required validation and the second one is min length validation. So in order to pass multiple validations inside this form control, we have to pass this as an array. So open and close square brackets. After this default value, inside this the first validation is validators. Select this auto complete. This will import this validators module inside this component file. So after this dot required. The second validator is min length. So after this comma validators dot min length. This L must be capital. Add the parentheses. Now inside this parentheses, the min length count is around 10. That's it. The first title form control validations are completed. The second form control is this permalink. For this we are going to use only one validator which is the required. So no need to pass this as an array. So after this default value, add a comma and add the validation validators dot required. The third one is except for this also we are going to add two validations like this title form control required validation and the min length validation. So let's do it. So we in order to pass multiple validations inside this form control, we have to pass that as an array. To create an array, open and close square brackets inside this validators dot required comma the second validator is validators dot min length. Inside parentheses pass the min length count around 50. That's it. The next one is the category. For this also we're gonna pass only one validator so no need to add this as an array so after this default value add a comma validators dot required all right next for the post image also the same validators dot required for the content also the same validation validators dot required so we successfully added all the validation so now let's see how to use this so guys in this lecture i'm going a little fast because we learned all about this in detail in the angular reactive form section so if any of you may not get this please go back to the angular reactive form section and learn it again perfect so all right let's continue so in order to use these form controls inside the HTML file, we have to add the getter method for this form control. So after this ng on init, create the getter method, get fc, this is just a variable name, you can use whatever name you want. I just named this fc cause this represent form control. So after this parentheses, and add the method scope inside this add the return statement this dot post form which is this form group then dot controls 
so with this we are returning all the form controls of this post form perfect so now back to the HTML component file first let's add the validator error messages for the title input so after this create a div tag inside this create another div tag with these bootstrap classes alert alert dash danger the error message is title is required so now let's add the conditions inside this first div add an ng if the condition is fc dot title dot errors and add a question mark dot required with this condition we are checking that are there are any errors for this required validation for this alert div add another condition ng if fc dot title dot touch and the end operator again fc dot title dot invalid so with this we are checking that this input is touch and invalid if this condition is true this alert message will appear inside the browser so now let's add the alert message for the second validation which is this min length so this is also like the same as this so duplicate this and change these attributes this time we are doing this for the min length errors so remove this required and add the min length all simple letters so guys please carefully follow these simple capital letters so for this alert message also the condition is the same we don't need to change anything but the error message must be changed so this error message is post title must be at least 10 characters long that's it so after this let's add the red border to this input field so as you know for this we can use the class binding so let's do it in order to see this clearly i will add some line breaks inside this input field so now after this let's add the class binding so open and close square bracket inside this ng class after this equal sign inside double quotes open and close curly brackets as the first key we have to pass this CSS class so pass this as a string so inside single quotes the class that we want to bind to this input field is is dash invalid so now after this colon the condition is same like this so copy and paste it here that's it so save this and go back to the browser click on this title input click outside of it as you can see here we can see this alert message and this red border now we say this type something this time we got this min length error so add something so add 10 characters after the 10 characters this error has disappeared which means everything working as we planned all right now let's see how to add the validation error messages for this permalink input field so for this we got only this required validation just copy this required validation from the previous title validation copy this and paste it after this permalink input tag inside this same form group so now change this title to permalink cause this input is permalink and at last change the error message to permalink is required all right let's move on to the next input which is this excerpt for this we got the min length and required validation so for this also copy the title error message and paste it here after this text area inside this same form group div and at last don't forget to change this form control name to excerpt the required message is excerpt is required the second validation form control name excerpt and message is Excerpt must be at least 50 characters long. Alright, let's move on to the next input which is this post category. So for this we got only this required validation. So copy and paste the required error message from the previous input. Change the form control name to category. And 
and at last don't forget to change the error message please select a post category all right the next field is this post image so for this also we got the required validation so copy and paste it the required message from the previous and change the form control name to post img the error message is post image is required now again at last we got this content specific editor if you can remember previously we had this angular editor using an npm package this is not a regular html input this is a specific editor so for this also we got only this required validation so add the required error message here change the form control name to content the error message is the content is required all right so save this all and back to the browser look at this now we got the error messages for these validations for this except we got the required error message then we got the main length error message for this post category we got the required error message for the post image also we got the required error message at last for this content also we got the required error message perfect wait before the end of this lecture we have to do another thing so some of you may notice this for these inputs we got only the error message not the red border on the input fields so why is that because we just only added these alert messages but we didn't add this ng class and directive like this first title input field so copy this from the title input field ng class and this condition paste it inside the permalink input tag change the form control name to permalink do the same to the next field except the form control name is except the third one is the select input so inside the select tag paste this ng class and change the form control name to category next for this post image inside this paste this ng class and change the form control name to post img for this angular editor i'm not going to add the ng class directive because it's not going to work with this for this we didn't use an input regular stream input field we use something different here like component selectors so in this case this ng class will not work on this so it's okay just keep this error message for this angular editor perfect now save this all and back to the browser awesome look at this guys this time we got this error message and this red border on all these inputs perfect all right now let's add the validation to the submit button i want to make this button disable when this form is invalid so this is very simple just add this inside this button div as you know we can use the property binding for this so inside this square brackets disabled and the condition is this form is this post form so post form dot invalid if this form is invalid this button becomes disabled if this valid this button becomes enabled very simple right all right save this and back to the browser now this button is disabled fill this form correctly now this is enabled perfect all right so in this lecture let's submit the form and get this forms data and make an object to send to the angular file store so let's do this all right for this first thing first we have to submit this form for this as you know we can use the ng submit directive so inside this form tag add this inside brackets ng form after this assign 
this to a method call something on submit and don't forget to add the parentheses now we don't have this method so go to the new post component is file and create this method on submit so now inside this method we can define the post object so for this new post form we are using the angular reactive method we already got this form controls defined here so we don't need to send anything new from the form template right so in the previous template driven forms we defined everything inside the template view using the ng form and ng model directives that's why we send this ng form template variable with this but for the reactive form we already got all the form controls and the form groups inside this component ts file so we don't need to send any parameters to this method hope you guys got the idea wait i'll show you mm, let's log this forms value inside this on submit method this dot post form dot value save this and back to the browser fill this form with dummy text So now submit this form now look at the browser console we got this value object inside this we got all the form data awesome right so guys using this we can create the post document object to send and insert inside the cloud firestore so before defining the object let's create an interface for this post data document object so let's do this as you know we can generate an interface using the angular cli so inside the integrate terminal run this command ng g interface post it enter to execute this command perfect now open this post interface inside this Let's define the post object's shape. The first field is title. So this type is string. Next permalink. This is also a string. Again next category. For this I will set an object with category ID and with the category. This both data types will be string. You may be wondering why did I set this as an object. Just keep this. For now, I will explain this later. Next, we have the post image path. Inside the first database, we cannot save images, right? So what I will do is, I will store the image inside the Firestore cloud storage and will add the path of that uploaded image inside this post ing path, right? So this type also string. Next, except this also string content this data type also string so in addition to this we will set up some values is featured this is for featured post this data type will be boolean next views with this will count the post views so this data type will be number next status with this will update the post status such as new updated trashed likewise at last Add another key value pair for post date created at and this data type will be date perfect so this is our post document object shape looks like all right now we have the interface let's define the new post document object inside this on submit method so const the object name something post data this object type will be the post interface so colon post select this auto complete this will import this to new post component perfect so after this assign and the object scope so the first key value pair is title and the value is this coming with this title form control so this dot post form dot value dot title again next the permalink 
the value is this dot post form dot value the form control name is permalink carefully follow the capital simple letters Next we got the category for this I define this as an object in the post interface so open and close curly brackets inside this the first key value pair is category id um, just add an empty string for this in the next lecture I'll show you how to get these values the next key value pair is category assign this also to an empty string after this we got the post image path for this also assign an empty value because at this stage we still don't have the uploaded image URL. So don't think this too much. We learn about this in next lectures. Next we got the except. So the value is this dot post form dot value dot except. Next content. So the key is content. The value is this dot post form dot value dot content next we got this featured so set the value false because this data type is boolean which means for this we can pass only true or false next the view counts the key is views and set this to zero next the status set the status value to new at last created add for this pass the current data we can pass the current data with the javascript date so new date and the parentheses with this we can get the current date and time awesome right all right guys that's it for the post data document object in the next lecture let's see how to get this category id and the category name see you in the next lecture So in the previous lecture for this post interface I added this category as an object with the category id and category key value pair. Now in this lecture let's see how to fill these category values. First lock this post form values here. Save this and back to the browser. So now fill this form and submit this form. Inside the browser console, we got this post form value object. Inside this, with this category, we got this empty value. Why is that? Because we set the category form control to this select input. But we didn't define the value attribute for this options tag. If you can remember, in the previous, we looped the category array and displayed the category name inside this options tag. That's why we got the category name list inside this drop down. So in order to get the selected value, we have to set that using the value HTML5 attribute. So let's do that. Inside this options tag, value, assign. For this, let's assign the ID of the category. So this category dot ID. So we send back to the browser, again fill this form and submit. inside the browser console as you can see here this time we got the id of this selected category in case if you want to get the category name instead of this id pass this inside this so remove this id and add this dot data dot category save this and again back to the browser This time we got the category name with this category form control value. So this is how we set up the value for a select input. Now with this value attribute we can send only one value like this. If we want the id we can set this to id. In case if we want the category name so we can set this to category name. But we cannot send two separate values like these two value attributes in order to fill this category data document objects this category key value pair we need these two values category id and this category name so how do we get that 
very simple so let's send this both id and category name inside this one value so after this add another string interpolation and pass the category id so now let's separate these two values with a iphone or dash save this and back to the browser now look at this category value this time we got this id and the category name as one value separated with this hyphen now what we can do is we can split this id and category with this hyphen so for this we got a javascript method called split so let's see this in action inside the component is file before this post data object let's split the category value so this dot post form dot value dot category after this dot the function name is split and parenthesis this required a parameter as a parameter for this we can pass from where we want to split this value in our case we want to split this category value with this hyphen so pass this here as a string now this method will split this with this parameter character and add all the values inside of an array wait i'll show you this assign this to a variable something is splitted after this add a log and log this splitted variable save this and back to the browser now again fill this form and submit as you can see here we got an array inside this array we got this id and the category as the array values so this split method split this value with this iphone symbol and put the values inside of an array so we can access the separated values using the array indexes so for this you can use whatever the characters for this split method according to the requirement if i add a for this this will split this with all the letters a and add all the remaining values as an array so hope you guys got the idea and guys one more thing this is nothing to do with angular this is just a javascript function so if you don't get it don't think about that too much just get to know about this split function and this simple logic all right back to the work now we got the category id and the category name as an array with the split method so let's assign that to this category object the id is inside this array's first index which is index number 0 so this array name is splitted inside square brackets pass the index number which is 0 next the category name is the second index number which is 1 so pass it here perfect so now remove this log now again let's log this post data document object save this all and back to the browser fill this form and submit this look at this we got this post data object printed here this time we got this category object filled with the real data awesome right all right we successfully prepare all the prerequisites to save the post data inside the cloud firestore so first we'll upload the selected post image inside the firestore cloud storage because we cannot save an image or a file inside of the cloud firestore so what we're going to do is we will upload the image to the cloud storage and we'll add the uploaded image path to this post ing url so let's see this in action when we're learning firebase i told you that firebase has so many features that can be used with mobile and web applications so with those features already we are using the cloud firestore database so in this lecture we're going to use another feature for our post image storage which is firebase cloud storage bucket this also can use for free with some limitations with the free tier we are getting 5 gb of storage 
1 GB download per day and 20k upload operations and 50k download operations which is more than enough for our blog application. So now let's see this in action. In order to work with this we have to activate the storage first. So log into your Firebase account and go to the Firebase dashboard. Navigate to this storage tab. In here click this get started button. Here we can see some default security roles. We can't do changes here. So we'll do this later. So click this next. Like the Firestore database location, we have to select the storage location as well. For this also keep the default location. Now click this done button. This will configure and create our cloud storage bucket. Perfect, we got the storage console. Now we can upload the post image to this cloud storage. Um, before we move on, we have one more thing to do here. So let's change this security role. So go to this role. With this default role, we cannot upload any files to the cloud storage without authenticating to the Firestore. So we don't need that. That's why I remove this condition. Now we can upload files to this without any authentications. And guys, one more thing. We can upload a file using this button manually, but we're gonna learn how to do this programmatically using the Angular Fire NPM package. So guys, in order to use the cloud storage with the Angular application, we have to import the storage module. So let's do this. Inside the appModel.ts file, add the import statement, angular fire storage module. Carefully follow these capital simple letters. This is coming from at angular slash fire slash storage. After this, don't forget to add this inside the import array. Nothing fancy here. Like this fire module and firestore module import, we have to tell our angular application that we are using this storage module with our angular app. Alright, now in this lecture, let's add the upload query. So first thing first, we need a separate service file for all the database related queries. So let's generate a new service file for post. Inside the integrated terminal, run this command ngg service. The path is services slash because I'm going to store all these service files inside this service folder. So next, the service file name which is post. That's it. Hit the enter to execute this command. Perfect, we successfully generated the post service file. Inside the services folder, we got these two files. For this, so remove this test file. We don't need that. Now open this post service file. Inside this, let's do the upload query. In the previous, if you can remember, we used this Angular Firestore service for Firestore data manipulation. Like this, in order to work with cloud storage, we have another service called Angular Fire Storage. As I mentioned earlier, this also a service. So in order to use a service, we have to inject that to the constructor. So inside this constructor parenthesis, private storage colon, the service name is Angular Fire Storage. So if this auto complete, this will import this service to this post service. Next, create a method for upload images. So the method name is upload image, parentheses, and the method scope. In order to upload an image to the cloud file store, we have to set up a file path and unique name for the image file. And also we have to define where do we want to save that uploading image inside the cloud storage. Otherwise this upload process will break. So first we have to set up the file path and the unique name for the uploading file. So first thing first we need the selected image. 
we selected images inside the new post component ES file. So how do we access that from this post service? Very simple. We can pass that to this method via parameter. So let's define the parameter variable selected image. All right, now let's define the file path. So inside this const file path assign. Now let's set up the path. Mm, let's add the backtick so we can use template strings with this, right? So backtick inside this. First, let's pass the folder path. Mm, let's put the post images inside of post img folder. After this, file name. So slash. To generate a unique file name, we can use different methods in JavaScript. The easiest way for this is the JavaScript date class. This JavaScript date class has a method called now. This now method will return the current date and the time in milliseconds. So every time we call this now method, this will generate a unique date and time like a unique number. So let's use this capital D date dot nave and don't forget to add the parentheses. Perfect. Um, before everything, let's log this file path. Then we can understand this date now method. So save this and go to the new post component is file. And let's call this upload image service method. So in order to use an angular service, we have to inject the service to the constructor. So inside this constructor parenthesis, private post service, colon, and post service. So if this will complete, this will import this service to this component file. Perfect. Inside this on submit, let's call the upload image method. After this, this dot post service dot select this method and the parentheses. This require the selected image as the parameter. So pass it. If you can remember in this show preview method method that we assigned the selected image to this selected image global variable. So now we can use it. So pass that to this method. This dot selected image. That's it. So now save this all and back to the browser. Fill this form and submit. Inside the browser console, we got this file path which is printed from this post service file. So look at this, this folder path and the file name. We got this with the date now function. So again submit again. Look at this, this time we got a different file name. So as I said earlier, every time we will get a unique number like this with this date now method. Hope you guys got the idea. Alright, now let's do the updating query. Inside the service upload image method, let's do the upload query. In order to do this, first we have to access the Angular file storage service. This dot storage dot upload and parentheses. This upload method required two parameters. One is the file path where that we want to upload and the second parameter is uploading image. So the file path is this, pass it as a first parameter. The second parameter is this, selected image and pass that also here. That's it. The query is done. Next, as usual, we have to do the callbacks. So let's do that as well like the add query after this dot then and parenthesis inside this callback function this time just simply add an arrow function open and close brackets and the arrow function and the function scope inside this log this post image uploaded successfully 
that's it save this all and back to the browser fill this form select an image and click on this submit we got the file path log wait few seconds this may take several seconds look at this we got this log printed here post image uploaded successfully so we got this log which means this upload query worked successfully so let's confirm this go to the firebase dashboard and go to the storage tab look at this guys inside this we got the folder post images and inside this we got our newly uploaded post image beautiful right so guys this is how we upload an image to cloud fire storage programmatically very very simple right all right in the previous lecture we uploaded the post image to cloud storage now in this lecture let's save the post document inside the cloud firestore i want to do the insert query after this image upload is totally completed because for this post image path we have to add the uploaded image url path so let's see this in action with this query we are uploading the image to firebase this callback will trigger once the upload is completed so we can add the insert query inside this callback function all right so in order to insert the data first we need the data object which is inside the component file we can get that to this service file as a parameter so create a parameter variable something post data perfect now we need the uploaded image url how do we get that for this we have an angular file storage function called get download url so let's use that inside this callback let's add this this dot storage which is the angular file storage service after this dot ref and parenthesis inside this parenthesis pass the path of the uploaded file which is this file path so after this dot get download url carefully follow these capital simple letters after this don't forget to add parenthesis as you can see here this method returns an observable as usual in order to access the observable we have to subscribe to this right so after this dot subscribe and the method scope inside this callback something variable with this we are getting the uploaded image url so i set this variable name as url after this the arrow function and the function scope now inside this let's log this and see what we are getting with this Save this all and back to the browser. Upload an image inside the console. Look at this. We got this URL, which is the uploaded image URL. So double click on it. This will open the image. So this is the image URL that we want to add to this image path url so now let's add this to image path url we are getting this post data object as a parameter for this method so let's add this url as this post image path value so this is very simple inside this subscribe method remove this log we don't need that anymore and add this post data which is this parameter dot the key name post img path pass this exactly as this follow the capital simple letters carefully after this assign assign this to the url callback variable that's it now let's log this post data object 
save this all and back to the browser fill this form and submit inside the console we got this post data log as you can see here this time we got this post img path with this uploaded image path url awesome right so guys like this we can assign a new value for an object key perfect all right now in this lecture let's uh, add the insert query this is the same as the category insert query nothing fancy so let's begin after this um, wait we are missing something can you guys guess what is that yes of course in order to work with firestore we have to import the angular firestore service to this post service right so let's do it inside the constructor I'll add the line break so we can see this clearly. Private AFS Angular Fire Store. So this will complete. This will add the import statement. Perfect. Now let's continue the insert query. This dot AFS, which is the Angular Fire Store service. After this dot collection, the collection name is post, a plural word pass this as a string okay next we are doing the insert query so after this dot add and the parentheses this required the data object that we want to insert to the firestore database so the data object is this post data so pass this here that's it for the query we have one more thing to do which is the callback function again after this dot then inside parentheses docref arrow and the function scope inside this this time let's show the toast success message for this toast message also have to use the toast service so first do the injection after this comma private toaster toaster service so this will complete this will import this to this service perfect now inside this at the toaster message this dot toaster dot success inside this pass the message data insert successfully perfect insert code is done let's check this so save this all and back to the browser fill this form And submit the form awesome as you can see here we got the toaster message which means data insert successfully inside the cloud fire store let's confirm it go to the firebase dashboard and navigate to the fire store tab look at this guys this time we got our new collection post open it inside this we can find our newly created document beautiful isn't it so before the end of this video let's do a small thing this upload image query is a bit noisy right we added two queries here this is totally okay but we can make this less noisy by adding this query inside of another method so let's see this in action first create a method for this save data and the parentheses as a parameter for this method will receive the post data parameter after this, don't forget to add the method scope. Now cut this insert query from here and paste it inside this method. Perfect. Now this time, this post data object is this save data parameter, not the upload image post data parameter. Okay, guys, got the idea. Perfect. Now in order to run this query, we have to call this save data method from this callback so inside this callback this dot method name is save data and the parenthesis this required the post data parameter so pass it that's it look at this code now this is organized and less noisy than the previous code right so save this all and back to the browser 
again fill this form and submit as you can see here we got this toaster which means everything working as we expected mm. wait let's do another small thing reset this form after inserting this data inside the firestore so go to the new post component is file at the end of the unsubmit method reset this form so this dot form reset and don't forget to add the parentheses this will reset the form but this will not remove the Im image preview so let's reset the image preview as well so this dot imgsrc assign um, assign this to the default image url which is this default url so copy and paste it here perfect now save this all and back to the browser once again fill this form and submit this form as you can see here this time this form reset it to the default and also this image preview also reset to the default image placeholder looks perfect right so guys we successfully completed the new post inserting inside the cloud firestore all right in the previous lecture we created this form and inserted new post inside the post collection in cloud firestore in this lecture let's see how to load the saved new post from the post collection and display them inside the old post component view so first let's do the query and the logic after this will show that loaded post document inside of a table as the previous categories so first let's do the load query this load query is going to be the same as this category load query so i'm not going to code this from scratch so let's copy this and paste it inside the post service copy this whole load data method and paste it inside the post service after this save data method now we have to do a small change just to this query what is what are the changes can you guys guess yes of course this load queries collection is set to categories collection but this time we want to load the post document so for this just simply change this collection name to post that's it the rest of the code is same as this no need to change anything um, we are getting a compile error so import this map operator from rxjs simply just copy this import statement from category service and paste it here all right now we got the query now let's call this load data method from the component ts file and load the post documents so go back to the old post component ts file because i want to load the post document inside this old post component not inside the new post component so inside this in order to access the post service we have to inject to the constructor so inside the constructor parenthesis private post service colon and post service selling this auto import next inside this engine init life cycle hook let's call the load data service method so this dot post service dot and select this load data and don't forget to add the parenthesis as you can see here this is returning an observable in order to access this we have to subscribe to this observable so after this dot subscribe and the callback well arrow and the function scope for now just log this well variable that's it so save this all and back to the browser go to the old post as you can see here we got the post document as an array beautiful all right now we have the post document array in this lecture let's see how to load this inside of an html table very simple this is also the same as previous so let's do this we're gonna load this post document inside the old post component so open the old post component html file inside this 
if you can remember in the previous we created this hero section so now in this section we'll design the HTML table after this hero section so let's begin after this row inside this container div add this um, create another bootstrap row inside this bootstrap row another div with bootstrap class called dash md dash 12 this is a full with bootstrap column inside this column create a bootstrap card with shadow dash effect custom css class now inside this card as usual card body div perfect now add markup for the html table inside this card body so create a table div with these classes table row dash border and hover inside this create a t head tags inside that tr tag inside this create th tags first th tag is for number duplicate this the second one is for post image next title after this excerpt after this category and after this date and at last create a column for actions altogether seven t heads for this table perfect so now after this t head create a t body tag inside this create a tr tag inside this 7 td tags for now keep this empty we'll load the data from this post array in a minute all right let's see this table how it looks like inside the browser view so save this and back to the browser um, looks awesome right all right now let's fill this table with post data for this we can use the ng4 directive um, wait before looping this we have a problem here still we got our post document array inside this subscribe method we cannot access this outside of this subscribe function so in order to access this from outside we have to assign this to a global variable right we already learned about this so i'm repeating the same thing again and again for beginner level students to keep remember this sometimes some of you may get this annoying repeating the same thing so i'm really sorry about that i have to think about everyone right so let's continue um assign this to a global variable something post array so this data type is an array and array data type is an object now assign this to this subscribe variable this dot post array assign well perfect now we can access this from anywhere within this component all right back to the old post component html file and add this ng4 assign inside codes the loop let post of post array after this semicolon and let i assign index with this we are assigning this array index to this i variable right now inside this let's add the looping data the first td is for the number for this we'll show the array index number so inside this string interpolation i plus one because array index starts from zero next td post image so for this add an image tag and add these classes img and img dash fluid the img src is this post img path so guys what is this path can you guys remember yes of course this is the path for the post image that we uploaded to the firestore this is the path of the post image that we uploaded to the firestore cloud storage so pass that to this src inside this string interpolation post dot data because this is inside the data object right so post dot data dot post ing path perfect now let's move on to the next td title 
So copy this and paste it here and change this to the title. Next one is for the excerpt. So paste the string interpolation, change this to excerpt. Next, the category, paste the string interpolation. This is inside the category key and inside that we got another object. So I want to show this category name. So this will be something like this post dot data dot category and again dot category. This category is this main key and this category is this object key. All right, next add the date. So this is inside this created at key. So change this to created at. For now, just keep this action column empty. They will do this later. So that's it. Save this and back to the browser. This image is not showing correctly. Mm, let's add some size to these columns. For this, we can use the width attribute. So set this first ED to around 10. Second one set to 200. The third one also set to 200. Set this excerpt width to around 300. Keep other column default. Perfect. Save this and back to the browser. Now this looks amazing, right? Awesome. Wait guys, um, we have a small problem here. Can you guys find the problem? Look at this date column. This is not showing the date in the correct format. So let's fix this. To fix this, we can use the angular date pipe. In order to use the angular date pipe, we have to convert this to milliseconds. Now this is in timestamp. So to convert this, after this, dot to millis, capital follow this capital simple letters. After this, add the parentheses. Because this is a JavaScript function. So now we can use the date pipe. After this, pipe operator and the pipe name is date. Awesome. Some of you may wonder how did we add this JavaScript function inside this string interpolation. If you can remember, when we learning string interpolation, I told you that inside this scope, we can write any valid JavaScript code. This is like a JavaScript scope inside the HTML page. So hope you guys remember this. All right, now save this and back to the browser. As you can see here, now this date is human readable. Um, now let's save a new post and see that is loading inside the table or not. Mm, before that, let's redirect this to the old post page after inserting a new post to the cloud file store. For this, we can use the router navigate method. For this, we can navigate to router programmatically. Hope you guys remember this. So inside the post service, after this toaster success message, let's navigate to the old post component which is this post router. So first thing first, inject the router service to this post service, private router colon router. So this auto complete. Again, back to the save data method. After this, add this, this dot router dot navigate and parentheses inside the square brackets, the router inside quotes slash post. Perfect. So this is how we programmatically navigate to a router, right? All right, save this and back to the browser. Go to the add new post, create a new post. And click this save post. Awesome, right? This time after this saved the post inside the cloud file store, this automatically navigate to the old post page. And also we can see this newly created post inside this table. All right, in this section, let's look at how to edit a post that has already been created. In the previous, we used the same form to do the edit, right? For this post also, we're gonna use the new post form for editing as well. So let's see this in action. Um, in the previous, this category form was on this same component. So we loaded that editing category name inside this easily. But this time for this post, we have a different situation. 
because this old post and this new post component are totally different two components. So we got the post details inside this old post component. So in order to edit the post, we have to navigate to the new post component. So let's do that first. So first thing first, we need an edit button. So let's add that. Inside this action column, which is this last column, add the edit button. Button tag with these bootstrap classes, btn, btn-sm, btn-warning. The button text is edit. Now we got the button. Now let's do the logic. For this category edit, we call this on edit method when clicking this button. Why is that? Because we did the editing also in the same component, right? But for this post editing, we cannot use a method because the editing form is not in this same component. So we have to navigate to that form when we click this button. So let's do that. How do we navigate around routers using a button? Can you guys tell me? Yes, of course. We can navigate to a router using the router link directly. So inside this button tag, router link, the path is slash post slash nick. This will open the new post component form. As I said earlier, we are gonna use this form for edit as well. Perfect. Now we navigate to the post form, but still we don't have the post data to edit, right? How do we get the data? For this, can we use the data sharing between components methods? Yes, of course, we cannot use that because we can share data between components if there is any relationship between components like parent-child or child-parent relationship. Otherwise, we cannot share the data between components. So this old post and new post components are totally different to components and there is no relationship between these two components, right? So for this, we have to use something else. So very simple, we have to load the editing post data from the Firestore database and load them inside these relevant inputs, right? For this, we need the editing post documents ID. Then only we can query the Cloud Firestore using that ID. Somehow we have to send the post document ID to this new post component form. So how do we send that? So we can send that as a router query parameter, right? So let's see this in action. Can you guys remember how do we send query parameters? For this, we have a query params binding, right? So inside this button tag, open and close the square brackets. Inside this, query params. Follow this carefully, capital simple letters. After this, inside double quotes, we have to pass the query parameters as an object. So open and close an object. Inside this, we are sending the post document ID. So the key is ID. This can be any name. This is just an object key name. So after this value, which is this looping variable post dot ID. That's it. So alright, save this and back to the browser. Click this edit button. As you can see here, this open the new post component inside the browser view. Look at this URL. In here, we can see this ID key and the ID value. Awesome, right? Now we have the post document ID with this new post component. Now we can use this ID to fetch post document from the Firestore. Alright, before we move on to the next step, I have a few questions for you. The first question is, why did we using this ID to fetch the post document data again? We have that already inside the old post component. Why cannot we access that data from this new post component? I think I already gave the answer for this. Once again, this old post and the new post components are two different components. We don't have any relationship bridge between them, right? In order to send data between components, they must have a relationship like a parent-child 
or child parent relationship if any of you not getting this i recommend you guys to learn the angular component section again because in that section we learned all about this in detail right so the next question is we just use the query parameter like this we didn't modify anything inside the router module ts5 we just simply using this new post components router path to send the query parameter as well so if you can remember this query parameter is optional so we don't need to modify anything to the router path in case if you want to pass a query parameter we can pass it if you don't want to pass any query parameters we can remove this hope you guys got the idea next question is why did we use the query parameter method rather than using the router parameter method can you guys tell me the answer yes of course for this editing process also we are using this new post component right for this we defined this router post slash new when we adding a new post we don't have any parameters to send to this cause at that time we are creating a new post but when we doing the editing we need to send the id of the editing post document so we are using the same component for two different scenarios at the first scenario we don't need a parameter at the second scenario we have to pass a parameter to new post component so in this case we cannot use the router parameter if i use the router parameter method for this so in that case every time i have to pass the router parameter when navigating to this router otherwise this will not work right but the query parameter is totally different than the router parameter like i said earlier we can use the query parameter when we need that's why we use the query parameter for this so hope you guys got the idea we learned all about this in detail in the routing and navigation section so now we have the post document id as a query parameter now in this lecture let's see how to fetch the relevant post document using this id so first thing first we have to capture this query parameter so inside the constructor um, in order to capture the query parameters we have to use the angular activated route service right so this is a service in order to use this we have to inject that service to this constructor so inside the constructor um, i'll add some line breaks so we can see this clearly private route this is just a variable name the service name is activated route select this to complete this will import this service to this component perfect now say this constructor method before this let's capture the parameter very simple this dot route dot query params this is an observable so after this dot subscribe inside this value this is a variable name you can use any name for this right so after this hello function for now let's log this subscribe variable console.log inside this well save this and back to the browser go back and again click one of these edit buttons inside the console we got this query params object id key and the document id value awesome right now using this we can query the file store to get the post document so let's see this in action first let's do the query as you know we do all the database query stuff inside the service file so go to the post service ts file after this create a brand new method for this load one data because this time we're going to load only one document data that using the document id so this is just a method name if you don't like this you can use any name that you like after this let the says and the method scope so as i said earlier for this load one query we need the document id we'll receive that id as a parameter for this so inside this define the id parameter perfect next let's do the query the query is very simple so let's do this 
inside this this dot afs dot collection the collection name post after this we are querying a document not the whole collection like this so after this dot doc and parenthesis inside this pass the document id that we want to load after this data fetching method in the previous for this we use this snapshot changes method right with this we loaded all the data inside this collection but this time we're going to load only one document right so for this we have another method which is value changes so after this dot value changes and the parenthesis all right now this will return the data as an observable but this time we don't need to fetch that observable like this previous we can simply subscribe to this and we can get the data no need to write big fancy code like this we'll not do the subscribe here we'll return this full statement then we can do the subscription inside the component ts file so oh, we can simplify this query more by adding the query path url so remove this collection and inside this document parenthesis add backticks the collection is post slash now let's pass this id as a template string dollar sign inside curly brackets the variable name is id perfect right now this looks more cleaner than the previous if you don't like this method you can use the previous collection method it's up to you both will work fine all right now let's see how to call this method and fetch the documents and load the documents data inside the form inputs So we move on i want to tell you something when we loading all the documents from one collection to fetch the data we use this snapshot changes method but when we loading one document we used this value changes method i told you that we use this snapshot changes for loading list of documents and this value changes for fetch one document it's right but actually you can use this value changes method with this as well but this value changes will not fetch the id this will return only the document data but the snapshot changes will fetch the document with the document id so when we loading all the documents we must need the id of that document then only we can do this editing deleting queries but when we loading one document in that case we already knew that id of that document right so no need to use the snapshot changes and no need to write this big fancy code so that's why here we used this value changes method the conclusion is these both methods fetch data from the cloud firestore according to the query we are given but the only difference is this snapshot fetch the document with the document id and this value changes will load only the document not the id so we can use this both method according to the requirement hope you guys got the idea all right in this section let's get the post document to this new post component and load the fields inside the relevant input fields for this first thing first we have to call this load one data service method from this component so let's begin as you know in order to access this service file we have to inject that inside the constructor right we did that already in the previous lecture so now we can use that so inside this same constructor let's access the method so this dot post service and the method name is load one data and the parenthesis this required a parameter which is the document id how do we pass that if you can remember we are passing the id to this component as a query parameter so we captured that using the activated router in order to access this id we have to put this service method called inside this subscribe method so cut this from here and paste it inside this subscribe method now we can pass the router bound document id 
to this method value which is this subscribe variable inside this we got the id so dot id perfect so this method also return an observable so subscribe this as well dot subscribe and this subscribe callback the variable is something post because we are fetching a post document right after this arrow and the function scope perfect for now inside this log this post variable and see what we are getting with this save this all and back to the browser look inside the browser console look at this as you can see here we got the post document perfect all right so this is how we load a post document using the post document id now we got the post document so now let's load the relevant data inside the relevant input fields for this we can use to a data binding but for this form we used the reactive form approach so let's use the same way for loading the data inside the input as well first put this form builder declaration inside the subscribe method then only we can access this post data right as you know we declared all the input default value with this first parameter right so now we can add the post data as this default value so let's do this the first form control is this title so set the default value to post dot title which is this key value right next for the permalink set the default value post dot permalink next excerpt so this also post dot excerpt next category so this post category dot category id was this is inside this post object and inside this category object perfect next post image just keep this as it is at last the content the default value is post dot content that's it um, so let's save this and back to the browser as you can see here this time this loaded the post category values inside these inputs beautiful right so if you guys look at this carefully this drop down has not loaded the category why is that we pass the category value to this but this is not loaded here what is the problem here so if you guys remember in order to pass two values with this we added this option tags value something like this so in order to load the correct category we have to pass the default value also same like this so now remove this add a back tick the first value is category id pass this as a template string to assign open and close curly brackets inside this pass the category id this dot post dot category dot category id after this hyphen again template string post dot category dot category perfect save this and back to the browser now as you can see here this time this loaded the correct category here awesome right all right now let's see how to load the post image inside this preview it's also very simple all we have to do is just simply assign the image path to this image src variable why is that yes of course 
we dynamically loading the image using this src property binding right so after this this dot image src assign this dot post img path perfect save this and back to the browser awesome as you can see here we got the image so we successfully set up the form for editing before the end of this video let's do another small thing as you can see here now we are doing the editing process right so let's make this text also dynamic we did this before right so back in the VS code declare a global variable something form status and this type will be string assign this to a default value add new perfect now inside this set this form status to edit That's it. Save this and back to the browser. This time this change to edit. Beautiful, right? Alright guys, in this lecture let's do the update query. This is also the same as the previous category update. Nothing to do much, but we have to do some additional things. So follow this with me. So we are dealing with this same new post form. So no need to create any separate methods and form submissions. In this edit also, we will submit this same form, right? So what we want to do is, inside this on submit, we have to capture and differentiate save and edit operations. So we can do this with the form status variable, right? So if this form is used for a new post, this form status value will be add new. If this is doing the edit operation, the status becomes edit, right? So we set this edit status here. Using this, we can capture this and do the save or update logics, right? So first let's do the logic inside the post service file. Then we'll come back to this, right? So inside the post service file, create a new method for the update. So the method name is update data, parentheses, and the method scope. Inside this, we can do the update query. Before that, in order to update a document inside the Firestore, we need two parameters. One is the document ID, and the second parameter is edited data. So we got these both values inside the new post component file. In order to access those values from this service file, we have to get them as a parameter for this update data method. So define them. The first parameter is id. The second parameter is post data. Perfect. Now inside this, let's add the update query. This dot afs dot. This time directly use the document path URL method. So after this doc, inside this pass the document path. As usual, add a backtick. Inside this, add the path URL. The collection name is post slash and the document ID, which we are getting with this parameter variable. Pass this as a template variable. Perfect. So after this, we are dealing with the update query. So dot update and the parentheses. This required an edit data parameter. So pass that here. That's it for the query. Next, we have to do the callback logic. So very simple. After this dot, then inside parentheses, callback function. Inside this, let's add the toaster message. So this dot toaster dot success. The toaster message will be data updated successfully. So next, like the save method. Once the data update success, let's navigate to the all post component so add this this dot router dot navigate and parentheses inside this 
open and close SQL bracket the path is slash post pass this as a string inside quotes perfect we successfully completed the update query so next let's see how to call this update method so guys if you can remember when we save new post data to the cloud file store we did the upload query first and then we call the save query method right why we did this like this because then only we can save the uploaded image file store storage path inside the cloud file store right so the same thing applied for this update query as well first we'll do the post image upload query then we'll call the update data method so inside this we have to capture the operation save or edit if this save operation will call the save data method if this is edit will call the update data method so the operation status is inside the component file we capture that using the form status variable so in order to capture this inside this post service file we can get that as a parameter for this upload image method right so define another new parameter variable inside this parenthesis form status so again now inside this let's do the condition if this equals double equal sign inside quotes edit after this condition scope Inside this we'll call the update data method because with this we are checking is this edit or not right so inside this at this this dot update data and the parenthesis so this method required two parameters the id of the editing document and the post data we have the post data here so we can send that but we don't have the id how do we get that this is also inside the new post component file so we'll capture that as a parameter for this method so create another parameter variable id now let's pass this to this method the first parameter is id and the next parameter is post data perfect so we did the edit condition in the else we'll call the save data method so add the else condition and cut this from here and paste it inside this else scope perfect now save this and go to the new post component is file so now let's call this upload method if you can remember we already calling this method inside this on submit method so here we are getting a compile error because we are added new two parameter variables for this upload image method so now we have to pass that with this method call so let's send them the next parameter is this form status so pass this and next the document id pass that as well so that's it so save this all and back to the browser now update this document change the title mm, I let edit after all these inputs change the post image change the category and at last submit this form look at this we got the update success toaster message as well as this navigate to the all post component look at this post inside the table we can see this edit and also this post image also updated to the new post image so guys which means the update query is working as we expected
officially we have successfully completed the upload query and all the logics but we have few issues here for this update also we used the same new post component for this update process we did some changes here if you noticed inside the console we got this error from the beginning why is that because at the initial stage of this component this may take several seconds to do all the subscription and load the post document from the database right this will load asynchronously so this component will initialize this new form view inside the browser dom without waiting until this subscription completed so in that case when this load inside the browser for a little time period this form group will return null because this loading data is not completed at this time once it completed this will create this new form group and form controls then this form group is not null this will add the form group to the form so that's why this loaded inside the browser even if there is this error right so guys this error is totally okay but we'll see how to prevent this so in order to prevent this what i'm going to do is i'm going to show this form if this post form form group is initialized so inside the new post form component html file before this create a div and add this condition ng if assign the condition is post form so after this put this form inside this div once again with this condition we are checking that this form group is null or not if this is null this will become false which means this form will not load inside the view once this initialization completed this becomes true then this will show this inside the browser so hope you guys got the idea or right, save this and back to the browser as you can see here this time we got no errors perfect right So now navigate to the save post form component look at this we cannot see the new post form why is that in the previous lecture we added this condition to this when we editing so when we do doing the editing part we sent the id using the query parameter so with this we captured the id query parameter and we fetch the relevant post document from the cloud file store at last we declared this form group and form controls inside this subscribe method but when we deal with a new post situation at this time we are not sending any id query parameters with this so in that case this will become null and this load post also return null if this is null this subscribe method also does not work which means this post form form group will not initialized and loaded inside the DOM. In that case, this post form also becomes null. If this is null, this condition will return false, which means this will not load inside the browser. So this is why we are not seeing the new post form if we dealing with the save post situation. So if we try to edit a post, as you can see here, this loaded the form. But if we try to save a new post, we got no form here. So hope you guys got the idea. So guys in order to prevent this we have to add another condition inside this new post component. So very simple if this query parameter post id is available do this load one post document fetch otherwise simply create the form group and the form controls without any default data. So inside this router query subscribe before this load one method call add this condition if the condition is this dot post id and the condition scope now instead this put this load one method call and this subscribe call back so after this add the else condition inside this copy and paste only this form builder remove all the default values and empty default values that's it
in the save scenario there is no query parameters so this will become false which means this else will work and this will initialize this form group without any default values in the edit this will become true because we will send query id parameter when we dealing with the editing so in that case this condition will true and this will fetch the relevant document and initialize this form group with the default post document values so now we are covering both situations right so save this and back to the browser as you can see here this time we got this new post form which means everything working as we expected all right so we finally arrived at our last query which is delete post for this also the delete query is same as the previous category delete but in addition to the firestore delete query we have to do another query to remove the post image from firebase storage right as you know we uploaded the post image separately to the firebase storage so when we deleting the post we have to delete the post image as well so let's see this in action first thing first we need the delete button so let's add that inside the old post component html file add this mm, duplicate this button change this warning to danger next add ml-2 bootstrap utility class remove this router link and the query params we don't need them and at last the button text will be delete save this and back to the browser perfect we got this delete button next we'll write the query then we'll do the other stuff so inside the post service file let's do the query as i said earlier when we remove the post from cloud firestore we have to write two queries one is for removing the post image from cloud storage and the second one is for deleting the post document from cloud firestore so we'll write the delete query for post images so after this create a new method something delete image parentheses and the method scope the delete query is very easy so let's do this in order to access the fiber storage we have to use the angular fire storage service so inside this this dot storage dot after this again storage so guys don't get confused this first storage is the angular fire storage service which is we injected here so inside this we got another method called storage so this is what we accessing with this hope you guys got the idea perfect next dot ref from url carefully follow these capital simple letters after this parenthesis this required a parameter which is the download url of the post image so we will get that as a parameter for this method so declare a parameter variable something post img path now pass this inside this parenthesis with this method this will capture the image that stored inside the firebase storage using the download url after this we have to do the delete operation so dot delete and parenthesis so that's it for the query once again this will capture the post image and with this delete method we are doing the delete operation inside the firebase storage okay so after this as usual callback dot then inside parenthesis arrow function i wanted to declare any variable so as you know this will trigger after this delete operation is completed so inside this i want to do the firestore post document delete operation Mm, I will not write the query here. We'll write the query inside of another method, right? So after this, create another method called delete data. Inside this, write the query. So this dot afs dot doc. Inside this, pass the document path. In order to delete a document inside the Firestore, we need that document's ID. So create a parameter variable for this ID. So inside this backticks and the collection is post slash after this pass this id as a template variable so now we are dealing with the delete operation so after this dot delete so that's it for the query next as usual do the call back 
dot then inside this arrow function um, now inside this let's show the toaster message this dot toaster warning and the toaster message is data deleted perfect now we have completed the post documents delete query as well so now let's call this method from this post image delete callback function so this dot delete data and the parentheses this method required the post document id parameter so we'll receive that to this method as a parameter so declare the id parameter variable to this delete image method as well at last pass this id parameter to this delete data method perfect that's it for the queries now let's see how to call these methods and do the delete operation So now let's see how to call this method from this whole component yes file. So we create this delete button. So let's bind click event for this. So inside this click event binding, inside parenthesis, the event is click. So we'll bound this to a method called on delete. And at last, don't forget to add the parenthesis. So when we delete, we need two parameters. One is the post image download URL and the post documents ID. So we stored the download URL inside the post img path. So we use that to display the post image inside the table, right? So pass that to this method post.data.postIMG path. Next we need the document ID. So post.id. That's it. Now still we don't have this method. So let's create this inside the component is file. So after this, create the method on delete. With this, we are receiving two parameters. So the first parameter variable is post img path. The second parameter is id. Perfect. Inside this method, let's call the delete image method. So this dot post service dot delete image and the parentheses. This required two parameters. Pass them here. First one is post img path. The second one is document id that's it so now save this all and back to the browser click this delete button look at this guys we got this delete success message which means this deleted the post image and the post document from firebase storage and firestore and also this deleted post removed from the table as well so guys i explain this one more time to delete a post, we added this delete button. When clicking this button, this will call this on delete method. In order to delete a post, we need two values, the post image download URL and the post documents ID. So we are getting them with this post array. So we sent them as a parameter for this on delete method. From this on delete method, calling this delete image service method, we pass these two parameters to this. Now inside the service, delete image method we first did the post image delete query for this we use the post image download url which we got from this post img path parameter if this success we call this delete data method with this method we did the post document delete query using the document id parameter so like i said this will first remove the image and remove the document from cloud firestore so hope you guys got the idea all right we officially completed all the crud operations for the blog post document so in this lecture let's see another additional feature that is how to make a post featured or non-featured if you can remember we said this key value pair is featured to mark a post as a featured or none featured right for this we use the boolean values if this is true this post is featured if this is false this post becomes none featured so let's do this first thing first we need two buttons for this so inside the old post component inside this actions column add two more buttons copy and paste the previous button change this button to success keep the click event 
for now we'll come back to this in a minute the button text will be mark featured next the second button make these two info and the button text is remove featured save this and back to the browser we got the buttons but this is not looking good so let's remove the excel column from the html table remove the t head and this td so i will add a comment for this for your future references you guys can remove this save this and back to the browser mm, next what i want to do is i want to show one of these buttons according to the status of the post if this post is featured i want to show the remove featured button if this is not featured i want to show the mark featured button then we can make that post featured right so let's do this for this add the ng condition to this button asterisk symbol ng if the condition is as you know inside the post document we are saving this is featured boolean values so we can use that here this button is to mark featured so i want to show this button if the post is not featured which means i want to show this if this is featured post value is false right so let's set that in order to check the false value we use the exclamation mark and the document key post dot data dot is featured so with this we are checking that is featured value is false if this is false this will return true and this button will appear inside the browser next this button remove featured so copy this condition and paste it here i want to show this button if this post is featured which means i want to show this if this is featured is true so in order to check this is true remove this symbol that's it so save this and back to the browser look at this this time we got only this mark featured button because when we saving a new post by default we set this is featured value to false so that's why we got this mark featured button so we can using this button make this post featured right so next let's do the button logic and the query all right so first let's do the button logic so for this also we're gonna need the click event so use this and change the method name to something on featured For this we need the post id and we don't need this post img path so remove it in addition to this i will send a boolean value with this so to this mark featured button i will send true for this remove featured i will send false so what i'm going to do here is when clicking this button mark featured i send the document id and the boolean true value so using this i can update the post document is featured value to this passing boolean value right if i want to make this post featured i have to update this is featured value to true right that's why i sending this true boolean value to this method hope you guys got the idea so now let's create this method inside all post component this file and create this method the method name is on featured so with this we are receiving two parameters one is the id and the other one is the featured value so just create value parameter variables inside this parenthesis so now inside this create the object with key value pair that we want to update so const featured data assign object scope inside this we need only update the is featured key value pair so pass it here the key is is featured and the value is this parameter variable value that's it now let's do the query as you know we'll do all the queries inside this service file so inside the post service file create a brand new method for this the method name is something um, 
mark featured. So after this parenthesis and the method scope. For this we need two parameters. One is the document ID that we want to update and the second parameter is the edited object. So ID and the featured data. Once again guys these are just parameter variables. For this you can use whatever the name that you want. Perfect. Now inside this let's do the query. For this also we're going to use the update query. So this dot afs dot doc inside this pass the path backticks collection name is post after this slash now pass the document id as template string so next dot update because we are doing the update query at last don't forget to add the parentheses perfect that's it for the query so we have to do one more thing as usual add the callback dot then inside this arrow function now with this let's show the toaster message so this dot toaster dot for this we'll use the toaster info message so dot info inside the parentheses pass the message featured status updated all right we successfully completed the query now let's call this method from all post component very simple inside this method call this mark featured method this dot post service dot mark featured and the parentheses this require two parameters so pass them id and the editing data which is this featured data object that's it now save this all and back to the browser click on this mark featured button as you can see here this updated this to featured and we got this toaster message and also this mark featured button disappeared and this remove featured button appeared inside the action column beautiful isn't it now click this remove featured awesome right this time we can see this mark featured button and we got this toaster message which means everything working as we expected all right guys after two and a half hours we successfully completed the post cloud file store documents all the crud operations and logics so in this section we learned so many new things and logics we learned about file storage we learned all the crud operations and some additional algorithms when we doing post edit right so I recommend you guys to if you can learn this section again and try to do all these logics on your own once again then you can understand these all very well. And also if you guys have any questions please feel free to ask in the Q&A area. I will be always there for you. So this is it for this section. We'll meet you in the next section. Alright guys, until now we almost completed all the hardest section of this course. So in this section we are going to be looking at one of the very important topic which is authentication and authorization. In other words, we are going to look at how to add security to our blog apps backend dashboard. So in this section we are going to be looking at how to design the login component, how to do the login logics and queries. We're going to learn about Firebase authentications and how to use that. And also we will learn about Angular Router Guard. So this section is going to be awesome. Let's get started. Alright, so guys, as you know, in this section, we're going to be looking at authentication and authorization. If you can remember in the previous section, I told you that we're gonna add a login page for this backend dashboard because this backend dashboard is the main part of our angular blog so we don't want to access this backend dashboard someone else apart from us so for this we will add a login or the authentication layer for this backend by creating a username and password if someone wants to manage your blog they need the correct username and the password otherwise they cannot access this backend so for this first thing first we need a login page so in this lecture let's generate the login component and design the login component view so let's generate the login component so inside the integrated terminal 
run this command ng g c um, let's put this login component inside of a folder called something auth so auth slash and the component name is login hit enter to execute this command perfect we got the login component so now let's design the login view in order to show this inside the browser view we have to define a router so let's see this in action as you know we define all the routers inside of this app dash routing dot model vs5 so open it inside this after this default router let's add the router for the login component so open and close the object scope inside this the path is for this will define a router path something login the component is login component so select this auto complete this will import this inside this router module so now save this all and back to the browser navigate to the login component router as you can see we got this login works which means login component loaded inside the browser successfully all right in this lecture let's design the login component nothing much just simple design a login card middle of the wave so inside the login.component.html file add these markups as usual first create a bootstrap container div inside this create a bootstrap row div inside this create a column 6 bootstrap div so now inside this create a bootstrap card div with p-5 bootstrap utility class and shadow dash effect bg dash secondary dash theme global css classes inside this as you know create a bootstrap card body div now inside this card body add this text dash center div now inside this card center div add this create an h3 tag with this class text dash theme dash primary the text will be log in next after this add a p tag the p tag text will be please log in to your admin account to post a new blog post perfect now let's design the form so create a form tag inside this form create a form group div inside this create an input tag the input type will be email so after this set this input class to bootstrap form dash control class and at last the placeholder email perfect next we need another field for the password so create another form group div inside this input tag this time the input type is password the input class is form dash control and at last add the placeholder password so after this create a submit button the button classes will be btn btn dash info btn dash blog and btn dash theme the button text will be login perfect that's it for the markups so save this all and back to the browser navigate to the login router let's make this center of the page so for this back in the vs code again before this column div create another size 3 column call dash md dash 3 copy this column div and put it after this middle column as well you already knew why i did this perfect save this and back to the browser now as you can see here this is located middle of the browser b awesome right now look at this this input email style is okay but this password input is a bit smaller than this so let's fix this back to the vs code open the global style file which is this styles.css file in here if you can remember we added this global styles for this inputs so in here we applied the styles for these input types which are text and email 
So now in order to apply this to the password field, we have to define that here. So very simple, just simply copy this and paste it after this and change this type to password. Finally, don't forget to add a comma between this. Perfect, save this and back to the browser. Now this looks perfect. Before the end of this lecture, I feel this button text is a bit small. So remove this font size style from this BTN theme CSS global class. So now again save this and back to the browser. Now this looks perfect. Alright, in this lecture let's make this login form functional. So for this as you know we have two approaches. One is the angular reactive form approach and the other one is angular template driven form. Mm, for this login form we got only two inputs here. So for this we'll use the template driven approach. Once again guys keep this in your mind. There is no mandatory requirement to decide which form approach to use in angular. You can use any approach that you like. So I personally use template driven approach for simple forms like this and reactive form approach for something like big complex forms like our new post form. Alright, so in order to make this form template driven, we have to add the ng form directive to this form, right? So first create a template variable something login form. Now assign this to ng form directive hope you guys remember this right i'm not going to explain this all in this lecture because i explained this several times in previous sections all right next we have to add the ng model directive to these inputs in order to create form controls new instances so inside this first input ng model and guys, if you're using the ng model within an input, we must define the input field's name. Otherwise, this will throw an error. So name and assign this input name will be email. So next, add the ng model to the password field, ng model, and the name attribute, the field name is password. Perfect, we successfully transferred this form to an angular template driven form. Before the end of this video, quick memory recap. In order to use this ng model and ng form in this angular application, first we must import the forms model to this angular application. Otherwise this will not work. If you can remember when we dealing with categories, we imported the forms module to this app module to this angular application. So that's why we didn't get any errors. So guys before using these directives always make sure that you whether you imported the forms module or not. So in this lecture let's add the form validations. This is also very easy. First we have to define the validations. So for this email field we need only one validation which is required. And for this password field also, we need to add only one validation that's also required. In a template driven approach, we do all this stuff inside of this HTML template file. So for this validation defining, you can use the HTML file required attribute. So inside these two inputs, add the required attribute. Mm, to see this clearly, let's add line breaks. Next, in order to capture the validation errors, we must declare template variables for these inputs and assign them to the ng form directive. So inside this email input, the template variable is hash email with the capital E. So after this equal sign inside codes ng model. So the same for this password field as well. The template variable is hash password with capital P assign ng model perfect now next let's add the error messages so after this email input create a div with these bootstrap classes alert alert dash danger the alert message is email cannot be empty 
now let's add the condition so inside this let div ng if sign set codes email dot touched and operator email dot invalid perfect so now this is not done yet now let's add the red border to this input as well so inside this email input add this for this we can use the ng class directive so inside square brackets the directive is ng class after this assign inside quotes open and close curly brackets the class name is is dash invalid the condition is same as this so copy and paste it here perfect now let's add the error message to the password field copy this error message div and paste it after this password field the template variable is password with capital p and at last don't forget to change this error message password cannot be empty awesome next add the ng class directive as well so copy this from email field and paste it here change the template variable email to password so we are not done yet we have another validation to do which is for the submit button as usual we'll disable this button when this form is invalid so inside this square brackets disabled assign inside codes login form dot invalid that's it save this all and back to the browser look at this all the validations are working perfectly oh i almost forgot for this email input i added only the required error validation think if in any case someone entered an invalid email address how would we validate that very simple just simply add the email html5 validation attribute to this email input so after this capture the error this is also very simple inside this alert div create an empty div and put this require error message inside that now what i want to do is i want to show this required error message when the required error occurred so add the condition ng if assign inside codes email dot errors question mark dot required so next again duplicate this div this time we are checking the email validation error so change this required to email and at last change this error message to please enter a valid email address perfect save this and back to the browser we got the required error message now type an invalid email address as you can see here this time we got this email error message awesome right so guys we successfully added validation to this login form So guys in this lecture let's see how to get the values of this login form so in order to capture this form's value first thing first we have to submit this form so when we submit this form let's call a method called on submit so in order to submit this form we have a directive which is ng submit so let's use that inside the form tag open and close brackets inside this directive name is ng submit assign this to a method on submit at last in order to capture this value pass this forms values with this form so this login form template variable represent this template driven form right so pass it here login form mm, this time i don't need this whole form ng form so i just need only these forms input values so filter them here after this dot values so with this now we only send the values of this form all right now still we don't have this method so let's create this inside the login component ts file so after this create this method on submit this method receives 
form values as a parameter so create a parameter variable to capture that something form value inside this method for now just simply log this parameter variable to see what we are getting with this that's it save this all and back to the browser fill this login form and hit enter inside the browser console as you can see here we got the value of this form as an object beautiful right so guys if you can remember i said that firebase is kind of like a serverless backend service all-in-one solution for a web or mobile app until now in this course we used firebase firestore as our database and we used the firebase cloud storage bucket for storing our media files so in this section as you know we are dealing with authentication and authorization so for this also we can use the firebase another feature which is this authentication feature using this we can create a complete authentication system without any complex codes so let's see this in action in order to use this authentication first we have to activate this so go to this authentication tab and click this get started button now this will configure and activate the authentication system for our firebase project all right so as you can see here this firebase authentication is coming with almost every authentication method like the traditional methods email password phone authentications and also anonymous authentication on the right side this is not limited to one provider we can use almost every other authentication provider with our angular application like google facebook twitter github apple and so on so in this lecture we will only look at this email and password authorization method because as you know in the previous section we prepare our login page and design with these email and password fields so once again this lecture will only focus on this email and password method if you look at this further down here we can see this authorization domain section in here we can see these domains and this localhost domain so what is this can you guys guess yes of course in here we can set the authorized domain which means we can log in to the application only with these domains in case if someone tried to log on to the application apart from this domain list this will show an error and login credentials will not work so this localhost means our current local development environment as you know our angular app is running on this local host right so these two domains are coming with our firebase host for now leave this i'll explain this in a later section so for now keep this in your mind when we deploy our angular app to this firebase host this firebase will give us this default domain address to access hosted angular application so these are those domains that firebase is providing by default in any case if you want to add a different domain we can add that using this perfect all right next we can configure one account per email address or multiple accounts for one email address so keep this as default we don't need multiple accounts for one email address so after this with this we can manage sign up codes by default we get 100 sign ups for an hour which is more than enough for our application so next inside this template tab we can manage email templates we are not gonna use this because we don't need this for our angular blog dashboard we're gonna create only one admin user account all right next in this tab we can see the usage of phone authentication this also beyond our course scope let's go to this first user tab in here we can manage all users data of our application this also like a database in here we can create a user email and password and store it inside this firebase authentication so let's see this in action in order to use this first we have to set up the sign in method as i said earlier this firebase authentication 
is comes with different types of sign methods so we can use any of these or even we can use multiple authentications so in this section i will use this email and password sign in method so let's set it up select this setup sign in method select the email and password option enable this and at last click this save button this will configure and save this method perfect now go back to the users tab as you can see here now we can create new users so let's create a user click this button very simple just fill this form give an email address the email address a at gmail.com and provide a password something one one two two three three four four guys please note this for this give your email address and a random password whatever you want no need to add this same as mine and also remember your password perfect so once you fill this click this add user button this will create a new user and store the user credentials that's it now we can using this email and password we can perform the authentication and authorization Alright, in this lecture, let's see how to do the login from our backend dashboard Angular application. So first thing first, in order to use this Firebase authentication, we have to tell our Angular application that we're going to use the Firebase authentication system with our Angular application. How do we do that? Can you guys guess? Very simple. All we have to do is import the Angular Fire Auth module inside the app module file, like this Angular Fire Store and Fire Storage module. If you can remember when we dealing with Firestore, we imported this Angular Firestore module and we imported this Angular Fire Storage module when we dealing with Firestore Cloud Storage, right? So this is also the same as I said earlier, in order to work with the Firebase authentication system, we have to import the Angular Fire Auth module. So let's do this. Inside the app module TS file, add this import statement, import inside curly brackets the module name is angular fire auth module this is coming from at angular slash fire slash auth so after this as usual add this module inside the import array angular fire auth module Perfect, now we successfully import and initialize the Angular Fire Auth module. Now let's see how to do the login query. So guys, as usual, for this authentication query also we'll use a separate service file. So let's generate a new Angular service for this. Inside the integrated terminal, run this command NGGS. This is stand for service. Give the path and the service file name. Services slash the service file name is auth hit enter to execute this command perfect now we got the service file and the service testing file so we don't need this so remove it all right now inside the service file let's do the login query in the previous we used the angular firestore service for firestore queries like same as this in order to do the login query we have to use the angular fire auth service so this is also a service in order to access an angular service as you know we have to inject that to the constructor right so inside this auth service constructor and this private f auth this is just a variable name you can use whatever name that you want so after this set this type to angular fire auth Select this to complete. This will import this to this auth service. Perfect. So now we almost completed all the prerequisites for this login query. So in the next lecture, let's do the login query. Alright, in this lecture, let's do the login query. So first thing first, create a method for this. After this constructor. The method name is something login 
after this parenthesis and the method scope. Inside this, let's add the query. In order to write the login query, we have to use this Angular Fire Auth service. So this dot af auth dot. If you can remember, Firebase authentication has different types of modules for this authentication. From that, we using the email and password method, right? So after this dot use this method sign in with email and password carefully follow this capital simple letters so guys what is this method you have the answer with this name right we use this method to sign in with email and password to the firebase authentication system hope you guys got the idea next don't forget to add the parenthesis because this is a method now this method required two parameters which is the user email and the password so we will get that from the login component right so from the login component of the service file we will send them as a parameters so in order to capture them create parameter variables email and the password perfect now pass these two parameter variables to this method email and password that's it for the query next as usual we have to add the callback this also a promise so after this dot then and parenthesis inside this callback function the variable name is log ref arrow and the function scope inside this will show the login success message so for this we can use the toaster message in order to use the toaster message, we have to inject the toaster service to this constructor, right? So let's do this. Inside the constructor, private toaster and this type will be toaster service. Set the pseudo complete. This will import this to this service. Perfect. Now inside the login method, add this. This dot toaster dot. We're gonna show a success message. So success. The message is logged in successfully. That's it. Now we have the query and the login method. In order to access this method, we have to call this method from login component. So inside the login component is file. Let's call the login method inside this on submit method. We don't need this log, so remove it. Before call to the login method we have to inject the auth service to this component constructor so very simple inside the constructor private auth private auth service colon and the service name auth service so this will complete this will import this to this component file now we can access the login method so inside this one submit method this dot auth service dot login and the parenthesis this required two parameters email and the password we are getting that with this ng form login form parameter so first the email parameter so login form dot value dot email next the password parameter login form dot value dot password that's it, we successfully completed the login query. Right, save this all and back to the browser. Now pass the correct login credentials. If you can remember, we created this user previously. So I'm gonna log into this using this user details. So my email is this a at gmail.com and the password is 11223344. Please note this, you may use something different password and email address for this. So please carefully add your correct email and password, otherwise you may get errors. Perfect. So after this click this login button. As you can see here, we got this success toaster message, which means our login core is working as we expected. So when we logged in successfully we are getting this success message because i typed the correct username and password 
So I think in case if the user typed a wrong email or password, how do we capture that? Wait, I'll show you this. This time I make this something wrong password. As you can see here, this time I didn't get, got the success toaster message. So which means something is wrong with my login details. So what I want to do is, I want to show an error toaster message if the user entered wrong user email or password. So let's see this in action. Very simple, we're catching the success state with this then rollback method. So that's why we are not seeing this toaster message when the login credentials are correct. So in order to capture the error, we can use the catch method. So after this, then parenthesis dot catch parenthesis inside this callback e arrow and function scope. So inside this, let's show the error toaster message. So this dot toaster dot warning inside parenthesis pass the error message. So guys, with this parameter variable, we are getting the error message from Firebase. So pass that here. Once again, guys, this then method will trigger if the user provides the correct username and password. If the user provides anything invalid credentials, this will trigger this catch method. So in that case, we will see this warning toaster message inside the browser view, right? So save this and back to the browser, fill this login form with wrong credentials. Look at this guys, this time we got this warning toaster with the error message. Awesome, right? Mm, guys, before the end of this lecture, let's do another small work. Guys, if the user provides the correct credentials for this, now we are showing only this toaster message, but still the user will stay on the login page. So it's not okay, right? Now what I want to do is, if the user provides the correct credentials, I want to navigate to the dashboard component router and show the dashboard to the user. Then only logged in user can manage the blog post, right? So now let's see this in action. So we can navigate to a router programmatically using the router service, right? So let's do this. Inside the auth service constructor, add the injection, private, router, colon, and router. Select this auto complete. This will import this to this auth service. Next inside this login method, if this is a success, so inside this then callback method, add this, this dot router dot navigate and the parenthesis. Inside this pass the router as an array. So array scope, open and close a square bracket, Inside this, the dashboard router. If you can remember, for this dashboard router, we use the default root path. So pass that here. Just a slash. Save this all and back to the browser. Log into the application by providing the correct details. Look at this. We got this success toaster message as well as this navigate to the dashboard component. Now the logged in user can manage and add new post using the dashboard. Perfect, right? So in the previous lecture, we successfully completed the login query. Now in this lecture, I want to capture the logged in user's data from the Firebase and show it inside the navbar with the logout button. So let's see this in action. So very simple. Let's create a method for this inside the auth service file. So inside this, create a method. The method name is something load user. After this parenthesis and the method scope. Inside this, let's do the load user query. So in order to do this, first we have to access the Angular Fire auth service. So this dot auth dot auth state. This returns an observable. So as you know, in order to use this, we have to subscribe to this. So after this dot subscribe, with this we will get the user details. So the parameter variable is user. This can be any name, right? So after this arrow and the function scope. Inside this for now, let's log this. Alright, now we have created the method. Now let's see how to access this and get the user data from 
Firebase authentication. Now what I want to do is I want to call this user load data method after successfully logged into the Firebase authentication system. So inside this promise, let's call this load user method. So this dot load user and don't forget to add the parentheses. Perfect. All right, now save this all and back to the browser. Go to the login page and log into the application. As you can see here, we got this success toast message, which means we have successfully logged into the Firebase authentication system. Now open the browser console. Inside this, we can see this log. So expand this. This is looking very noisy, right? So let's do a small thing. Go back to the VS code. Inside this, load user console log. Add this JSON dot stringify and add parentheses. Inside this parentheses, pass this user subscribe parameter variable. And again, before this, create another method JSON dot phrase and the parentheses. Inside this parentheses, put this JSON dot stringify. So with this method, we are simplifying this noisy log into a simple understandable log. So save this and again back to the browser. Go back to the login page. Again, log into the application. As you can see here, we got this success toast message and look inside the console log. Now, this time we got this simple human readable log. So inside this log, you can see some useful information about the logged in user. This API key, API name, email address and user UID and so on. So from this we're going to be used only this email. So what I want to do is I want to show this logged in user's email address after this our site logo inside this navbar. So let's see this in action. So guys, as I said earlier, I want to show this inside the header component. So open the header component HTML file, inside this add these markups. So nothing much to do, just simply duplicate this container div one more time and change this site logo class and add this bootstrap utility class mr-3. And also for now just change the site logo to something email address, we'll make this dynamic in a minute. So keep this as it is, after this add a button for logout. So create a button tag inside this, add these bootstrap classes, btn, btn-sm, btn-info and also add these custom CSS classes as well, bg-secondary-theme, text-theme-primary. So after this the button text will be logout. Perfect. Now save this all and back to the browser. Look at this. As you can see here, we got this email and this logout button side by side. Looks beautiful, right? So now what I want to do is I want to make this email address dynamic. So as you know, in the previous, we captured the logged in user's email with this load user method. So this is inside this service file. Now I want to access this load user data from inside this header component ts file. So how do we do that? So for this we can do something like this. We can call this load user method from header component ts file and return this user data to the header component ts file. But in this lecture I want to do something different. So I'm going to use the local storage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this user data inside of a local storage and I will use that saved user data inside this header component to make this email address dynamic. So some of you may wonder what is this local storage. So this is nothing much. This is just a storage that comes with our local browsers. So inside of all browsers, we got a small amount of storage that can be used to store some useful data like this user's data. So in this lecture, we'll take the advantage of this local storage to store the logged in user's data. 
So go to the auth service file inside this save the user's details inside the local storage. So this is very simple. In JavaScript we got a method for this. So let's see this in action. Very simple. We don't need this log. Um, remove it. So after this local storage dot this time we are creating and setting the user's data inside the browser local storage. So we have to use the set item method. At last don't forget to add parentheses. This method required two parameters. One is the local storage object name. The second parameter is the data that we want to save inside the local storage. So now pass the parameters for this. The first parameter just simply pass a variable name something user. This can be any name and don't forget to pass this as a string value. The second parameter for this pass the subscribe user parameter variable. So as I mentioned earlier this user subscribe parameter we are getting something noisy data collection. So in order to simplify this we used this json stringify method. So let's do this to this parameter as well. So inside this after this add a comma and the parameter is this user subscribe variable we have to pass that as a modified data. So for this add this json.stringify inside parentheses and this subscribe variable user. That's it. So guys with this we are saving this user's data inside the browser's local storage. Now we can access this data inside of our angular application without any restrictions. So save this all and back to the browser navigate to the login page. Now login to the application using the correct login credentials. As you can see here we got this success toaster message and we navigated to the dashboard which means we are successfully logged in. Now go to this application tab inside the browser inspect element. In here you can find this local storage. Expand this and click on this URL. At the right side you can see this user. Click on this and down here you can see this full object that we got from the Firestore. So this data will stay here even I reload this page. So this is the beauty of local storage. So now we successfully saved the logged in users data inside the browser's local storage. Now what I want to do is I want to capture this email address and make this address email address dynamic. So this is very simple. Go back to the VS code, open the headers component TS file inside the ng on init lifecycle hook. Let's capture the logged in users email. So this is inside the local storage. So local storage dot this time we want to get an item from the local storage. So get item. This I must be capital. After this add parentheses. Inside this we have to pass the local storage identification name which is the user. For now just simply log this. Save this all and back to the browser. Inside the browser console we can see this object. This is looking very noisy. So let's make this human readable. For this we can use the json phrase method. So wrap this json dot phrase method. So again save this and back to the browser. Look at this. We got this logged in user data. From this big object I need only this email. So how do we get that? Very simple. Back in the VS code, after this add dot email. So this is the email field key. Now again save this and back to the browser. Awesome right? Now this time we got this email. Now I want to replace this hand typed email to this dynamic email. So how do we do that? For this we can use the string interpolation. So let's see this in action. In order to access this we have to assign this to a global variable. So first thing first create a global variable something user email make this e capital and set this type to string. So now we don't need this log remove it and assign this to global variable this dot 
user email now you can access this outside of this constructor method so now back to the header component html file remove this hand coded email and add this so as i said earlier for this we can use the string interpolation so open and close two curly brackets inside this the variable name is user email that's it save this and back to the browser as you can see here this time we got this actual logged in users email awesome right so guys this is how we get the logged in user data and also this is how we deal with browsers local storage so hope you guys got the idea all right in the previous section we added this logout button still this is just a simple html button now in this lecture let's make this logout button functional for this we have to write a logout query so let's do it inside the auth service file create a new method for logout so the method name is logout after this parenthesis and don't forget to add the method scope now inside this let's add the logout query so as you know in order to access the firebase authentication we have to use this angular fire auth model so this dot a fourth dot sign out this all must be capital after this add parenthesis so that's it for the query so very simple right as usual next we have to add the callback so this logout query also returns and promise so after this dot then inside brackets the callback function for this use arrow function we don't need to pass any parameter variables so just keep this empty inside this callback add the success toaster message this dot toaster dot success so inside brackets pass the message user logged out successfully and also i want to do another thing when a user log out from our backend dashboard i want to navigate them again to the login component so for this we can use the router service so after this toaster message add this this dot router dot navigate inside brackets pass the router path of the login component open and close square brackets inside this pass the router inside codes the router path is slash login so that's it for this logout query right now we have the logout query next let's see how to access this logout method when clicking this logout button as you know for this we can use the click event binding so go to the header component is file inside this button tag at the click event inside brackets the event name is click assign this to a something method called on logout and parenthesis still we don't have this method so inside the component is file create the on logout method now from this method we'll call the logout service method so how do we access this service logout method yes of course as you know in order to access the service file first thing first we have to inject that service file to this constructor so let's do this inside the constructor parenthesis private auth service and this type is auth service set this auto complete this will import this service to this header component file perfect now inside this on logout method let's call the logout service method so this dot auth service dot this time we can see this logout method so select it after this don't forget to add the parenthesis so that's it save this all and back to the browser click on this logout button perfect look at this guys as you can see here we got this logout message and this navigated to the login component very easy right So guys some of you may notice this inside this login form also we got this logout button this is not a good practice right so now what i want to do is i want to remove this logout button and this email after we logged out from the firebase so how do we do that so let's see this in action 
for this first thing first i want to remove this local storage logged in user details after we logged out from the firebase as you can see here after we logged out from the application still we got this local storage users data so inside the service file after this logout let's clear the local storage so local storage this time we're going to remove this item so dot remove item inside brackets pass the local storage items name which is user don't forget to pass this as a string so with this we are removing the users data from local storage all right so as i said earlier i want to hide this logout button and this logged users email id after logging out how do we do this for this we have several methods but in this lecture i will guide you the easiest way for this we are going to use another rxjs method called behavior subject so guys first let's do the code and later i'll explain how this gonna work right so just follow this with me inside the auth service file create a global variable something logged in this i is capital set this type to rxjs behavior subject this b and s must be capital please carefully follow this capital simple letters check this auto complete this will import this to this service so after this set this type to boolean with this we're going to check user is whether logged in or not after this assign this to behavior subjects new instance so after this assign new behavior subject this type is boolean and at last don't forget to add the parentheses inside this parentheses set the default value false perfect next i want to assign this to boolean values when user login and user logout when the user successfully logged into the system i want to assign a true boolean value to this logged in global variable when the user logged out i want to make this false so let's do this this is the login query so inside this callback so this callback will trigger when the user successfully logged into the firebase so let's assign true boolean value to this behavior subject inside this callback so before this at this this dot logged in this is not a traditional variable so this is something reactive programs variable so in order to assign a value for this we have to use a different method so after this dot next inside parentheses pass the value that we want to assign which is true that's it so next what i want to do is i want to set this to false when the user logged out as you know we are doing the logout query inside this logout method so inside this callback add this this dot logged in dot next inside brackets pass the value which is false perfect now we can capture the logged in status with this variable now next what i want to do is i want to show this second container div when this logged in value is true so how do we do that as you know for this we can use the ngif directive right so to do this first thing first we have to access this variable from auth service inside this header component ts file so how do we access this variable for this what i'm going to do is i'm going to return this variable with a method so let's see this in action first let's create a method something called is logged in this is just a variable name in any case if you don't like this you can use whatever the name that you want all right after this as usual the parentheses and the method scope so instead this let's return this logged in behavior subject variable so this dot logged in so guys this is not done yet if i return this like this this will return this as a behavior subject i don't want that i want to send this as an observable so we can convert this behavior subject as an observable using the as observable method so after this dot as observable and the parentheses 
Now this will return this as an observable. All right, next let's capture this inside the header component is file. Inside this ng on it lifecycle hook, this dot auth service, the method is this is logged in and don't forget to add the parenthesis. So this will return this observable, so capture it. So we're gonna use this outside of this scope as well. So inside the global scope, create a global variable, something is logged in. And at the end of this variable, add the dollar symbol. So we are receiving an observable. So as a good practice, we will define an observable with this dollar sign. So we can easily identify observable variables with other variables. So this variable type is observable and this observable type is boolean. So one more time with this we are sending a boolean behavior subject as an observable. Awesome. Now inside this method assign this to this global variable. This dot is logged in with dollar symbol. After this equal sign and this service method. That's it. So with this, we are capturing this returning behavior subjects boolean value as an observable. So now let's see how to use this boolean value to show this email and this logout button conditionally. Very simple. So now we are inside the header component HTML file. So this is the second container that we are showing the email and the logout button. So inside this div, at this condition asterisk ng if equal sign inside codes pass the condition so the condition is if this is logged in boolean value is true i want to show this div inside the browser if this is false i want to remove this from the browser so the condition is is logged in with this dollar symbol and one more thing so this is an observable so usually we use observable to get continuously changing values right so in order to watch this continuously we have to add a sync pipe to this so then only this ng if will continuously watch for changes of this observable so after this pipe symbol and the pipe is a sync that's it for the code so save this all and back to the browser now get to the login url now try to log in to the application using the correct credentials as you can see here this time i got this logout button and this email now try to log out look at this guys this time we got this site logo only awesome right so guys some of you may wonder what is this why did we use these behavior subjects and observables and so on so in the next lecture i explain this so in the previous we used something totally new approach to show this logout button conditionally for this we used something called behavior subject in the rxjs module so what is this behavior subject the behavior subject is a type of subject in RxJS. So RxJS subject is a special type of observable. So you can subscribe to this subject also and get the values like observables. I hope I don't want to explain what is observable. We learned about observable in detail, right? If any of you don't remember or cannot get this, please go back to the routing and navigation section and learn the observable again. Alright, so this behavior subject is also a special type of observable, but this has some unique features than the observable. So behavior subject needs an initial value when we declare. So that's what I did here. So at the time I am declaring this, I passed this false boolean value to this behavior subject, right? So in observable, if you can remember, if you want to add something to observable, we have to use the next method. So this is the same that I used for this behavior subject as well. So when we logged into the application, I used the next method to add true boolean value to this behavior subject. So the same thing I applied for the logout as well. 
when the user logout from the application i set this behavior subject value to false boolean value so this is what i did here so this behavior subject has another awesome feature which is this will return the last value of this subject upon subscription so in other words every time i subscribe to this behavior subject this will return the last added value right for example if the user logged into the system this behavior subject's last value will be true if the user log out from the system so this last value will be false so in that time this behavior subject will return false boolean value so hope you guys got the idea so using this boolean value we can show this logout button conditionally right so we are dealing with a condition so at the first time we need a default value otherwise we will get a runtime error so this is another reason that i used this behavior subject as i said earlier for this behavior subject we can assign a default value when declaring so we got these conditional values inside this auth service file in order to access this outside of this service file we have to return this value so that's why i created this is logged in method and returned this behavior subject global variable logged in so some of you may wonder why did i send this as an observable in earlier i said that this behavior subject also kind of observable but when i returned this from this method i converted this behavior subject into an observable using this as observable method so why is that because i want to watch this behavior subject's value changes continuously so as you know with an observable we can watch the observable data values changing continuously when we subscribe to that observable until we unsubscribe right so i want to check this boolean value continuously then only we can capture the user logged in or logged out actions right so that's why i converted this to an observable hope you guys got the idea perfect so next what i did here is i called this is logged in service method from this header component is file so in order to access a service file we have to inject that to this component constructor so this is what i did here so hope you guys know this so with this i am calling this logged in method and i am assigning this returning observable to a variable called is logged in with this dollar symbol so i used this dollar symbol as a good practice to identify observables after this what i did here is inside the header component html file i added this condition to this second container div if this is logged in variable is true this will load inside the browser if this is logged in variable is false this will remove this from the browser this is the condition but in here inside this condition i used an async pipe why did i use this pipe so guys you know in order to access this observable data we have to subscribe to that observable but here i am not doing any subscriptions to this observable so once again we are returning this behavior subject as an observable with this is logged in method but without subscribing to this observable how this is working can you guys guess so nothing much here so with this async pipe i am doing the subscription inside the html file so this pipe will automatically subscribe to this observable and get the values for us if using this async pipe we don't need to do this subscription manually once again this async pipe will automatically subscribe to this observable and also this will unsubscribe to this observable when this component is destroyed so we don't need to all these subscription and unsubscriptions manually so actually we can use the traditional way and we can subscribe to this observable and we can get the values manually and assign it to a global variable and we can use that here but rather than doing this all we have this clean approach using the async pipe so if any of you may don't like this if you want to use the manual way you can do that there is no restrictions so hope you guys got the idea
So in the previous lecture, we successfully completed the login and logout and also we learn how to show this logout button conditionally. So this means we have successfully completed almost 90% of this section. So this is not done yet. In this lecture, let's see what is router guard. Alright, actually what is this router guard? As you know, in the previous, we did this login logics. So if you are logged into the system, logout. So now we are in the login component. Now if I log in to the dashboard router without login to the system, what will happen? So navigate to the default main URL manually, which is just localhost colon 4300. Look at this guys. This loaded the dashboard component inside the browser view. Is this correct? We almost spent more than one hour to implement this authentication system. But if we navigate to this router manually, we can open the dashboard and we can do whatever we want. This is not a good practice. If someone can do like this, there is no point of doing this authentication and authorization. So what I want to do is I have to restrict this dashboard router if the user is not logged in. So how do we do that? For this in Angular, we can use the router guard. So with this router guard, we can block or unblock a router according to a condition. In our case, we want to access this dashboard router and other all routers if only the user logged in. Otherwise, we want to block all these routes. So actually we can do this using the same behavior subject method but rather than doing all this using the behavior subject we have inbuilt solution in angular which is this router guard. Actually this is an interface. So let's see how to implement this router guard to our angular application to protect routers. Alright, hope you guys got the idea about what is router guard in Angular. So in this lecture, let's see how to implement this router guard to our Angular dashboard. So first thing first, we have to generate the router guard. So we can do this using Angular CLI. So inside the integrated terminal, run this command ngg. This time we're gonna generate a router guard. So guard. After this, as usual, pass the file path and the router guard name. So I'm going to generate this inside the same services folder. So services slash and the guard name is auth. That's it. To run this command, hit enter. Now this will ask which interface that we want to use with this router guard. Just select this can activate method. You can navigate using the arrow keys and you can select an option using the space bar. Once you select this, hit enter. Perfect. As you can see here, this is generated this guard file and also this is generated this test file. We don't need this test file, so remove it. Now open this auth guard file. Inside this, as you can see here, we got the router guard's default boilerplate. Alright, let's work on the router guard. In the previous, we added the login status boolean value to this behavior subject inside this auth service file. But for the router guard, we need a variable, not a behavior subject. So for this first, let's create a global variable. Something is logged in guard. This data type is boolean and set the default value to false. Perfect. So now inside this login method, set this variable to true. So and in, inside this logout method, make this value to false boolean value. So guys, what I did here is I set this value to true when the user successfully logged into the system and set this to false when the user log out from the system same as this behavior subject logic so hope you guys got the idea now inside the auth guard inside this can activate method let's add the logic so what i want to do here is if the user is logged into the system i want to return true from here 
and if the user is not logged in i want to return false from here so this is very simple right so the user logged in status is inside this auth service file so in order to access this from this auth guard file we have to inject the auth service to this auth guard right so same scenario like component service so guys but we have a problem here we don't have the constructor method inside this auth guard file by default auth guard will not generate the code for the constructor so we have to create the constructor manually so before this can activate method constructor parentheses and the constructor scope now say this constructor parentheses at the injection private auth service and this type is auth service select this auto complete this will import this to this auth guard perfect so now inside this can activate method remove this and now let's do the logic if statement and the parentheses the condition is this dot auth service dot in this auto complete we got this variable is logged in guard so select this this time we didn't use any method for this we just directly used the global variable perfect so after this add the if condition scope inside this if this is true which means the user is logged in so in this case i want to return true right so return true from this if statement after this else statement inside this let's return false so once again guys if this user logged into the system this variable becomes true if this is true this auth guard will return true if this is false which means user is logged out from the system auth guard will return false so if you guys got the idea right so this is still not done yet next we have to add this router guard protection layer to the routers so let's see this in action so go to the app routing model ts file so now we have to add the router guard to this root router so after this add this the key is can activate and the value is our router guard name auth guard pass this inside of square brackets that's it we added the auth guard to this root router now save this all and back to the browser mm, before doing this make sure that you are not logged into the system so now as you can see here now i am inside the login router let's try to navigate to the root router as you can see here we navigated to the router but the dashboard view is not loaded let's add a log to this so we can see this clearly inside this if statement add the log log message will be something access granted and inside this else add this access denied so save this and back to the browser again navigate to the root url inside the browser console as you can see here we got this access denied log which means this router guard is working and this is preventing loading this dashboard component inside the browser view when the user is not logged into the system that's why we are getting this empty view so now we'll try to log into the system using the correct credentials as you can see here this time we got the dashboard view inside the console log we got this access granted message which means everything working as we planned right so guys one more time i'll explain this in this section we are dealing with the authentication for this we created this login form and we read the authentication using firebase so but we had a problem if someone navigate to the dashboard router manually without login to the application that's open the dashboard component inside the browser view so that's not a good practice right as a solution for this we use the angular router guard mechanism right as you know angular comes with so many useful inbuilt features so this router guard also one of them so we created this router guard file using the angular cli and we created a boolean value 
to track the login or logout status. So using that boolean value, we implemented this router guard. If the user is logged in, this variable becomes true and this router guard will return true. If this is false, this router guard will return false. So after that, we configured the router using the router guard. So with this key can activate, we are accessing this can activate method. If this can activate method returned true, this router will load the relevant component inside the browser. And if this can activate method return false, this will prevent loading this relevant component inside the browser view. So this is what happened here. When we access this root URL, if we are not logged in, we got this empty view. So hope you guys got the idea. So as you can see here, if the user is not logged in, this loaded this empty view inside the browser. This is not a good user experience. So what I want to do is, I want to redirect to the login router and show the login component rather than showing this empty view if a user is not logged in. So then user can logged into the application to access the dashboard. So let's see this in action. Alright, so go to the Odgard TS file. Inside this, we are tracking the logout status with this if else. So if this is true, the user is logged in. If this is false, user is not logged in. So I want to deal with the logout situation. So inside this, before the return statement, let's add the redirect. In order to navigate to a router programmatically, we have router service. So in order to use this, we have to inject that to this constructor. So instead of the constructor, private router and this type will be router. Select this to complete. So next inside this, this dot router dot navigate inside brackets, open and close square brackets. Inside this, pass the router slash login. So pass this as a string. Now this will navigate to this login router if the user is not logged in. So let's do one more thing. Now we are showing this access denied in the browser console. It's also a not good user experience. So for this, let's show a toaster message. So once again, in order to use toaster message, we have to inject the toaster service to this auth guard. Mm, I'll add line breaks to this so after this comma private toaster and toaster service now inside this this dot toaster dot warning because we want to show a warning message the message is you don't have permission to access this page Perfect. Now save this all and back to the browser. Navigate to the root URL. As you can see here, this time this is redirect to the login router. And also we got this error toaster message. Looks awesome, right? Alright, before the end of this lecture, we have to do another thing. If you can remember, in the previous, we added this auth guard only to this root URL. But not for these other URLs. For example, look out from the application. Now from here, navigate to the categories router. Look at this. We got this category view inside the browser. If someone has the category router URL, they can easily come to this page and modify or add new categories without even logging to the application. So this is not good for the security, right? So in order to prevent this, we have to add the router guard to this router as well. Nothing to do here. We already implemented the router guard. So just simply add the can activate key value pair. Same as this. So copy this and paste it inside all other routers except this login router. So that's it save this and back to the browser this time we cannot access this category which means that the router guard is protecting our application now again log into the application as you can see here this time we can navigate around our application without any problems awesome right
all right this is it for the authentication and authorization section we learned lots of things right we learned about the firebase authentication system we learned about firebase login query how to load the user data from firebase router guards bav subjects and so on so in any case if some of you did not get any of these i recommend you guys to learn this section again and again until you fully understand this so and if you have still have any questions please feel free to ask i will be always there for you so let's meet you in the next section all right in this lecture we're going to make our design blogs front end app static to dynamic by loading data from cloud firestore so in this section we will make the featured post section dynamic we will learn how to query Firestore using some filtering method such as where, limit, order by and so on. Next we will make the latest post section dynamic and we will make the single post category based dynamic and at last we will make the single post component dynamic. So without wasting any time let's get started. If you can remember in the previous section, we did the save, delete, update, load categories to the Cloud Firestore in the backend dashboard. So now in this lecture, we're going to be do our blog's front-end view dynamic. In our blog, we got this category bar, right? Inside this, we added this category by hand coding when we designed this blog application. Still, this is all static, nothing functional. So now what I want to do is I want to load the all categories, posts and all from the database and want to make this block fronted dynamic. So in order to load the saved data from Cloud Firestore, first thing first we have to connect this to the Firebase. We already learned about this, right? Can you guys remember? Yes, of course. In the previous section, we learned how to connect our Angular block to the Firebase console and we used all the firebase services with our angular blog so first we need firebase credentials then we have to use an npm package called angular fire to connect our angular to the firebase so we already have these credentials inside our angular blog dashboard app so go to the environment.prod.ts file inside the blog dashboard app and copy these credentials and now go to the angular blog app vs code open the environment.prod.ts file and paste the credentials here so now we have the firebase required credentials as a second step install the angular fire npm package so inside the integrated terminal run this command to install this so in order to install this we can use the angular cli method so inside this run this command ng add at angular slash fire so now give this to know next this will ask you to log into your firebase account no need to do that just simply cancel the execution from here by hitting ctrl c that's it we successfully installed the angular fire package inside our angular app perfect so next we have to connect our app to Firestore using this package. So let's do this. Inside the angular app module ts file, add this. First add the import statement. Import inside curly brackets, angular fire module. And this is coming from at angular slash fire. Now after this inside the import array, add this angular fire module dot energize app and parenthesis so this required the firebase credentials we stored this inside the environment.pod.ts file so first import this so add the import statement import inside curly brackets environment and this is coming from src slash environments slash environment dot prod so keep this in your mind, we got two environment files inside this environment folder but our firebase credentials are inside this environment.prod.ts file. So carefully import the correct environment file. 
so now inside this parenthesis pass this environment dot firebase config that's it we successfully connected our angular app with firebase so next we have to add another import statement which is angular firestore module because in order to work with the firestore database we must import this module as well so inside this add the import statement import inside curly brackets angular firestore module so this is coming from at angular slash fire slash firestore so at last don't forget to pass this inside the imports array as well perfect we successfully connected our block frontend view to the firestore and firebase in the next lecture let's see how to make the static block dynamic So now in this lecture let's see how to make this category numbers category list dynamic. If you guys can remember we added a few category names manually when we designed this blog app. So now what I want to do is I want to load the categories from Cloud Firestore and show them here. So before that um, I added few categories to the Firestore using our backend dashboard right. So now we will load them inside this category navbar. So in order to query the Firestore we need a service file. So let's generate that you guys already knew this so inside the integrated terminal run this command ng g s like the previous backend dashboard we'll put all the services files inside of a folder called services so the folder name is services slash and the service name is categories hit enter to execute this command service files are generated successfully so inside the service folder we got these two service files remove this testing file we don't need that perfect now open the service file and let's add the load query for categories so in order to query the firestore first thing first we have to inject the firestore service to this constructor so inside this constructor parenthesis private afs the service name is angular firestore select this to complete this will import this angular firestore to this category service all right next we'll write the query as you know guys in the previous in our backend dashboard we already wrote this load query so i'm gonna write this code again i will copy this from the backend dashboard category service file and paste it inside this frontend app categories service file so just copy this load data method and paste it here and also don't forget to copy these map rxjs operators import as well so perfect now we got the query in the next lecture let's see how to call this method and load it inside the category nav bar So now open the category navbar component is file from here let's call the load data service file this is inside the category service file so in order to access this we have to inject this to the constructor so inside the constructor parenthesis add this private category service and the service name is category service so this auto complete this will import this service to this component right so now inside this ng on init lifecycle hook call the load data method so this dot category service dot load data and don't forget to add the parenthesis so this will return an observable in order to access this we have to subscribe to this so after this dot subscribe and the subscriber variable is something as usual well after this add the arrow function with this we will get the list of categories so guys in order to access this outside of this subscribe method we have to assign this to a global variable so create a global variable something category array and the data type will be array and the array type will be object so next assign this subscribe variable to this global variable this dot category array assign well 
perfect now we have the data now let's show this inside the view so how do we do that for this we can use the ng4 directive right so now i hope you guys remember all of this because we did the same thing several times okay all right so go to the category number component html file and add the ng4 directive so inside this you will tag add the ng4 loop asterisk ng4 assign inside codes the loop query is let category of category array that's it mm, i think we don't need the array index so in any case if we need that we'll define that later so now we don't need other categories list so just remove them by keeping this first one so inside this let's add the category name for this we can use the string interpolation open and close two curly brackets inside this category dot which is this looping variable after this data and the category documents key is category dot category that's it so guys i'm not gonna explain this everything again i hope you guys remember all of this so save this and back to the browser look at this this time this all category is loaded from cloud firestore so go to our backend categories router and add a new category look at this we got that inside this category nav bar so this is how we make static content to dynamic content perfect all right in this lecture let's see how to load the actual featured post that's stored inside the Firestore Cloud Database instead of these dummy postcards. So let's see this in action. So first, let's write the query. Then we'll see how to show the loaded featured post inside this view. To write database queries, we need a service file. In the previous lecture, we created this category service file, but in this lecture, we are dealing with the post collection. So in order to keep the codes organized, generate another separate service file and put all the post documents related queries inside that service file. So inside the integrate terminal run this command nggs services slash the service name is post. Hit the enter to execute this command. So once it complete, remove this test file we don't need that so now inside the post service file let's do the featured post load query in order to query the firestore database we have to use the angular firestore service so inject that to this constructor so private afs angular firestore so now in this lecture also i'm not going to write the post collections load query we already have that so go to the backend dashboard post service copy this load data method and paste it here so now we have a compile error to fix this at the rxjs map operators import so guys we are not done yet as you know with this query we are loading all the post documents inside the cloud firestore so now in this lecture we need only the featured post list to load inside this featured post section mm, wait i'll show you this let's call this method from the home component because this featured image list is inside the home component right so inside the home component is file first inject the service file to the constructor private post service and this type is post service select this auto complete so next inside this constructor call the load data method this dot post service dot load data this returns an observable so subscribe to this the subscribe variable is something well and the callback function inside this let's log this value console.log value 
perfect now save this and back to the browser look at this we got this list of post arrays with this we loaded all the posts that we are stored inside the file store database so this is what i tried to say so in this lecture we need only the featured post not all the blog posts that are stored in file store so how do we get only the featured post So in order to load only the featured post, we can use the where clause to the Firestore load data query. So let's see this in action. First let's write the query, then I'll explain what is happening behind the scenes. So this is very easy. We can pass the where condition to this collection method as a second parameter. So guys, as you know, we are already passing the collections name as the first parameter for this collection method. As the second parameter, we can pass the where clause. So after this, add comma and add this. In order to do the where query, we have to access the Firestore's collection reference. So ref and arrow. After this, using this reference variable, now we can access the where clause. So ref dot where and parentheses. This where method required the condition as three parameters. So as the first parameter we have to pass the key of the document where we want to filter the document. In our case we capture a post featured or not featured using the is featured key value pair right. If this is true which means the post is featured if this is false the post is not featured we already learned about this right so the key is is featured pass this as string the second parameter is condition operator with this we are checking the equals condition so pass that here so inside quotes equals operator double equal sign so as the third parameter, the document's value which we want to check and filter. So with this we want to check this is featured value equals to true boolean value. So pass that here. This is a boolean value so no need to pass this as a string inside quotes. Just simply pass the true boolean value. That's it. So what is happening here is very simple so with this query we are loading all the post collection that's stored inside the file store but in order to show the featured post we have to filter this all post collection to featured post collections right for this we can use the where filter method so this is what we did here this angular file store service already have the different types of filtering method so in order to use them, we have to access the Firestore's collections reference. So this is what we did here. So using this ref variable, we access the where filter and we pass the condition here. With this condition, we are telling this query to load only this is featured value is equals to true. If this is featured value is something different than true, this will not load the data right so hope you guys got the idea the rest of the code is the same as the previous no need to change anything so save this all and back to the browser inside the console we got empty array no post documents are loaded so why is that because i added a few dummy posts using the backend dashboard all of these posts are not featured so as you can see here, that's why this mark featured button loaded here. So now set few posts to featured, just four posts to fe featured. Now go back to the front end blog app. Now inside the terminal, we can see this post list. So guys, this is how we query Firestore database with bare close and conditions. So now we have the featured post list. 
In this lecture, let's see how to show these posts inside the browser web. So as we already called this load data method, so let's do a small thing. Change this method name to load featured because we are dealing with featured post with this, right? So inside the Oklahoma TS file, also change this to load featured. That's it. So next, in order to access this data outside of this method, we have to assign this to global variable. So create a global variable something featured post array. This variable type is array and the array type is object. So next assign this to this global variable. So this dot featured post array assign val. So next we can loop this array and show the featured post inside the browser weave. So let's do this. Open the home component HTML file. Inside this featured section, we are showing the featured postcard. So let's add the loop inside this column div. Cause I want to loop this card with this column div. So inside this and this. Asterisk ng4 assign let featured post of featured post array. Now we successfully added the loop. So now we don't need these hand coded columns. So remove them all. Save this and back to the browser. Look at this, we are getting these featured postcards, but if you look at this carefully, these all loaded the same postcard with the same images and with the same content. So why is that? Can you guys guess? Yes, of course. Look at this. Inside this, we just added the loop only. This postcard is a separate component and inside that, we added all dummy static contents. We didn't add any modification for this to make these static contents to dynamic. So that's why we are getting these cards with same content. So let's fix this. So but we have another problem. We are looping this array inside the home component TS file. But this postcard contents are inside of another component called postcard component. In order to make this postcards components contents dynamic, we have to access this looping arrays data. But we cannot access this directly from this postcard component. Cause these two are totally two different components. So how do we solve this? So if you look at this carefully, this postcard component selector is added inside this home component is file. So in that case, this postcard component becomes this home component's child component and this home component becomes the parent component of this postcard component. So using this relationship, we can pass the featured post data to this postcard component and make this dynamic, right? If you can remember, we learned about this in detail. So in the next lecture, let's do the logic. So in this lecture, let's see how to pass this post data details to this postcard component. So as I said earlier, here we got parent child relationship between these components, right? So we're gonna pass the data from this home component to the post card component, which means we're gonna pass the data from parent component to child component. For this data sharing from parent to child, we can use the input decorator method, right? So let's do this. As we have to send the data to the postcard component, we can send that like this. Inside this, square records. Inside this, just add a variable name, something post data after this equal sign assign this to this looping variable featured post so with this we are sending this looping data to this component via binding to this post data variable so now we have to capture that inside the postcard component so as you know we do all the logics inside the component ts file so open the postcard component ts file and add this so in order to capture this sending value inside this child component, we have to use the input decorator method. So after this constructor, inside the global scope, add this, at input, 
have this auto complete and this will import this input decorator to this component so after this don't forget to add parenthesis so after this the sending variable name which is this post data so set this same as this here so this data type will be object first we will receive the post document object right so that's it we successfully send the data from parent to child component so let's see what we are getting with this so inside this engine on unit add a log for this post data save this all and back to the browser look at this as you can see here we got the post document printed here which means we successfully sent the post document data from home component to postcard component all right now let's make this content dynamic using this post data variable so first we have the post image so make this dynamic set this src to this inside this open and close two curly brackets inside this add this if you can remember we uploaded post images to cloud storage and we added the path of the uploaded image inside this post img path right so now we can use that inside this the variable is post data dot data because this is inside this data key right after this post img path that's it so now next let's make this category dynamic so remove this and add the string interpolation so this is inside the data key and inside the category key right so post data dot data dot category dot category awesome next feature tag i wanted to do anything here so again go to the next the views count if you can remember for this also i added this views field for the post document so now we can use that for these views so inside string interpolation post data dot data dot weaves so next the title inside string interpolation post data dot data dot title next the excerpt so post data dot data dot except at last we have the label for the date we stored the data inside the created at key so remove this and add the string interpolation post data dot data dot created at so as you know this data is in timestamp which cannot be readable so in order to make this even readable convert this to milliseconds so after this dot two millis and parenthesis so after this add date pipe to make this in correct format that's it so guys we successfully made this static content to dynamic save this all and back to the browser as you can see here we got no postcard here and inside the log we got this error so why is that because we are using the same postcard component for this latest post as well but from this latest post we are not sending any data to this post data right so in that case this becomes null and this string interpolation also become invalid so that's why we are getting this error in order to fix this let's add this condition to this card div so ng if assign inside quotes post data so with this we are telling this to render this card if only we got data for this post data variable otherwise this will not render inside the browser view perfect so save this and again back to the browser this time as you can see here this time this loaded the featured post with correct post documents data awesome right
So in the previous lecture we loaded these featured post from Firestore. But we have a problem here. Wait, I'll show you this. Inside the backend dashboard, as you can see here, I marked only these four posts as featured. If I marked another post as featured, what will happen? Can you guys guess? Yes, of course. This will load inside the browser, inside our blog's front end after this featured post first row. So let's see this in action. So make this post featured about the front end. And look at this, as you can see here, this fifth featured post loaded after this first row. So I have a small question for you. Why is this fifth featured post loaded in the second column? Cause I defined this postcard column as a four sized bootstrap column. So in that case, inside of a bootstrap full width column, we can load only four sized, four postcard Cause bootstrap full column size is 12. So hope you guys remember this. So that's why this loaded inside the second row. So loading more than four posts inside this featured area, this is not looking nice, right? So what I want to do here is, I want to get only four posts from Firebase, no matter how many featured posts are there. So how do we do that? Very simple. For this, we have a simple solution in Firestore queries. For this, we can use another filtering method called limit filter. So let's see this in action. Very simple inside the auth service file after this we are close at this dot limit and parentheses. This required the limiting count. So pass that here. In our case, we need only four featured posts. So pass that here four. That's it. So save this all and back to the browser. Look at this. This time we got only four featured posts. Mm, go back to the dashboard and make another post featured. Go to the front end view. As you can see here, still we got only four featured posts. Awesome, right? So guys, this is how we load documents from the Firestore with the limit condition. So we successfully completed the featured post loading. So in this lecture, let's see how to make this latest post area dynamic. For this first thing first, let's write the query. Then we load the post inside the latest post area. So go to the service file and create a new method, something called load latest. After this, don't forget to add parentheses and the method scope. Now we said this, let's add the latest post loading query. For this, we don't need to write this from scratch. Just copy this previous query and paste it inside this load latest method. Next, let's add some modification to this method. For this, we don't need this where filtering and this limit condition. So remove them. In order to load the latest post, we're going to use another filter method called order by. So with this, we can filter the Firestore documents by a key value pair. So in our case, we have to load the latest post document, which means we have to load the post with created date order, right? So in our post document, we saved the date with this created at field. So now we can load new post using this, right? So inside this, um, we need this reference. So ref dot order by and parentheses. This required the documents field that we want to use for ordering. So in our case, the field is created at. That's it for the query. Awesome. So with this, we are loading the post by ordering with this created at field. So this will sort this by post created date and load the newest post first. So all right, we are done with the query. Next, let's load the latest post inside the weave. Alright, in this lecture, let's see how to load these latest posts inside the browser weave. This latest post is also inside the home component. So go to the home component is file and first thing first, in order to get the latest post documents to this component, we have to call this load latest method from this component is file. 
so this is also same as previous inside this same ngo need method call the load latest method this dot post service dot load latest and the parentheses this returns an observable in order to access this data subscribe to this so after this dot subscribe inside this callback well arrow function and the function scope so as you know we are getting the data with this subscribe variable so in order to access this outside of this assign this to a global variable so create a global variable something latest post array this type is an array and the array type is object next assign this to this global variable so this dot latest post array assign val so now we have captured the latest post document with this so let's loop this inside the view so go to the home component html file and add this so inside this latest post row we can remember we added all these latest postcards manually when we designed this now let's make this dynamic mm, remove all postcards except this first column now inside this column add the loop ng4 assign inside codes the condition is let latest post this is just a variable you can use whatever the variable name that you want after this of latest post array awesome so next in order to add the post documents inside the postcard we have to pass this data to this postcard component because this postcard is a separate component right so how do we pass that very simple we did this in the previous lecture when we loading featured post right so do the same for this as well inside this post component selector add this open and close square bracket inside this post data after this equal sign assign this to this looping variable latest post that's it so with this we are sending the latest post object to this postcard component so from here we are capturing this object and we are showing this data with string interpolation inside the view that's it save this all and back to the browser look at this guys this loaded all the latest post inside this latest post area So in the previous section we completed the successfully making this featured post and the latest post sections dynamic. In this lecture let's see how to make this single category page dynamic. If you can remember when we designed this we created this single category component and we designed this simple layout right. So in this section let's make this page dynamic. So first let's write the query then fulfill the requirements that need for this query. So as usual, go to the post service file and write this query. For this, first we need a method. So create a new method, something called load category post. After this, add the parentheses and the method scope. So inside this, let's add the query. So for this also, I'm not going to write this query from scratch. We already have this. For this also, we're going to use the where filtering method. So copy this featured post query and paste it here. So now with this we are trying to get the post by post categories. So let's change this where close. So, so with this we gonna load the post that match to the category. So for this first we need the category ID. Then only we can filter the post using that category ID. So we will get the ID to this method as a parameter. So create a parameter variable something category id so next let's modify this where close remove this field if you can remember inside of post document we saved 
this category object with this category id and category name now let's use that to filter this the field name is category dot category id so this is inside the category object so category object inside that we have this category id so hope you guys got the idea next the operator is the same equals the value is this parameter variable category id awesome that's it for the query so with this query we are loading post documents that match with this category id so all right now we have the query next let's see how to get the category id and how to call this method so the single category post process is if a user click one of these categories this will load this single post component view inside the browser right so inside this component view i want to load the relevant categories post list in order to load this category post we need the id so the id is inside this category navbar component so we have to get that id to this single category component so how do we get that very simple we can send this category id to this via binding to the url for this we have two approaches in angular one is the router parameter and the second one is query parameter we use query parameter when the parameters are optional but in this scenario this category id is not an optional parameter so in order to access this query we need the category id so for this we'll use the router parameter approach so if you can remember we already defined this router for this single category component now i want to pass the category id with this so create a router parameter variable slash colon id so if you can remember we define a router variable like this all right save this and now in order to access this component we have to pass this id otherwise this router will not work so hope you guys remember this we learned all about this in detail right all right next what i want to do is i want to go to this router when clicking any of these categories inside this category navbar so go to the category navbar component and let's add the router link to this category anchor tags so let's add this so inside this router link for this we have to pass a router parameter so in order to pass a parameter with this we have to wrap this inside of square brackets after this assign and double quotes inside this also add the square brackets inside this first pass the router inside single quotes the router is slash categories after this as a second value pass the router parameter category id so we are getting the category id with this so pass it here category which is this looping variable and dot id that's it um, remove this href we don't need that all right save this all and back to the browser click one of these categories look at this this open the single category component and if you look at this url inside this we can find this category id awesome right so now we have the category id next let's see how to catch this router bound parameter inside the single category component so now open the single category component is file inside this add this in order to get the router parameters we have to use the angular activated route service so let's inject that inside this constructor add this private route colon activated route and select this to compute this will import this to this component file perfect next inside this engine init add this this dot route dot params this returns observable so subscribe to this dot subscribe inside this callback well arrow and the function scope so inside this for now log this save this all and back to the browser inside the console we got this params object inside this we got this id router parameter perfect perfect now we got this id 
Next, let's say access this load category post method to load the post. So inside this subscription, let's call the load category post method. As you know, this is inside the post service file. In order to access this, we have to inject that to this constructor. So inside this private post service and colon, the service name is post service. Set this to complete. Next, inside this, add this this dot post service dot load category post and parenthesis this required the category id which we are getting from this parameter so pass that here so inside this well dot id perfect so as usual this returns an observable so subscribe to this dot subscribe with this we are getting a post object so name this parameter post after this arrow and the function scope now we have to access this outside of the scope so assign this to a global variable so first create a global variable something called post array and this type will be array and the array type will be object so next assign this to this subscribe variable so inside this this dot post array assign post which is this subscribe variable perfect so next let's show this post data inside the browser view so very simple go to the single category component single file and add this so inside this postcards row now we don't need these all hand coded postcards so remove them by keeping only one so inside this add the loop ng4 assign the loop is let post of post array that's it for the loop next we have to send the post object to this postcard components we already learned about this so pass that here inside this square brackets the key name is post data assigned to this looping variable post that's it so save this all and back to the browser look at this this time we got this list of posts loaded here if we check this category all categories are same which means we have successfully loaded the post with this category id filter awesome so now change to a different category this time this load the post that is relevant to this category id beautiful right So before the end of this video so if you notice this this hero section category remains the same even we change to a different category why is that because this is still a static category name so now let's make this dynamic for this we need the category name for this single category component we got only this category id with the router parameter in order to get the category name to this we have to send this also as a router parameter to this component so let's see this in action very simple first define the router parameter so inside the router file add this mm. let's define this before this id parameter so slash colon and the parameter variable category so we are planning to send the category name with this so guys as always this is just a variable name we can use any name that you like for this all right next let's send the router parameter when clicking the category from category navbar so go to the category navbar component html file before this pass the category so category dot data dot category so this is looping variable and this is the key of the category name value awesome save this and back to the browser back to the home and click this category look at this url now this time we got the category name with this so inside the console we got these params object inside this we got these two key value pairs id and the category now we can make this dynamic using this category router parameter so back in the vs code go to the single category component is file and in order to access this router parameter variable outside of this we have to assign this to a global variable so let's add that 
the variable is something category or bj and set this type to any inside this assign this to this parameter object well subscribe variable this dot category obj assign val so now go to the HTML file inside this hero section remove this and type category name and add this string interpolation inside this category obj dot category that's it so we assign this parameter object to this global variable so inside this we got this id and category so with this i access this category inside this string interpolation so this string interpolation will show this inside the browser view hope you guys remember all these perfect save this and back to the browser navigate to a different category look at this each time i navigate to a different category this loaded that category name dynamically awesome right so guys we successfully completed this single category post component making dynamic next let's move on to the next page single post page all right so in this lecture let's see how to make this single post component page dynamic so we already designed this now let's see how to load these contents dynamically in here i want to open the single post component when clicking any of these postcards then i want to load the contents of the relevant post inside this single post component from firestore so guys as you know in order to load this from firestore we need the id of the post that we want to load here so how do we get the post id to this single post component so you already knew the answer we can send the id to this single post component via binding to the router right so let's see this in action first thing first we have to create the router parameter variable so inside the router module ts file create the router parameter this time we are dealing with this post router so inside this add this slash colon and the parameter variable id that's it now let's add the router link to the postcards so we have a separate postcard component for this right so go to the postcard component html file inside this card div add the router link because i want to make this all card clickable so inside this for this post router we have to pass a parameter so we have to add this inside square brackets right so inside square brackets router link after this assign inside double quotes again open and close the square bracket inside that first pass the router inside single quotes slash post as a second value pass the parameter id so we are getting the post details with this post data variable so post data dot id that's it so save this and back to the browser click one of this postcard as you can see here this open the single post view inside the browser look at this url as you can see here this we got this post id with the url perfect right now we have the post id next let's see how to make this single post component dynamic by loading real post content from cloud firestore So now we have the id here let's load the post document using this id for this first thing first write the query so inside the post service file create a new method something called load one post and add the parentheses inside this create a parameter variable to capture the id of the post post id after this don't forget to add the method scope awesome next inside this let's write the query this dot a face dot doc inside this let's pass the document path url add back ticks first pass the collection name post after this slash now pass the post id which we will get to this method as a parameter so pass this as a template string dollar sign inside curly brackets parameter variable name post id 
after this fetching method as we learned for this we can use the value changes method right so after this dot value changes and don't forget to add the parentheses now return this so we can access this from single post component so we learned all about this so i'm not going to explain this again right so let's move on now we have the query next let's call this method from single post component so inside the single post component is file let's call the load one post service method so before calling to this method we have to do another thing which is we have to capture the router bound post id in the previous we sent the post id to this single post component via binding to the router so now let's capture that for this we have to use the activated route service so inject that to this constructor inside this private route and this type is activated route so this will complete next inside this ng on any lifecycle hook and this this dot route dot params this is an observable so subscribe to this as you know with the subscribe bell variable we will get the router parameters as an object right so now we captured the router bound id next let's call this service load one post method in order to access the post service as usual we have to inject that to the constructor so inside this private post service post service set this to complete so now we have the id inside the subscribe method so inside this let's call the method this dot post service dot load one post and the parentheses this required the post id parameter so pass that here well dot id that's it so this returns an observable in order to access the data we have to subscribe to this so after this add the subscription method the callback variable post and the arrow function so with this we are getting the post data so let's log this and see what we are getting with this So now add a console log inside this and log this post variable. Save this and back to the browser. Look inside the console. As you can see here, we got this log with post document. Now we can make this contains dynamic using this, right? So guys, this is inside this subscribe variable. In order to access this outside of this, we have to assign this to a global variable. So let's create a global variable something post data and set this type to any. This time with this we are not getting an array list of post. With this we are getting just only one single post document. So inside this this dot post data assign post. That's it. Now save this and go to the single post component and make this contains dynamic via using string interpolation. So first we got the image, so add this, remove this src, inside quotes, string interpolation, and post data dot post img path. Next these badges, first we have the category badge, inside string interpolation, post data dot category dot category. So next keep this feature as it is. Next the views count inside string interpolation post data dot views. Next the date so post data dot created at after this dot two millis and parentheses. Next add the date pipe. You know the reason for this, right? I hope I don't want to explain this again. Alright, move on to the next the post title, pass that here, post data dot title all right next we have the content um, for this remove this dummy content and add this inside string interpolation post data dot content so that's it now save this all and back to the browser look at this now this all changed to real data but down here as you can see this post contains loaded like this with all html tags and all right What's going on here? Can you guys guess? 
we can remember for this post content we set a visivic editor so this visivic editor will convert this post content into html when we save it inside the file store wait i'll show you this inside the file store console open a post document look at this this content value is saved in html format so this is what we got here so actually this is not user friendly right we have to show this content without these html tags so how do we do that for this we can use the inner html directive so let's see this in action inside this p tag remove this string interpolation so inside this p opening tag and this open and close square bracket inside this the directive is inner html carefully follow these capital simple letters after this assign post data dot content so this will convert this html to normal weave and show it inside the browser so again save this all and back to the browser look at these guys this time this loaded the post content without html codes looks beautiful right so now go back to the home page and open a new post look at this this loaded the post details so guys this is how we load the contents dynamically all right in the previous we made this single post components contents to dynamic this is not done yet if you can remember inside this component we added another section for similar post inside the HTML code you can see these postcard components selectors so we hand coded this but now I want to make this also dynamic right so this similar post is that I want to load here some post on the same category like this loaded post inside the single post component so with that we can keep the blog readers more engaged inside our blog site right so let's see this in action so first thing first let's write the query go to the post service file and create a method something called load latest and parentheses for this we need the category id because we have to load same category post right so we filter that using the category id so create a parameter variable cat id or this add the method scope so next inside this let's add the query for this copy the query from previous in here we have to change only the where close condition so the documents key is category dot category id so the second parameter same as this equals and the value is this parameter variable category id so that's it for the query as you know with this we are filtering the post collections document that equals to this category id so hope you guys got the idea all right next let's capture this value inside the single post component so go to the single post component is file and create a method for this load similar post parentheses and the method scope so inside this call the load similar service method so this dot post service dot load similar this method required the category id so we will receive that category id to this method as a parameter so create a parameter variable something cat id and pass that to this method as well so next we have to call this method when this component loads inside the browser so in that case we have to call this method inside this and generate lifecycle hook right so but this method required the category id so how do we capture that so with the subscribe we are loading the post details inside this we got the post category id right so as you know we want to load similar post that equal to this main post category so we can access the post category id from this subscribe variable so call this load similar post method from this subscribe method so after this this dot load similar post and this required the category id so we are assigning this subscribe value to this global variable so let's use that this dot post data dot category dot category id that's it 
So this we are calling this method and inside this we are calling this load similar service method. The service method will fetch the data from file store with this where condition and returns the data as observable. So in order to access this returning data to we have to subscribe to this method call. So after this dot subscribe inside this callback in order to access this outside of this add this to a global variable create a variable similar post a and this type is array and this array type is object so next assign this to the subscribe variable perfect now we have the similar post next let's see how to show this inside the browser view so nothing much we already did this post loading right so we are showing the latest postcard inside this right so remove all other postcards by keeping this first one next create a div and put this postcard component selector inside this div next write the loop inside this div ng4 assigned let similar post of similar post array Next, pass the data to this postcard component. Inside this selector, add this inside square brackets, post data, assign to this looping variable similar post. That's it. So save this all and back to the browser. Look at this, as you can see here, this loaded similar post here. Click on one of these similar post this loaded that post here again go to the home page mm, let's do a small thing usually as a good practice in all websites we add the home page router to the site logo if user want to go to the home page they can click the site logo and go to the home page so i forget to add this when designing this site logo so go to the header componentis file and remove this href add the router link directive the router is a default router which is just slash that's it save this and back to the browser now click on this logo this open the home component perfect right so let's again open a post look at this this time this loaded the relevant post that match with this main post category awesome right so guys this is how we load similar post Alright, in this lecture let's see how to update this view count when the user reads a blog post. So let's see this in action. So guys we already defined the views count inside the file store. So now we have to do is update the views count, right? So guys for this we can use the traditional Firebase update query. But in this lecture we'll see how to do this using the file store increment method. So this is very easy. So as usual inside the post service create a new method something called count views in order to update the post view we need that post document id right so we will get that as a parameter for this method so define the parameter variable something post id after this method scope so now inside this let's define the increment query the query is the same as the update query so this dot fs dot doc inside parentheses pass the document path url inside backticks post slash and this post id pass that as template string perfect so next dot update because we are dealing with the update query this update method required the updating data as a parameter so how do we get that if you can remember in the previous lecture for this we got the updating data as the parameter for the update method but this time we don't need to get that as a parameter value so we'll define that inside the same method so with this we just want to update the views count of that post document right so for this we don't need any random values always we increase the value count by one right for example this post view is now zero if someone views the post 
by clicking the postcard what I want to do is I want to increase this view count by 1 which means the 0 view count update to 1 view count right so hope you guys got the idea so next question is how do we do this logic to the Firestore query in order to update the view count first we need the current view count if you can remember in our backend dashboard when we update the post first we load the current post documents data inside the view then we change the current details to a new and update the Firestore post document likewise in order to update the view count first we need the current view count right so how do we get that for this first we have to write a load query using the post id and capture the current view count and increase that view count by one and at last we have to update the new view count to the firestore document so sounds like a big process right but fortunately we don't need to do this all for this we have something new approach called increment in angular file right so using this we can easily increase or decrease a number value stored inside of a firestore document so let's see this in action very simple first create an object const views count assign and the object scope inside this um, we are planning to update the views count so the post document key is for this views after this colon and the update value so let's add that so for this we are gonna use the increment method so first thing first in order to use this increment method we have to use the firebase module so first import the module inside the import area import all as firebase from firebase so with this we are importing these firebase all modules as firebase right next inside this method firebase which is this imported module after this dot default dot firestore dot field value dot increment and parentheses this required the incremental value as a parameter in our case we need to increase these views by one so pass that here so that's it so this will capture the current value of these views and increase that count by one right so in any case if you want to increase this by two you can pass that here in any case if you want to increase this by floating numbers you can pass that as well and also guys if you want to decrease this value by one how do we do that for this we don't have a method like this increment right for this decrement also we have to use this same method and we have to pass that as negative or minus values so if you want to reduce it by one pass this as minus one so hope you guys got the idea all right let's continue the lecture so now we have the updating data object let's pass that here that's it for the query after this as usual add the callback so dot then and parentheses inside this callback just add empty parentheses and arrow function inside this just log this message we've count updated so that's it for this view increment query next we have to call this method so i want to call this method and count the views when the user open the post to read so inside the single post component we call the count view service method so inside the join in it um, for this method we have to pass the post id as a parameter so we capture the id with this activated router subscribe method so inside this let's call the method this dot post service dot count views this required the post id so we capture the id with this subscribe variable so well dot id that's it so it's all and back to the browser open this post look at this this view counts updated to one open another post as you can see here this post view count updated zero to one awesome right so guys this is how we add an increment to a firestore document field
So before the end of this section, we have a small problem. If you look at this carefully, this featured label is showing even if this post is not featured. So let's fix that. Very simple, just simply add this condition inside this postcard component HTML file. Inside this featured badge, add this condition ng if assigned post data dot data dot is featured. So with this we are checking this is featured is true. If this is true, this will render this featured badge inside the browser view. If this is false, this will remove this from the browser. So save this all and back to the browser. As you can see here, this featured badge is now only visible in this featured post. Mm, we have to add the condition to this single post as well. So copy this and paste it inside this single post component view. Inside this featured label, remove this data because in here we have this directly inside this post data because we are fetching this with value changes method. So hope you guys remember all this. So save this all and back to the browser. Looks perfect. All right, so we finally completed this section successfully. Hope you guys learned how to make static content into dynamic contents in Angular using the cloud Firestore data. So in this lecture we learned some new filtering methods like where limit, order by and field increments in Firestore queries. These are the basic fundamentals that you need for creating a fully functional web applications. So if you can do these all database queries and logics one more time by your own, you can understand this better. So this section is super important. So in any case, if you missed anything, learn it again. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So guys, this is it for this section. Let's meet you in the next section. All right. So guys, in this lecture, let's see how to make a static subscription form into a live user subscription form. So in this section, we will make subscription static form into an Angular template driven form. We'll add the form validations. We'll store the subscribers in the Firestore. And at last, we we'll load all the subscribe users inside of our admin dashboard. So let's get started. Alright, so in this lecture, let's make the static form to an Angular template driven form. So we already did this several times throughout this course, right? So this time I will go a little fast. Hope you guys get this well. So first thing first, in order to make this form template driven, we have to import the forms module to this Angular application, right? So we did this previously to the backend dashboard, not in the frontend app. So don't get confused. Open the app module TS file and do the imports. Import forms module. This comes from at angular slash file. So next add this inside the imports array. Perfect. Next let's make uh, these subscribe form template driven. If you can remember we added this as a separate component. So open the subscription form component HTML file. Inside this first Remove this action attribute, we don't need that. Next, let's assign this form to ng form. So template variable something sub form and assign this to ng form directive. Next, let's add the ng model to these inputs. In order to use ng model, we have to add the name attributes. So, so add some line breaks, name and assign this to name. So after this add ng model directive. So do the same for the second input as well. The name is email and ng model directive. That's it. We successfully made this form as an angular template driven form.
Now let's set the validations. For this we will use the HTML5 validation attributes. For this name input we need only one validation which is required. So add this here. For the second input we need two validations. One is required and the other one is email. For this field is for email, right? So add the HTML attributes for this required and email. Next, in order to show the error messages, we have to capture the error. So define template variables for these inputs. So for this template variable name is name with capital N. Don't forget to add the ash symbol. So this is how we define template variables. Hope you guys remember this. So after this, assign this to ng model. All right, next for this email, template variable is email with capital E and assign it to ng model. Next define the error messages. So after this create a div with this bootstrap class text dash danger. This time we will not use the bootstrap alert. Just simply we will show the red error message. So inside this another div with the error message name is required. Now let's add the condition ng if assign name with capital N dot touched and operator again name dot invalid next let's add the condition to this error message so with this we are checking only this required error message so the condition is ng if assign inside codes capital N name dot errors question mark dot required that's it so next let's add the red border to this input so inside this input tag open and close the square brackets inside this ng class after this assign inside double quotes open and close curly brackets inside this first pass the bootstrap class inside quotes is dash invalid so after this colon and condition is same as this so copy and paste it here so do the same for the second input as well. So copy this error div and paste it here. Change the template variables to email. You can add multiple cursors by clicking alt key on your keyboard. So change this to email with capital E. Next change this error message. Email is required. For this email input, we have another email validation. So duplicate this, change the error to email, at last change this error message to please enter a valid email address. All right, next copy this ng class and paste it here. Change the template variable name to email. So guys, this is not done yet. Next disable this button when this form is invalid. So add the disable directive to this button. Inside square bracket. Disabled. And the condition is subform dot invalid. That's it for the validations. So save this all and back to the browser. As you can see here, validation is working. But this border is not appearing here. To fix this, Remove this shadow dash effect class from these inputs. Again, save this and back to the browser. As you can see here, this time everything working as we expected. Awesome. So in order to capture this form's value, first we have to submit this form. So let's do that. For this, we can use the ng submit. So inside brackets, ng submit, assign this to a method called on submit. For this method, pass these forms values as the parameter. So this form is represented with this template variable. So sub form dot value. Next, let's create this method inside the subscription form dot component ts file. So create this method on submit and parentheses. With this, we are receiving this forms value. So create a parameter variable form val. After this, don't forget to add the method scope. 
So for now, just simply add a log to this parameter variable form val. All right, save this all and back to the browser. Fill this form and submit. As you can see here, we got the value of this form printed here. Perfect. All right, now we have the data. Let's see how to save this inside the Firestore. So first thing first, we have to define the Firestore document object and assign this form values. So before doing that, first let's generate an interface for this. So inside the integrated terminal, run this command ngGI, this I stands for interface. Next, we'll save this inside of another folder called models. So models slash and the interface name is something sub. Hit enter to execute this command. All right, next open this interface and let's define the shape of this subscription Firestone document. For this, I need only two fields. One is for name and another one is for email. So define them here, name and this type is string. Next email and this type is string. All right, so we got the interface. Now let's define the document object to store this inside the file store. So inside this one submit method, const sub data, this must be same as our sub interface. So colon sub, select this to complete. This will import this interface to this component file. After this assign and the object score. The first key value pair is name. The key is name and the value is form well dot name. Next key is email and the value is form well dot email. That's it. Now we have the Firestore document object. So in this lecture, let's write the query. For this first thing first, we need a service file. So let's generate that. Inside the integrated terminal, run this command ngGS services slash the service name is subscribers. Hit enter to execute this command. Perfect. So now remove this test file. We don't need this. After this, open this subscribers service file. Inside this, let's create a method to write save query. The method name is something add subs and parentheses. With this, we receive the data that we want to save inside the Firestore. So create a parameter variable sub data. At last, don't forget to add the method scope. Now inside this, let's write the query. In order to write Firestore queries, we have to inject Firestore service to this service file. So inside the constructor, private AFS and the service is Angular Firestore. Set this auto complete. Next, inside this method, this dot AFS dot collection. Um, still, we don't have a collection for this. So, this is the first time. Um, let's define a collection name something subscribers. Pass this inside quotes. Perfect. Next, we performing the save query. So, dot add. This required the data, so pass that here, sub data, which is this parameter variable. So after this, as usual, the callback dot then and the callback function. So inside this for now, just log a success message. Subscriber saved successfully. Perfect. So that's it for the query. Next, let's call this method to execute this query, right? So inside this on submit method, call the service method. In order to access this service file, first thing first, we have to inject that to the constructor. So let's do this inside this private subservice and the service is subscribers service. Select this auto complete. Now inside this, after this, call the add sub method. Very simple. This dot subservice dot add sub and this required the data parameter, pass that here. So that's it. Save this all and back to the browser.
save a new subscriber look at this as you can see here we got the success message which means this data is saved inside the file store so let's confirm this go to the file store console look at this we got our new collection subscribers and inside this we got our first new subscriber document awesome right So in the previous we successfully saved the subscriber data inside the Firestore database. But we have a small problem here. In the previous I saved this subscriber with this email address. So if I again try to save this same email address, this will save this again inside the Firestore. So as you can see here, we got the same user two times. This is actually not good. So if we keep this like this, someone can subscribe to this as many as time with just one email address. So I think someone subscribed to this more than 100 times. In that case, we keeping the same data documents for no reason. So it can be very costly, right? So this data duplication is not a good practice. So we have to prevent this, right? Guys, do you have any suggestions for this? Yes, of course, we can prevent this like this. When someone submit this subscribe form, what I want to do is, I want to check this subscriber's collections is there any users with this current submitted email address. If there is a subscribed document that has an email address same as this submitting email address, I want to prevent performing this save query and show an error message something like email address is already in use. So I hope you guys got the idea right? So let's do this. For this first, let's write the query. So inside the subscriber service file, create a method for this something check subs and parentheses and the method scope. To do this query, we need the current submitting email address. So then only we can check is this already registered or not. So we get that email address to this method via parameter. So create a parameter variable sub email. Inside this, let's write the query, this.afs.collection and the collection name is subscribers. In order to check this, we have to perform a where query. So let's add that after this comma, ref and arrow, after this ref dot where, inside parentheses, pass the condition. The document key is email, pass this as string. After this, the condition operator equals and after this, pass the current email address, which is this sub email parameter. So that's it for the query. So next we have to pass the fetching method. If you can remember, for this until now, we learned two methods. One is snapshot changes and the other one is value changes. But for this, I'm going to use another method called get. So add this after this dot get and parentheses so guys the value changes and snapshot changes will continuously watch the database for changes but this get method will trigger only one time when we call this not like the previous data fetching methods so for this email checkup we don't want to check this database changes continuously perfect now in order to get the value we have to subscribe to this but we'll do that inside the component file so just simply return this whole query, that's it. Now let's call this method and see what we are getting with this query. So inside the subscription form component is file, let's call this method. For now I will comment on this and subs method. So after this let's call the check sub method, afs dot subservice dot check sub and parenthesis. This required the current submitting email address which we captured and stored inside the subdata object. So pass that here. So the object is subdata.email. Perfect. So with this we are receiving an observable. So subscribe to this. So dot subscribe. The subscriber variable is something val and arrow function scope and the function scope. 
So now let's log this and see what we are getting with this. So save this all and back to the browser. Now try to save a new subscriber with the same previous email address b at gmail.com. Now look at the console. We got this object printed here. So expand this as you can see here. This time we got something new here. So inside this log we got these values. Just forget about these first two values. We are not gonna deal with this. So in here first we can see this docs array inside that as you can see here. Inside this we got two array values which are these two documents that are using the same email address. So after this we got this empty key which show us this false boolean value. So which means for this query there is a data inside the file store which means this query is not returning empty values. So that's what this false means. If there is a document that using the same email address, this empty field will return false. Because there is a document for this query to load, right? So then this is not empty, then this will becomes false, right? So let me show you the opposite scenario. Again submit this form with something new email. Look at this. This time we got this object and expand this doc. We got zero array values. Look at this views value. This time this becomes true. So as you know, this time I used a new email address. So inside the file store, we don't have any collection that already using this email. So in that case, this query don't have any documents to load. So that's why this array is empty. In that case, this empty is true. So very simple, right? So now we can use this empty value to save new subscribers if the email is not already saved inside the Firestore. So if this empty value is true, the submitted email address is a fresh new email. If this empty value is false, this means the submitted email is already in use. So hope you guys got the idea. So let's write the logic. Inside this, let's add if condition. So if and and this condition so after this and this condition scope if this query returns zero documents which means there is no document that is using the current email address so we can save that inside the file store right so inside this pass the save query code Inside the else, for now just simply add a log, email address already in use. That's it, save this all and back to the browser. Fill this form with already used email address b at gmail.com. Look at this, we got this email address in use log. Now try to save this with a new email. As you can see here, this time we got this subscribe success message, which means this new subscriber saved inside the file store. Let's confirm it inside the Firebase console. Look at this. As you can see here, this new file store is saved inside this file store collection. Awesome, right? So using a logic like this, we can prevent document duplication inside the file store database. Perfect. In the previous for this email duplication and for this success message, we showed that using the console log inside the browser console. So this is okay for the development stage, but this is not a good user experience. So we have to show this status inside the web view. So now in this lecture, let's see how to show this inside the view to the end user. So very simple. First, we'll show the email in use error. So inside this gmail file, first let's add the error alert message. So after this p tag, add this, create a div with these bootstrap classes, alert, alert-danger, empty-3. 
set this at the message email is already in use perfect now save this and back to the browser as you can see here now we can see this error message now what i want to do is i want to show this conditionally instead of this log so how do we show that so very simple first let's create a global variable something is email error and set this type to boolean and assign a default value false boolean value so next inside this set this variable to true boolean value so this dot is email error assign true so with this we are setting this error message to true so now we can show this error message conditionally using this boolean variable so inside this at the condition ng if assign is check email so that's it save this and back to the browser so now we cannot see the alert message as you can see as you can see here if i submit this form with an email that I already saved inside the firestore document we can see this error message so awesome right so same like this let's show the success message when a user successfully subscribed so this is also very simple first let's create a global variable for this as well so is subscribed this type is boolean and assign this to false now assign this to true inside this if condition that's it so all right next let's add the message for for this also copy the previous message change this to info change the error message to thank you for subscribing to our newsletter service stay tuned for awesome blog post and at last change this condition variable to is subscribed so that's it so it's all and back to the browser subscribe to this using a new email look at this as you can see here we got this success message here mm, wait i want to do another small thing when a user subscribe to this i want to show only this success message and want to hide this form from the view so how do we do that very simple just simply add the condition to this form asset and this time we want to show this form when this is success variable is false so we check the opposite with this symbol perfect at the initial stage this variable is false which means this form will appear inside the browser while this message disappear inside the browser after success subscribe this variable becomes true in that case this form will hide from the view and the success message will appear inside the browser so let's see this in action save this all and back to the browser save a new subscriber as you can see here this time this form disappeared from weave and we can see this message so looks beautiful right so guys this is how we show error and success messages conditionally Alright, so we successfully completed the user subscription logic inside the blog frontend weaver. So in this lecture, let's see how to load this inside the backend view to check about these subscribed users to site admin. So let's see this in action. So open the backend dashboard app inside of another VS code and run this app using port 4300 because we already using the default port to run this frontend blog view, right? So now first thing first for this we need a component for this so let's generate that inside the integrated terminal run this command nggc and the component name is subscribers hit enter to execute this command perfectly successfully generated the component next um, let's define a router for this so inside the router model ts file duplicate this change this router to subscribers 
and the component is subscribers component. To select the autocomplete, this will import this to this router module. And we have to do one more thing. In order to protect this router, we have to add the router guard to this as well. Perfect. Next, um, for this we need a new menu card. So go to the dashboard component HTML file and change change this column size 4 to 6 because now I want to show two menu cards instead of one row. So after this duplicate this postcard one more time and change these change this router link to subscribers change this icon to fa-users and also change this heading to subscribers and at last change this to manage your subscriber list here perfect so now save this and back to the browser this time go to the backend dashboard url localhost colon 4300 so login to the app as you can see here this time we can see this new menu card for subscribers click on it perfect this open the subscribers component inside the browser so beautiful isn't it all right guys next let's work on this subscribers component All right, now let's design the subscribers component view to load the subscribers here. Very simple design. I need a hero section like the add new post and a table to load subscribers details. So the design will be the same as this all post component. So now, so no need to code anything new. Just do the copy and paste. So copy all these markups from the all post component HTML file and paste it inside this subscribers component html file so now let's change this first change this heading to all subscribers next to next this p tag from here you can manage your subscribers next we don't need this add new post button so remove it and keep this back to dashboard button Next the table for this subscriber we got only two columns name and email so let's modify this table keep the number column next change this to name next change this to email and remove and after this remove all columns except this actions column so next inside this table for now remove this ng4 we don't need this post loading loop later we'll write a new condition to loop subscribers details all right next remove this string interpolation and keep only this for dds inside the actions column keep only the delete button for this we're gonna use only the delete query and also remove this click event that's it for the design markup modifications Save this and back to the browser. This looks perfect, right? So next let's see how to load the subscribers from Cloud Firestore. So in order to write queries, we need a service file. So generate that. Inside the integrated terminal, ng g s services slash the service name is subscribers hit enter to execute this command so once it completed remove the test file so now inside this subscribers service file let's write the query first thing first inject the angular file store to this constructor so private a face angular file store so select this auto complete for this load query, I will not write this from scratch. We already wrote this several times, right? So copy this load data method from the category service file and paste it here. Change this collection name to subscribers. That's it. 
So query is done. Next let's call this method and load the data inside the table. So this is very simple, go to the subscribers component is file and mm, first inject the subservice to this constructor. So private subservice subscriber service. Next inside this ng on init add this this dot subservice dot load data this returns an observable so subscribe to this dot subscribe and inside this add the callback so in order to access this data outside of this we have to assign this to a global variable so create a global variable something called subscribers array this type is array and the array type is object so next assign this to this global variable how awesome now we have the data so next let's do the looping so this is also very easy we did this several times so inside this HTML file inside this add the ng4 condition let subscriber of subscribers array so we need the index number after this semicolon let i assign index perfect so next let's fill the table so inside this first column add string interpolation i plus one next the name so subscriber dot data dot name next the email so subscriber dot data dot email so that's it um, save this and back to the browser look at this this loaded all the subscribers data inside this table looks perfect right so using this view site admin can manage subscribers perfect all right in this lecture let's make this delete button functional so for this first let's add the query so copy this delete query from the category service file and add this inside the subscribers service file change this collection name to subscribers so next we have to inject the toaster service to this in order to work with this toaster message so add this inside the constructor private toaster toaster service select this import perfect that's it for the query next let's call this method first let's make this button functional so for this as usual we'll use the click event so inside this click event and assign this to a method called on delete and pass the subscribers document id to this so this loop variable subscriber dot id perfect so next let's create this method so inside this component is file create the method on delete and with this we are receiving a parameter so create that id so after this create the method scope inside this call the delete data method this dot subservice dot delete data this required this id so pass that here that's it save this all and back to the browser delete this user as you can see here this deleted this from the file store and we got this toaster message awesome right all right so officially we are on the last section of our course so this section is very easy to compare to other sections so guys in this section we will learn the final stage of our angular app which is build and deploy so we will first prepare our angular blog front end and the back end dashboard we will learn how to build our angular app to production and at last we will learn how to deploy our angular app to the firebase host so let's get started all right so guys in this section we're gonna learn how to prepare our angular apps for production builds and how to make these angular apps live on the internet so as you know we developed this block front end and the back end dashboard in our computer locally right so in this case this application is only visible for us right i cannot see your application by visiting the localhost url on my computer 
and also you can't see my application by visiting to my localhost URL. So in order to put this Angular app online, we need a hosting provider and we have to upload our application to this hosting space. So in order to upload these files into a live server host, first we have to prepare our Angular app for this, right? So if you look at our Angular apps folder property here, as you can see this folder size is more than 500 megabytes and this has more than 50,000 files and also more than 7,000 folders, right? So in order to work this Angular app, we need all these files. This is okay on our personal computers, but this is not good for a live internet host cause in a cloud host, we will get only limited amount of storage. If our app size is very big, this can be empty our pockets. So and also this will reduce the speed of our application in the live host. So as a solution for this, we have inbuilt technology in Angular, which is app building. So with this, we can build our application or prepare our application to final hosting deploy. So in order to deploy an Angular app online, we have to build that application to production. So this is very easy. As I said, this is already built in in all Angular applications. So we can do this with a simple Angular CLI command. So let's see this in action. So we have two separate Angular applications. So we'll first start with the front-end Angular application. So open the front-end Angular blog app inside the VS Code. Inside the integrated terminal, run this command. So ng build and we have to pass a flag double dash prod. So with this command, we are saying to Angular CLI to build this application to production. So in other words, with this, we are saying that to prepare our Angular app to final deployment. So very simple, right? So in order to execute this command, hit enter. Look at this. The Angular CLI is now building our Angular app to production. This may take several seconds to minutes depending on your PC speed. So once it's done, look at this file tree. In here we can find a new folder called dist, right? So inside that we can find another folder exactly named as our blog guest name ang-blog-app. Mm, wait, I'll show you this inside the file explorer. Then you can understand this clearly. So inside our Angular app folder, we can find this new folder called dist. Inside that, we got this ang-blog-app, which is named exactly as our Angular project's name. And inside that, we can find these files. So what are these files? Can you guys tell? Yes, of course. So this is the final production ready output of our Angular application. Inside this we got these 8 files instead of these all 50,000 files. This is the magic of this Angular app build. So with the ngbuild command, Angular CLI compressed our whole app Angular application to these 8 files. If you looked at this folder size, as you can see here, now this time we got less than 2 megabytes instead of large 500 MB sized application. So now we can simply deploy these files to the live host and make this Angular app live on the internet. So now we have the production ready application to deploy live to the internet. As I said earlier, for this we need a space on the internet. In other words, we call this a host. So for this, we have so many hosting providers globally on the internet. So with some providers, we can get a free host and most of them are not free. So you have to pay a small amount of fee monthly depending on your web applications requirement. But for our Angular app, for now, we don't need to get a premium host, right? So for this, as you know, we can use the Firebase host. So when we learned Firebase, I said that Firebase has lots of features in build. 
from that one of the best feature is this five is host so we can deploy and make our angular app live on the internet without spending money yes of course like other features firebase host also free to use with some limitations this free usage is more than enough for our angular application so one of the beauty of this is even with the free firebase host we will get a custom domain and free ssl certificate and also we can host multiple sites on this one host so we don't need to create different accounts to host different applications so guys now let's see how to set up this firebase host and deploy our angular app to this firebase host so log into the firebase dashboard and go to this hosting tab the first time we have to configure the host like the same as other features so click on this get start button in order to upload our app files to the firebase host we have to install firebase cli on our computer if you can remember in order to use angular we installed angular cli in our computer globally right this also the same as like that in order to deploy all the app files to the firebase host we have to use this tool so with this we can easily deploy our angular app to the firebase and make it live so guys first thing first we have to install this on our computer so copy this command and open the command prompt or the terminal and paste the copied code if you are on a mac computer add sudo beginning of this command so if you are on a windows just simply hit enter to execute this command so now this will download 5 cli and install this inside our computer globally so we can use this 5 command anywhere inside our computer folders perfect this is installed successfully now reload this command prompt and type 5 command look at this now we can use this firebase command with our computer all right so now we have the firebase command line tool installed on our computer now in this lecture let's see how to deploy our blog's front end app to the firebase host so first thing first we have to navigate to our project folder on command prompt so i will copy my folder path and inside the command prompt or the terminal cd and paste the path perfect now we are in the project folder so guys we are not gonna deploy all these files to the firebase host because as you know these files count and folder size is very large so if you can remember as a solution for this we build our angular app to the production so this gave us this very small size file count and file sizes so this is now inside this dist folder so what i want to do is i want to deploy this build files to the firebase host not this all files so for this we have to navigate our command prompt inside this dist folder as well so run this command cd dist perfect now we are inside the production ready app folder next let's see how to deploy this folder to the firebase host so back in the browser and click this next so in order to deploy first we have to log into our firebase account using the firebase cli so now inside the terminal on this command firebase login so this firebase is firebase cli command and with this command we can log into the firebase so give this to know we don't need that now this will open the google account login inside the browser so log into this using your gmail account that exactly you used to create firebase account once it's done this will ask some permissions give hello to this that's it we successfully logged into the firebase account using the firebase cli so now go to the terminal inside this also we can see this success message perfect so guys next we have to configure the host for deployment so we can use that by another firebase command 
So inside the terminal run this command firebase init hit enter to execute this command. So give this to yes. So next this will ask which firebase feature that we want to use. So this time we are planning to use the firebase host. So select this hosting. Mm, here you can find these two hosting options from this. Choose this first one. Configure files for firebase hosting. Not this setup github actions deploy, right? So guys carefully pick this otherwise the total operation will break. Alright, once you select this, you can navigate around these options using arrow keys. You can select an option using the space bar. So once you select the correct option, hit enter. In the next view, this will ask to select the Firebase project. So we already created this, so choose this use an existing project option and hit enter. Now from this select the Firebase project, which is this ang dash block. So select this and hit enter. Alright, we successfully selected the Firebase project. Next, this will ask which folder do we want to use as the main public folder. As default, this use this public folder. But in our case, our production ready Angular app is inside this ang-blog-app folder. So pass that here, exactly same as this. So pass that here, ang dash blog dash app so once it done hit enter so next this will ask to configure our app as a single page application so for this give no because this is already configured as single page application why is that if you can remember angular framework is built top of this single page application architecture so we learned all about this right so now give this to no and hit enter now again give this to no as well we don't need this option next again for this also give no so cause we don't want to rewrite anything on our app index file hit enter this will now generate these configure files Alright, in the previous we installed and configured Firebase host to deploy our production ready Angular app. Now in this lecture, let's see how to deploy this to the Firebase host. So this is very simple, all we have to do is just execute this command on the command prompt or the terminal. So make sure that you are in the correct folder path. This command will upload this folder to the Firebase host according to our configurations, right? So inside the terminal, run this command firebase deploy hit enter to execute this command so as you can see here this is now uploading our files to the firebase host perfect firebase cli successfully deployed our app to the firebase host so that's why we got this message so down here we can see these domain names so these are the default domain names that we got for our hosted app so open one of these URLs inside the browser. Look at this. Our Angular blog app is now live on the internet. Awesome, right? So guys, navigate around our Angular blog. Everything working as our local host app. Awesome, right? So now just go to the Firebase dashboard and complete this. Now we can see the hosting dashboard in here we can see these domains so guys these are the default free domains that we are getting with firebase host by default so for this we will get two subdomains one is the web.app subdomain and other one is firebaseapp.com subdomain you can use any of these as you wish all these domains open the deployed app so down here we can see the history of our deployments. This is the current deployment and this has 11 files. If we deployed this one more time, that also saved inside this history. So guys, we can add another site to the same host. As I said, this Firebase host supports multiple website hosts. So we can add another site using this. 
perfect so guys this is how we set up and deploy our angular app to the firebase host very easy and simple right So guys, in the previous, we successfully deployed our blog's frontend to the Firebase host. But we have another separate app for our backend dashboard. So we have to deploy that to the Firebase host as well. So let's do this. This is also the same as previous. So first we have to build this backend dashboard also to production. Open this inside the VS Code. Inside integrated terminal, run this command. ng build double dash prod hit enter to execute this command so this may take a little more time wait until this complete once it completed inside the file explorer we can find this dist folder and inside that we got this production ready our backend dashboard awesome now next open the command prompt and navigate to this dist folder before we do firebase commands we have to do an extra additional setup than the previous step when we deploy the blog frontend we deployed that to the default hosting space but this time we are deploying a separate app to this same hosting space so if we do this like previous this will replace this blog app with the backend dashboard so what i want to do is I want to create another partition for this second dashboard so we can do that by using this so click on this and another site button now give now give a name for this second site something ng dash blog dash dashboard dash one two three so maybe you can use the same name as mine choose something unique name once it's done click this button this will make another partition in our firebase host so this is the partition for the front end and this is the partition for the back end dashboard app for this still we are not deployed anything right so now let's deploy this for this first thing first we have to log into the firebase so firebase login As you can see here, this time this is showing that we already logged into the Firebase. Yes, of course, in the previous we logged into the Firebase, right? But this time we don't need to log in again. So next, the command is Firebase init. This is also same as previous. So give this to yes. Next, select the feature which is this hosting configure file for Firebase hosting. Select this and hit enter next select this existing project and select the project which is this ang blog and hit enter next give this to the folder name ang dash blog dash dashboard hit enter for this give no again no again no awesome firebase initialization completed so next let's deploy So now let's deploy. If I deploy the same as previous using the firebase deploy command, this will upload this to the same default host partition and override our blog's frontend. Right? So that's not what I want. This time I want to upload this to the second hosting partition. Right? So how do we do that? For this we have to do an extra step. So with firebase in it, we got these files here. Right? From here, open this firebase.json file and add this. So before this, we have to create a unique name for this. So target and as a value pass something unique name, I'll pass this as ang blog dashboard without dashes and spaces. Next, I want to configure this app to deploy to this second hosting. 
using this target unique name. So very simple, for this we have a Firebase command. Inside the terminal run this Firebase target colon apply. So after this space, now pass the target name which is this ang block dashboard without dashes and spaces. Carefully follow simple capital letters. Pass this exactly same as this Firebase JSON file. So after this space and now we have to pass the hosting name. So which is this. So pass this exactly same as this. So my hosting name is ang-blog-123. Your hosting name can be vary than me. So carefully pass that here. With this we are telling to Firebase deploy this target name app to this hosting right very simple right so now hit enter to execute this command awesome so now as usual simply run the firebase deploy command to deploy this so look at this this time this deployed into the second dashboard hosting awesome right So guys now go to this URL Look at this It's loaded the backend dashboard here Log into the system And everything working as we expected So guys this is how we deployed multiple sites to Firebase so that's it for this video so guys hope you guys found this video helpful if this content is worth give a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe so this is it this for video we'll meet you with another awesome video like this until then learn smart not hard